Hello gamers and welcome to the PCC. My name is Ardog with the Triple G and I'm so honored to be your host at the Prime Championship Circuit. We are a community-based tournament where we host and show you the greatest predecessor has to offer in competitive gaming. We started off with 26 teams and 18 have been eliminated and now only eight remain. Two weeks ago, we finished our Swiss and our group stages, and this weekend is our main event, and we hear you loud and clear. You want more. Today is our quarterfinals between the top eight teams, and tomorrow we will hold the semifinals and ultimately the grand finals. PCC is a celebration of community, a testament to the spirit of competition that unites us in the world of predecessor. The stage is so much bigger, the stakes are so much higher, but the road to victory is not yet over. As we harness the storm in the land of Pred, so many teams have come to conquer the crown, but it comes down to this top eight. The Professors, Press Tab, Dirty Lake and the Boys, Flow State, The Chefs, What If, Indecisive, and The Hive. But who will go down in history and who will join the elite to call themselves champions of the PCC? But before we get into these games, I gotta introduce these boys next to me. The cream of the crop desk analyst. I'll start with you, Grady. Uh, streamer, content creator, and all around predecessor gamer. How's it going, Grady? I'm doing well. Thanks for the introduction, R Dog. I'm happy to be here today. And of course, we can't forget Wangle, the Wangler, the one with the killer smile, the one who is split and torn between worlds apart. How are you, Wangle? You flattered me, our dog. I'm doing great. I'm super <laughs> excited for what we have in store today. Yeah, today is going to be super nutty. Like, I, I can't believe we, we've reached the stage now. This is the quarterfinals. One more day and we're at the grand finals. So the quarterfinals consist of four best of three series. Sorry, four best of four. And the four winning teams from today will, um, I'm sorry, best of three series, but there's four games. But the four will advance tomorrow and they battle it out in the semifinals for a spot to contend in the grand final best of five. Exclamation point bracket to keep track of the score and the current standings. If you want to know whose player is in which team, what's the roster looking like, what's the score, there it is. But you're looking at the board here. You're looking at these eight teams that made it out of Swiss and made it out of groups. You've got the professors, Press Tab, D Lab, Flow State, Chefs, What If, Indecisive, and The Hive. Please make sure you're cheering for your favorite team as well as your favorite players. So we are going to be watching that first best of three series, which will be the Professors versus Press Tab. Okay. Um, I gotta start, we're gonna start with the professors first though. Wangle, what can you tell us about them? So obviously a team with a ton of history, been around since pretty early in the comp scene uh, and is stuck with a pretty similar roster changing, you know, a couple things here and there. Uh, but Survivor Crazy Fool, the duo that's been terrorizing other duo lanes since they've been competing, uh, Soul Reaper, everyone's favorite streamer the biggest streamer predecessor the mid lane guy uh six also huge streamer playing in the jungle and nitro the goat in my opinion not the goat but very very good off laner um and they obviously won two pccs ago pcc5 um very well known team one of the favorites to win the whole thing i think yeah, but on the other side, we've got Press Tab. Grady, walk me through about what you know about Press Tab. 
so press tab another name that's been around the predecessor scene for a while they did win the very first community predecessor tournament the lob lolly tournament um they have Rizbro over in the off lane he's a crunch enjoyer just like myself bad news bears in the jungle uh as you can see Zaris pretty high prio there on the list a lot of the times it goes to bad news bears Feppy, former support player he did he was a part of the roster that did win the very first pcc as the support for team tos so as a as a support main he's a definitely pretty proficient with the bellica uh, we got azazel over in support playing with eps in the dual lane as the ad carry those two both really like to rock the kira and the narbash so we'll see what they're able to bring out today a little bit of an underdog team but they definitely have a shot if they hold it together as a team they definitely do. And look at the sweet graphics that our uh, team has created for us. Um, Wangle, walk me through with what you're seeing here. Um, so obviously, you know, in the KDA department, professors sitting well above p -temp, uh 6.0 around KDA to 3.0, double the average KDA in their matches which means that there's a lot more fighting. Professors are probably winning a lot more of the fights. I'm sorry if you can hear that. My fire alarm might be going off. Uh, <laughs> wow. Uh, but yeah, and then gold per minute, obviously a bit higher, uh, decently higher for e every minute, 200 more. Um, yeah, I might need to be right back, actually. I'm so sorry. That's all right. I mean, we're looking at the most banned here. Um, we've, we've got the phase. We know that the professors don't want to, to anytime they see uh, a player from another team that, that plays that hero, that's definitely something that they want to ban out. Grady, what else are you seeing for the, the, the band here and the picks from, from both sides? So p really likes to ban out the Belka. It's really a strong flex pick and a very good early pick to take for any draft. She can fit into basically any team comp. Um, so very, uh, it's, a, it's a pretty good safe ban. And then of course we see that the most picked for Professors is the Richter. Uh, we know Nitro and Six can both play the Richter, but we all know who's really getting the Richter at the end of the day. That's going to be the man, the myth, the legend, Crazy Fool, hitting those hooks and carrying Survivor, babysitting him through the lane. And then we also see most picked, very strong pick right now is Zerus for P Tab, a very strong off lane and jungle pick, very flexible in both roles. Yeah, I definitely want to say that Ultimate by Zarus is. One of the top 10 ultimates in the game. It's so annoying how he can just engage and initiate team fights by just zero in, in on you and wrapping his Colosseum around um, and amidst everything and just creating that fight. Even though you feel like you're out of range, all of a sudden he just leaps and jumps on you. But um, while we have you here with us and you're looking like the, looking at this nice graphics here, we got the logos from both teams and you've got these, these nice statistics that was generated from our Swiss and group stages. Um, if you like what you're seeing from us, please drop us a follow, hit the subscribe button. We're on YouTube, Instagram, TikTok, and of course here on Twitch. So whatever uh, social media out there, we're there, okay? Thanks for all of your support. And speaking of support, exclamation point support will send you to our GoFundMe as well. So we're still raising funds for a prize pool and the PCC production as a whole. We've already reached the thousand dollar mark. Okay, we were over that, but we have still yet to unlock the $3,000 and $5,000 marks. A cutting to the core 12 hour episode and a special event with proceeds going to a charity of the top donors choosing. So thank you so much from the bottom of our hearts. We we, we see you guys in chat and, and all the support and all the love um, if you these players have they put in so much time and effort into these games the amount of scrims they're doing to be able to play at this top level I think Grady can speak for it as well because he he is a player it all-around gamer himself um, so there's a lot of dedication out there towards uh, competitive 
predecessor gaming, okay? Um, but going back to the professors versus press tab, this is going to be a best of three. So the profs or either team will just need to win two games and then they can make it to our semifinals tomorrow. So tomorrow we will have our semis between the four teams and that's how we will find out. They will be a best of three as well. And then we'll be able to watch the grand finals, which is a best of five. Um, we're still waiting on Wangler here. Uh, let me just make sure, okay, looking to see if there's any notes, but we are just going to just make sure that you are typing exclamation point bracket if you wanna keep track of the score, the current stat. We know that the Professors and Press Tab is going to be our first best of three series, but the next one will be Dirty Lake and the Boys versus Flow State. Um, Choice, can you please pull up the bracket once more for us? Okay, so here's our quarterfinals, best of three, the professors versus PTAB. We we kind of know, and and Grady kind of mentioned this um, earlier with with press tab that the press tab won the first ever predecessor tournament, and and Wangle kind of highlighted how nutty the and how good the professors are as a team. But in in your experience, Grady, how was it like playing against the professors? I'm just gonna throw this question out there. Uh, the professors are, I mean, what can I say other than the professors? They have a, a pretty unique play style, very aggressive team. They like to look for early groups or early groupings and uh, and try to catch you off guard, try to catch people on rotations. Um, so once you get the hang of that, you kind of get an idea of what to expect from them. But they will still definitely hit you something out of left field that you're not expecting if you're not paying attention to the map and you're not warding correctly. So very tough team to face overall. Very, very strong synergy team. Um, if you really let them do what they want to do, they will take the game and they're going to snowball out of control. Yeah. And Hello, we I'm were back. Talking about... <laughs> Welcome back, Wangle. We were, we were just talking about a little bit more about the bracket, um, but we have some t statistics, the, the statistics for you guys, because we talked about how Crazy Fool was a really good Richter. Let's pull up those Richter numbers, okay? Wangle, talk to me about these Richter numbers. Yeah, I mean, these numbers are pretty nice for uh, PCC history. Obviously, a 55% win rate means more than likely it's going to win, but it mostly depends on the hands that it's in. And Crazy Fool is the hands that you want it in. He's known for uh, being able to play the lane specifically really well with the Richter, having the lane uh, close to his tower where the jungle is able to gank hitting the hooks when he needs to, setting up free kills, free picks in the duo lane, allowing them to snowball their lead, allowing them to start running over the game, start stacking Fang 2 to get a lot of pressure on the map. And that's what this pick is really good for. Definitely one of those priority pick picks or bans um, looking at the, or overall in the PCC tournament. But now it's time for a little bit of a prediction for the series. Okay, I gotta start with Grady because he's on the left, <laughs> so that means he's gotta go first. Who is gonna win this best of three series, Grady? Is it going to be the Professors or Press Tab? Well, I mean, it's first seed versus eighth seed, a tale as old as time. Uh, P-Tab, I hope they put up a good fight, but I really have to give it to Professors. They're just too strong coming in at the number one seed. All right, and Wangle, are you a believer? of the professors as well or are you a fan of press tab you know p tab they've been around a long time they've been improving and i think when they press tab on the scoreboard at the end of the game it's going to show that professors have won the game i'm sorry i'm gonna have to go with the common opinion <laughs> okay so both of the desk analysts are locking in the professors and for myself, I think I am going, I, I'm always a fan of the underdog. Who knows, right? The, maybe there's a chance that the Press Tab will win their next Pred tournament, even though they won the first ever Pred tournament. So now maybe they'll be able to win this, this um, predecessor tournament as well. So I am going to 
pick press tab um you never know maybe there's some miracle they're able to pull out um, they've been putting in a lot of practice this is definitely a hurdle for them to to defeat the professors but you never know story that that we're going for here okay but that means that we've locked our predictions it's time to get into this draft all right grady we talked about the priority picks being the Richter. What else are you expecting from from uh, professors? Uh, I definitely am expecting professors to hopefully not get Richter. Press tab are the first pick, first ban. So I would like to see Press tab just ban away the Richter. I mean, you know that if you give it to Crazy Fool and he's got the hot hands today, he's going to make the game really hard for you. Uh, I do expect uh the phase ban coming out of the professors and i do know that press tab really really like to highly prioritize bellica based off of their scrims that i was looking at previously um so we'll have to see what comes in as the very first ban for press tab are you expecting the same thing wango is it going to be a phase ban as well uh it's definitely going to be a phase ban on the side of professors but we are seeing the kolari ban Another one of uh, the professor's staple picks, six, known as one of the few guys in comp that will pick the Kalari jungle. Um, so, professors weighing up Richter versus Kalari. Which one do we think is scarier? Apparently, they think the Kalari can just uh, cause so much pressure on the map, make them super uneasy in uh, being able to pull objectives or even just lane normally. Uh, so they want to get rid of that, make it more of a normal game. Um, they do have the first pick as well, so they. If they want to, they can take the Richter on first pick away from Professors. I don't know if they're going to do that. Uh, from what I've seen of Press Tab, I would expect something like a Zarus or a Rampage pick on the first. Um, but we have to wait and see. I will say, uh, being that this is tourney day, big game day, I would like to see Press Tab stick to their game plan, stick to their normal drafts. From what I've seen, they don't really play a lot of Richter. I don't see it on their support. I don't see it on their jungler. I don't see it on their offlaner. I know offlane is a little bit off meta, but some teams still try to play it over there. We see the phase ban just as predicted uh, over on the side of Professors. I'm assuming that we're probably going to see a Bellica pick. I would like to see a Bellica pick because that is what Press Tab is comfortable with. I would not like to see the Richter pick, um, just because, like I said, it is going a little bit outside of their game plan. Um, it is tourney day, as I've said before, so please just play what you play, play what you're comfortable with. We want to see you have a very strong showing, uh, so stick to the plan and, and we'll see what happens. Yeah, we. I'm expecting, as you said, probably like a Bellica, maybe Zarus or Rampage. Um, if they don't pick the Zarus here, I would expect Professors to pick it up. Six is also well known to play Zarus jungle, uh, and it is a high prio pick for Press Tab. Uh, Six isn't really known as a Rampage player. There's the Zarus pick for Press Tab, something that they think is very, very strong in the meta, and a lot of teams think is very strong. I would expect it to go jungle, um, but it can be flexed to both jungle or offlane. We'll have to wait and see. Um, now for Professors. Show me the Richter, show me Richter Gideon maybe. Uh, I know Soul Reaper very much thinks that uh, the Gideon is very strong right now. It gives a lot of prio, very aggressive pick, allows him to do a lot more things that he wouldn't be able to do with other mages due to the teleport, giving that added level of safety. Um, so something like that. We could also see uh, maybe an ADC pick. Uh, like the Drongo, so just locking in Drongo Richter, which is a very strong duo lane. There's a couple options that professors could go down. Yeah, there's a lot of things that are up right now. Still Bellica, still Argus, right? So we're gonna have to wait and see what we get. Richter Drongo would be very or two very strong picks. Drongo uh, Survivor very comfortable on the Drongo, and we do see what Wangle said: the Richter and the Gideon. We know where this Richter's going. It's going into the hands of Crazy Fool. Gideon to Soul Reaper in the mid lane, staple pick for most mid laners, but definitely one of Soul Reaper's strongest picks. Uh, there are still a lot of things on the table for Press Tab, right? We said Argus, we said Bellica, we have even Decker, Rampage, um, so lots of picks that we could take. Um, I don't know what their game plan here is, though. I don't know if they're looking to deny picks from the Professors, which is probably not ideal. The Professors do have pretty deep pools in each of the roles. 
Um, so once again, looking towards comfort, playing what you're comfortable with, playing what you practice. Uh, so I would like to see probably Abelica going to Fepi in the mid lane, a uh, character that he has been playing a lot in scrims recently. We could also lock in the Narbash. Azazel, at the support, has been practicing a lot of Narbash. I know it's not something that you would typically see in the top three, but strong picks overall. Um, or we could just look for more flex potential, just like the Xeris. And it looks like we do have Rampage and Argus. So we see where the Xeris is going, going to Risbro in the offlane. We have Rampage going to Bears in the jungle. Argus, we don't know where that's going. We don't know if it's going to be a mid pick or a support pick. So uh, flex potential there. So definitely looking forward to see what the professor's locking for their third pick. Yeah, I would expect to see probably the Drongo here, uh, just confirming the duo lane. The jungle has quite a lot of options uh, to play here, six. Uh, you know, the Kalari's banned, but very well known for his crunch, uh, especially towards the beginning of the game. He was just the crunch guy in the community, uh, but he's been seen playing Kai, uh, even uh, some tank junglers recently, not as often, um, but we could see picks like that coming out. Um, but I would expect to see an ADC pick here and then maybe even an ADC ban uh, coming out as well. On the side of press tab, um, Okay, there's the Kai pickup, and Wraith banned out, and Rux banned out on the side of press tab. So quite a lot of picks right here, Grady. What are you thinking of these? Um, I'm definitely... It's interesting to see the Wraith ban. I was not aware that uh, that was in the P-Tab pool, but it seems like that's a character that professors just don't want to deal with and then grux being banned on the side of ptab they're denying that from nitro so something that Rizbro does not want to deal with um grux is definitely a menace over on the offlane side and alongside a chimera that's just the bang bros you get them together they're going to dominate that side of the map right so uh i'm definitely looking to see professors just lock in the drongo it's tourney day survivors or survivor sorry your drongo otp i know the professors comms right now they're saying yeah buddy you're on drongo duty get over it uh, so probably going to be a Drongo pick unless he's feeling a little bit spicy. Uh, I could also potentially see TB or Murdoch being locked in here. Uh, and there's the Drongo right there. Saving offlane for the last pick. Very smart if you are on, uh, if you are second pick or second to ban, second to draft. Uh, press tab coming up with their next two picks. Wengel, what do you think we're going to see press tab round up their comp with? Uh... I would like to see a Twin Blast. Uh, you want the Wave Prio into the Drongo Richter, something that can farm from distance, something that has good wave clear. Uh, the Argus, I might expect it to go mid, but they could pick up a Bellica here as well. Uh, I would expect, uh, I know Prestab very much values the Narbash. However, Narbash into a Richter lane is one of the worst options just because he's such a big hitbox. Super easy for Crazy Fool to hit the hooks. Not that he needs any more help. Uh, so, maybe not the Narbash, even though it goes well with the comp. Uh, I'd like to see the Argus go support here and then just try to play waves here. Um, and then probably lock a Bellica mid. Uh, let's them have a very good pick comp. And there's the Howitzer, actually, in the mid lane. Uh, wanting to play from range, it seems. Play poke on the Gideon, play poke on the Drongo, try not to get all in. Uh, very good pick into the Kai. However, again, very big hitbox for the Richter to hit not a Narbash, but it is very easy, can get pulled out of the sky, uh, so he has to be able to play away from the Richter in order to uh, be able to cast his abilities. Just like you said, very big hitbox on that Howie, very bold to lock that in looking in that cop. I see Gideon, I see Richter, and if I'm playing mid lane, I'm probably not asking my team to pick me up the Howitzer, to be completely honest. Maybe I'm taking the Argus here. Maybe I would rather have Gadget. I know Gadget's probably not one of the best picks, but I, I into a very uh, heavy dive comp, I, I don't know if I really like the Howitzer. Sure, Howitzer can deal with the dive, but uh, Crazy Fool gets one of those hooks on you and, and you're cooked. I do like to see the TB. I know you mentioned the TB. Very strong pick over for the duo lane. So we're going to see a Twin Blast Argus duo lane. Very, very strong. Serif in typical Nitro fashion being locked in as the final pick for the professors that's definitely a scary character to see nitro on uh if you've seen uh, nitro play previously he's very very good at the serif not a very common offlane pick but he knows how to make it work so now that we see both of the comps rounded out 
we see Xeris, Rampage, Argus, Twin Blast, Howitzer, four press tab. That is a very scary comp. If they get together, they have a lot of control, lots of range damage, lots of poke. If they get onto you, uh, you're probably going to get deleted very quickly. And then on the side of Professors, what do you think about that comp, Wangle? Um, you know, very dive heavy, very run you down, rush down. The Richter wants to walk at you, he wants to hit a hook. If he doesn't hit a hook, the Kai's gonna jump at you, the Serret's gonna flank onto your backline, uh, the Twin Blast, Argus, Howie, uh, they're just gonna get ran down by it if they're allowed to, or if the Serret is allowed to snowball of control. The Drongo, very safe pick to counter the dive of the Zarus Rampage, uh, but it very much is a press W. We all go forward, we try and kill something kind of comp on the Professor's side. Now we'll have to see if they will be pressing W here because we're going to be watching game number one, Press Tab versus the Professors. Please join me in welcoming Lance and Tedium. Thank you so much, Ardog. My name is Lance Hashishal. I'm here with Weedium. Happy holidays to all of you that participate. Tedium, we got to talk about these drafts. What did you see out of Press Tab and the Professors that gets you excited for this first quarterfinals of PCC7? Well, what I saw from Press Tab was pretty much picking a lot of the top picks. They got Zarus, who I think is the best offlaner right now. They have Rampage, who I think is one of the best junglers right now. They took the... Um, the howitzer who i know i kind of agree with Raddy, doesn't necessarily work perfectly with their team comp but a lot of people have been saying this howitzer we're going to see a lot more of him uh i think this howitzer another new top pick in mid they've got an argus who while he's been nerfed is very good and i actually really like argus support into the richter but maybe that's just because of you know pubs uh he's small so the the bad players can't hit me um but then on the side of the professors the, it's not top picks they do have a richter who is a top pick but on the side of professors it's iconic picks richter crazy fool they've got soul reaper on the gideon that uh, wangle mentioned he really likes of course no jungler doesn't have an iconic kai and six is of course got one and then of course the most iconic probably or most unique i should say is this Sarath offlane coming out of nitro he's the guy who invented this pick it's kind of a battle of what's good versus what's good in your own hands. I think so too. And Nitro kind of the pioneer for this Sarath offlane. We've heard a lot of rumblings about it. I don't actually think he's ever played it in a game that we broadcast for PCC, but a bunch of different people in the offlane were picking this up and trying to utilize the strength of it as well. Nitro kind of the master of it so far. We'll have to see what he's able to do, but there is a lot of counterplay in here. Has the ability to go up with that secondary ability, jump out of the Coliseum if Rizbro is to ult him. A little, little better bit of good early trading as well can dodge the stun from the Zaris with your own primary ability. Go into the multiple strike things kind of become untargetable for a little bit. So a lot of outplay play potential on both sides of these heroes here in the off lane. But I want to talk about something that Grady had said during the draft, this mid lane pick with the howitzer. So many people don't think that howitzer is playable into Richter because his hitbox is the size of a freezer. And if anybody can hit an easy hook on Richter, it is crazy fully or it's kind of his patented hero. What do you think about this howitzer pick in the mid lane for Feppy? Look, I agree that he's probably going to be easier to hit than, say, this uh, Argus here. <laughs> but I do think... Actually, hold that thought. It looks like Kai is looking for a gank. Ooh, here comes Sick. He's going to come in with the ambush. A lot of damage down onto Epps, but Epps still does have the flash, and he's going to have to expend it. So expect Six to come back within the next five oh, minutes as Epps is that. vulnerable already. Yeah, luckily he's got this uh, Argus who is able to displace him and save his life potentially if another gank does come out. That crystal can be used as a sort of giving your ADC a little bit of an escape. Uh, and with, you know, Twin Blast able to dash when he's in the air, he can give himself a pretty long dash. So he might still be safe from a gank, but he's still looking to be a target. But as you were saying, this howitzer pick in mid lane what i really like about it is it goes with the rest of the composition in this long range engage they can land rocks from afar they can land you know twin blast grenades they can land 
uh, Argus stuns from afar, and then of course he can rock his own rocket from afar. So it's just a lot of this long range damage, CC, poke. That fits the comp really well, in my opinion. I think that that is the truth, and I think it's going to be interesting to see where it goes. I know that Feppy really likes this hero um, in that howitzer. There's a lot of different things he can play. I also want to shout Feppy out for switching roles. Originally won the very first PCC ever with TOS, as you can see in his name there, as although he is with PTAB, still rocking the TOS takeover name tag here. But he was actually their support. He supported Lakinator during that event, had a really good showing, has transitioned to the mid lane, pretty strong player all around, has a big history in other games as well. So Feppy, just a gamer at heart, really proficient, but we got to look out. Here comes Six, already getting active. Second get gank of the game, already at four minutes. Risbro is going to be able to just backpedal a little bit, but this is about securing the Scion buff. Denying it from Risbro, yep. getting an XP advantage for your team. What we saw there was uh, both junglers just kind of standing there watching each other in the off lane. Uh, Six eventually was just like, okay, I'm, I'm tired of this. Like, Bears was just staring at him that whole time. So Risbro knew he was there. Uh, eventually, I think Six was like, okay, whatever. I'm done with this. It's time to go get that green buff. So he walks in the lane. Risbro has to go back a little bit. There's not really any kill potential, but uh, just a funny interaction we saw there. And it feels like both of these teams, or I guess more so Press Tab, is looking to kind of take the slow early. Six has been very active, but we haven't really seen Bears get into any of these lanes yet. No boulder throws, no engages for the ganks. So very even in CS, but Six seems to be the one who is more active. We'll have to see if that's going to put him behind in XP and farm compared to Bears here, who seems to be taking that route on this rampage so far. And look at this, he is potentially looking to get a gank here on the left, maybe even up some flashes. But Soul Reaper ganking the off lane. He does this all the time, and Rizbro might be in trouble, but luckily he's under his tier one tower, and Soul Reaper is looking to get back. But on the other side of the map, Bears ganking into duo lane. Ganking into duo lane. Crazy Fool gonna have to flash away as his health bar down to about one third of what uh what it is in totality but able to use that flash. Now he is the one that's vulnerable for about five minutes as Epps has got about two minutes before his comes up too. So probably likely to see even more action over in this duo lane as members of both teams down resources, down an ability to, to escape. You'll have to keep your eyes peeled over here. We will have to keep our eyes peeled on every lane, it seems, because Soul Reaper, is he going for another gank onto Rizbro? It looks like it. He is right over here on the side. And we were talking about this as we were leading up into this team. We were doing a little bit of review of these teams. I'm very familiar with professors, decently familiar with press tab. And the one thing that both of us mentioned to each other right away is how often Soul Reaper comes over and goes to the offlane. In the group session, you and I cast a game with professors playing against the chefs and it felt like soul reaper was leaning against sneaks with as often as he was in that off lane and it seems like soul reapers really sticking to that bread and butter as it worked very well for them against the chefs and they're going to try to execute that again against press tabier i think it's really important to do that into especially a character like zaris who can snowball super easily you know zaris has really strong level one through three and if he can keep snowballing it can be pretty dangerous especially when he starts getting stacks around level six with his ultimate and the other important thing is getting pressure on that side of the map which there looks like they're trying to do again the kai is in the area but wait epps seems to have lane swapped i do find this a little bit interesting nitro is going to take the first stun ball but they're going to turn around and immediately engage back into them which is going to cause azazel to utilize the flash here but bears in with a little bit of a retaliation but he does miss the rock from the behemoth which means that six should be able to just kind of freely walk away blast cone isn't going to be able to pick bears up but he is going to pounce forward into them flash forward aggressively as well and Grenade. just like that put him on the board press tab is going to get the first first blood our eight seed against our one seed in the first quarterfinals of pcc7 and it's all because of that lane swap. I guess it's working out, and it's not working out for Crazy Vol as he misses the hook on Rizbro, which could have spelt disaster. And because of that lane swap, because of that kill, look who is all over that mini prime. It's, of course, Bad News Bears who picks it up. 
And P-Tab looking to change things up here in our game and looking to get a head start. And a head start. They have accomplished uh, Epps. The person that you would want it on your AD carry gets that first blood. A little bit of extra bonus gold. Maybe enough to be able to make them feel more comfortable taking some of these team fights. As it seems like up until that point, they had kind of been avoiding them. I do think that they have scaling on their side in this game. You also see Feppy, who is going the Occult Crest, which means he's going to get the Obelisk, do more damage to that Gideon late game, as he doesn't need the Epoch into him, as he can just either make it rain or boop himself out of the Black Hole. So good pick up there by Feppy to try to make sure that as this game goes on, he's going to be dealing more damage than Soul Reaper on the Gideon. The trouble is, he might want the Epoch into some of the other characters. Chimera, Richter, uh, Sarath, a lot of characters really want to get on him or pull him towards them, and an Epoch certainly would help. I'm personally, I don't know if I'm in the minority here, I'm not a big Epoch into Richter kind of guy, because basically all he has to do is wait for you to come out of the pink state, and then he can either pull you, skewer you, there's a bunch you can do. Six looking to get another gank into this dual lane, still no flash onto Azazel here, they just burnt it over in the offlane. The coal is going to come down on top of the silence pit, going to be enough with the burn and able to get him, and the fight is on six low now too. One member has fallen, actually two members, the dual lane, four press tab have fallen at this point. They're going to trade back and get 6-2. Bear standing in front of that dual lane trying to fight them, but I don't think he's going to win that, even though he is glowing purple. Nitro, actually now as we move into the mid lane with a nice little dive onto Feppy, who comes around the back side of it, you know Feppy is spamming and missing right lane right now. <laughs> you still still don't think you should get an Epoch based on what you just saw? I no, I do not. I still do not think that Epoch was the right move, but time will tell whether or not Lance is wrong, and I've been wrong about a bunch of things when it comes to predecessor. The big thing that was really important was that gank on the uh, left-hand side, the fight. They did lose both their duo lane on the side of P-Tab, but because Bears was there and because Bears was able to clean up the kill onto six, it didn't allow the professors to take the uh, Fangtooth. So the fight that they were looking to get and then get the objective was kind of washed because of Bear's rotation, which is really, really important. It's something you need to be paying attention to as a jungler. You have to be on top of that. We do see the first neutral objective going the way of Press Tab right now as they have found their way the into the Sang Tooth Pit. Do oh the second one actually? Wait, no, it's the first one. Don't be surprised. Oh, I prime. guess with the with the first mini prime. Yeah, I apologize. I forgot that the first mini prime was taken beforehand. That's something we're seeing a lot lately, where people are prioritizing that first mini prime overplaying to that duo side lane of the map so we have actually an advantage for press tab as bears was the first one to pick up that mini prime they're gonna get the first fang tooth as well once again i think they have a slight scaling advantage here too and although they are down one kill and maybe a little cs early press tab being a little bit more competitive in this early game than honestly i was expecting out of them tedium I think you took the words right out of my mouth. I'm really impressed with what Press Tab has been able to do in this early game. I love oh, that wow. lane swap. Azazel's oh just toast here. No, no need to really go into oh. the details of about it. Crazy Fool sees you. Crazy Fool hooks you. Crazy Fool skewers you. Survivor's going to be able to pick it up. That's tournament day Survivor, baby. Look, we were talking about how Azazel has that advantage. You know, he's got that small body. He's got that odd job advantage. But uh, we're not playing slappers only. Crazy Fool has ranged engage, and he is going to kill you. He is. The behemoth does come out of bears here as the rock did land early in it. Crazy Fool now low in health, but Six is here to be the hero. Now they just got to kite away, keep Crazy Fool alive and away from bears. And once again, we are in one of these situations. Actually, Feppy shows up here to try to help as well, but they got down onto the ledge. Six doing what he can now to chop at bears who needs to run away, but the ambush is going to be enough. Six going to get uh, pulled or not six, I'm sorry, Feppy gonna get pulled in by Crazy Fool as well. And unless Azazel can clean this up, it is a three for one in the side of Professors here. Only six falling in very late into the fight after the first person had died, respawned and came back to the fight. P-Tab was just a little bit unlucky there. Professors, their duo lane got out of the fight at like one HP each, and Richter gets his shield passive back up, and he says, you know what, I still have a hook, I'm going back into this fight. Gets the hook on to the howitzer, and it, you know, secures even more kills. Bears falls as well. It was just honestly a little bit of unlucky, you know, 
damage coming out of b tab because Professor's Dual Lane, as I said, got out at 1 HP and then was able to re-engage. Able to re-engage, able to keep Crazy Fool alive during it as well. Six doing, you know, what Chimeras do and what junglers do, taking fights to the very end. But really clean execution out of Professor's there. Crazy Fool is going to miss the, the hook and then get hit with the, with the stun from the Argus. Soul Reaper now over here as well. Big black hole underneath it. Going to force both flashes out of the duo lane. That's going to have to be them retreating, but the rest of P-Tab moving over here near the three camp to try to keep this tier one tower in the duo lane alive, it looks. Soul Reaper is all over this map. I, I think I feel like I blinked and I missed his rotation all the way from the side of the off lane. Like, I think he was, last time I saw him, he was there and he was getting, you know, pressure onto this side, giving Nitro the ability to take a tower. Soul Reaper has been really, really impactful despite not, you know, getting a lot of kills yet. Burning two flashes there is really important, especially for this new mini prime that's going to fall to the side of the professors unless PTAB has anything to say about it. Yeah, and it looks like they are moving around to try to have something to say about it. As you see, Azazel, Rizbro, and Bad News Bears coming around. Looks like we're going to get a big team fight here. Going to have to use the crystal to get himself out. And Rizbro is just caught between all of those members on the retreat. But Survivor's going to take him down with the rad rounds. Now it's Azazel who is in the back. He's going to fall as well. Once again, two members of Press Tab down early in a fight and still have the secure on that mini prime as now they've got their attention set to bears hook is gonna miss from crazy pool so bears should be able to just walk out but once again on the opposite side of the map we've got nitro split pushing and getting free solo xp it's not the split push that is impressing me it's this tier two tower that's probably gonna fall down six has the mini prime buff and Pepe is gonna fall because the hook was perfect Man, two blinks come out from that engagement from the side of Press Tab. So that is at least four blinks that are down on that roster right now as they had gotten the duo lane just a second ago. Rizbro going a little sicko mode here. Very, very back in this. Going to use the Coliseum, but that's just going to put it on to cooldown as nobody from his team was there to help him with that. I don't know how anyone from his team could have helped him with that. His duo lane, no one has blink, and we just saw his mid lane and his jungler blink as well. No one was in range to engage with Rizbro. I think that was some desperation coming out of the off laner. And the lead is starting to grow. We just took a look at the tab screen. Have close to a 100 CS advantage for them right now. Up quite a bit in kills, 3 to 10. Had a lot of CS as well, and oh, poor Ooh. Epps just gets caught out you find the seraph seraph so sticky especially when you're in adc there's nowhere you can go they will now not have their adc for this thing to fight which means it should be free for the side of professors as they take a tier one tower as well over in here bears misses a another rock still has the behemoth available but isn't gonna burn it for this gonna have to back up actually now as it looks like soul reaper is gonna just turn around and chase him, provide a little bit of zoning. Bears didn't hit that the right direction. Gonna have to use the behemoth to try to stay alive here, but Survivor's gonna take him down with the rad rounds. That is not a good series of events for it. Make It Rain does come up from over the top. The hook is gonna miss onto it, but they're gonna chase him into that blue side jungle as well, it looks, as Fepi turning around, trying to get out of there as Nitro is on him. Nitro's gonna pick him up, actually, and this entire side of the map, past the river all of the way up to almost the inhibitors now is controlled by Professor. We're going to easily pick up Azazel as well. Rizbro will be the next victim. Only Epps remains four members down for press tab. We are only 17 minutes into this game, Tedium. Uh, P-Tab is out to lunch, but Professors are the ones that are eating. They have no more towers except for the one in the off lane. P-Tab's in a dangerous position here. They were looking so good at the beginning, but all of a sudden, professors do their patented, we're just gonna start playing now, and win every single engagement since then. Whew. Take a look at Survivor's kill score right now. 8-0-3, 131 CS, has more kills than PTAB has kills and assists combined right now. Survivor is absolutely cooking. I think that's just, you know, coming down to the fact that he and Crazy Fool have been laning together for just so long. They know how to lane together. He 
can take all these micro advantages. They're just so comfortable with each other. And Feppy looking a little bit uncomfortable because everyone is in the area. And remember, he doesn't have that epoch. <laughs> doesn't have that epoch, but is starting to get a lot of AP with those obelisk stacks coming up as he is still able to call a decent amount at 122. I mean, I guess that's not like fantastic, but considering the disadvantage his team is at, he's still keeping up as well as he can in CS. I, I just got to say, it doesn't feel like there is room for press tab to breathe. Professors is putting on a real clinic in this game. And I think the right play at this point is for press tab to try to stall out as much as they can get some of that scaling that we talked about, get rampage to the spot that he's going to be super hard to kill that Pepe can one shot survivor or can one shot one of the other squishier members bears needs to start landing these rocks as well. That will help a lot to get some of those longer range engages on. Ooh, picking six here in the jungle could be okay as well, but just like that, the rotation comes out of Professor's Nectar, jumps back into the offlane, but Epps is actually going to be able to pick it up. So now they've got a little bit of an advantage. Actually, it looks like Bears is going to fall, so we are back to even strengths here, but the health bars on PTAB very low on some of the important members like Rizbro here really don't have a front line with him at that percentage of HP, so they're going to have to get a reset, probably give up this offlane tier two tower in the meantime. The big problem for PTAB that they're facing right now is much like Professor's Team Comp, I think both these teams really want to be the ones engaging, picking fights, and starting fights on their own terms. Rock into, you know, an Argus stun, into a Howie Boop towards you, into a Zarus cage. Like they, they want to be fighting when they want to. But they don't have a lot of counter engage. They don't have a lot of peel. They don't have a lot of things to get the Sarath, to get the Kai, to get the, uh, the Richter off of anyone. So they're kind of just in a position where professors are playing the way they want to be playing, but PTAB doesn't get that opportunity. They don't, and oh, Bears, I'm not sure about that. He takes the blast cone. They'll still have the pounce to be able to jump himself away, so not terribly unsafe, but that could have gone disastrous if the right member was waiting for them there. And they are aware of the fact that professors is going to try to start this orb prime the 20 minute orb prime and that's because ptap's got no way of getting into it what are they going to do how are they going to walk into this they are losing every single fight they go into professors has four times the kills that they do a 100 plus cs advantage and they don't even have to commit all of the members as crazy fool and soul reaper can just zone right here bears is going to get back into this is he going to be able to play hero ball no he's on top of the silence field so he is going to get taken out. Epps is going to have to flash up over the ledge, but Nitro still pursuing. The ventilator is going to come out, but doing a good job of dodging. Rizmo going to put him into the cage, but Survivor's going to pick up Pepe in the back line as well while we are not looking. Nitro does look like he might fall here. Sticks doing a good job of trying to get in between, but they are just going to trade themselves back. Black Hole is going to flash or cause the flash to come out of Azazel, but Survivor is behind you, and Epps is the only Survivor Four press tab in this, and once again, four members dead on the side of e tab. Four heroes dead, and soon to be two inhibitors dead. They also have minions in the perfect position to be able to take both of these inhibitors. And they got the orb prime during this, which means they have that extra pushing power. Bears is up now because he did die very, very early in that interaction, but it will not be in time to save either of these inhibitors like you mentioned, Keeve. Oh, and he's going to get hooked! And he's going to get put back into spectator mode. He's going to take another 45 seconds to watch his team try to claw him back into this game, but it's starting to feel inevitable. Another oh hook! My God. That hitbox is just so big on Howitzer. Crazy Fool's not going to miss stuff like that, but Feppy isn't able to get back into his fountain there. Rizbro is going to have to flash to get back into it. Health bars are starting to get a little bit of oh Crazy Fool does not miss into the black hole. Rizbro the only person up right now. Rizbro not the only person up. That's the full RGS ace. That's the full game one. If Press Tab wants to survive, they are going to have to win both games two and game three of these quarterfinals as game one goes to professors in clear fashion. Look, I'm sorry, PTAB. You are crazy. You are fools for not banning this Richter. 0, zero 16, the perfect support game coming out of Crazy Fool. Unstoppable. Like, that was like four hooks in a row right there at the end. <laughs>
<laughs> it was shirt. like four hooks in a row, and I, I got to bring it out. I was going to wait until a later point in this tournament to show it off, but Crazy Fool was just standing on his damn head. Crazy Fool, my MVP of that game, very, very clearly. Tell me what else you saw, Tedium. I, I don't really think I can think of anything right now because all I can think is Crazy Fool hit four hooks right there at the end. I mean, they were probably going to win the game anyway, but it was just like, you know, an extra little bit of uh, rubbing salt in the wounds. Like, look, this is why you ban this character. Crazy Fool is so insane on this pick. And I know you want to ban out the Kalari. I know you think Six is scary on Kalari. And look, I've never played against Six's Kalari, so I don't know. But I have played against Crazy Fool's Richter. And uh, I fear that far more than I imagine I'd fear the Kalari. Kalari's scary, but this Crazy Fool Richter can win games single-handedly. It can, but I'm really excited to hear what our desk has to say about this. So I'm going to throw it back to Grady Wangle and our dog. Take it away. Thanks, Lance and TM. I think Lance is a fan of Crazy Fool. Uh, what a game between the professors and press tab. Game number one going towards the professors uh, leading to their victory. They just played with so much comfort. They played together as a unit. And we saw how good each member of the professors just worked alongside each other. All of a sudden, Press Tab was just facing this scary team in their middle inhibitor at 15 minutes. And I mean, they had first blood on six and started off strong. But Wangle, what went wrong there for Press Tab? Uh, yeah, I mean, Press Tab started off the game in front. They pulled off a lane swap where they put the duo lane and off lane. Might have been inspired, those of you that watch professional League of Legends, uh, there was a team in the Korean finals recently that pulled off a lane swap and won the series. Um, so it might have been inspired there. Got the first blood onto six, but a lot of the team fights or the objective uh, contention just seemed very uh, split, very disconnected. Some people are looking to go in. Others are saying, we give it, we're going to back off. We're not going to fight. Uh, seemed to not be uh, a level of cohesion there that would be good enough to compete with the professors in that game. They definitely hesitated and it was apparent through the screen. But on the other hand, Grady, though, what went well for the professors in game number one? The professors got to do a little bit of schooling in that game. They did what they do best. They group up, they fight you, and they're very good at that, right? P-Tab just trying to fight into that. And it's sometimes it's just a hopeless battle, right? Uh, a little bit of over rotations coming outside or from the side of P-Tab and professors just capitalizing on it, right? Uh, that rotation early on for the in the for the four for one in the duo lane, Soul Reaper uh, didn't even have to rotate. His team still won the fight and he picked up a, a tier one, right? So that's early gold in his pocket and professors just overall played the map absolutely stellar. Yep. And we'll just have to see how game number two will go. Don't go anywhere, ladies and gentlemen. We are going for a break.
Welcome back, everybody. My Sorry. Welcome back, everybody. My name is Ardog with the Triple G, and I'm back with Wangle and the Gratty. We just watched game one between Press Tab and the Professors. Exclamation point bracket to stay up to date with the games today. What's the score? Where are we at the quarterfinals? Exclamation point bracket. We saw how the professors put on a show and was able to dominate and ultimately win game number one, but we also saw Sareth in the hands of Nitro. With that being said, let's take a look at some Sareth stats from Swiss and groups. Grady, what are you seeing on the screen? Well, as you can see, Sareth has only two games played, but with a 100% uh, win rate. So 1.41% pick rate and 1.41% ban rate. Nobody's really touching this character, but we did see it do incredibly well in that last game on Nitro. So very interesting to see. Yeah, we it's he's yeah, definitely. One... Go ahead, Wangle. Sorry. One thing that I'd like to call attention to is it only had two games in Swiss stage. We think of Nitro as the guy that plays it. However, Nitro wasn't even here for group stage. So, uh, in the hands of the offlane Sareth creator, master, whatever you want to call him. Uh, you know, we can even see, like, we can see the win rate stay to 100%, because in games where it is good, Nitro will play it, and he'll play it very, very well. And we saw how good he was, even though they did a little bit of a lane swap mechanic um, from, from press tab, he was able to respond and react well. And we saw how he was just diving, he didn't even care. He went to mid lane, he rotated over there and secured the kill over on to the mid laner from press tab. Um, so there's a lot of s at stake here for game number two for press tab, because if they win this, they are totally out of of the tournament PCC 7 goodbye okay they are not going to be coming back tomorrow meanwhile if the professors win the second game they'll be coming back tomorrow for our semifinals and grand finals and speaking of which we will be back live tomorrow at 11 Eastern Standard Time or 5 p.m. CET for those who are uh, from Europe if you're interested in watching that as well it is going to be a nutty of a weekend its main event everybody all right without further ado let's take a look at the bracket grady we saw that they banned the kalari out do you think that's a good ban from press tab or are you expecting something else i would really like to see something different as you saw there was no kalari last game right it was first ban but the professors absolutely dismantled press tab uh with no kalari six was just piloting the chimera like I said, the, in the last draft, they do have pretty deep character pools. You can't really ban them out. You might not like dealing with the Kalari, but press tab, you're going to have to find a way to deal with it because you really got to take Crazy Flaw off of the Richter. We saw those hooks hitting. We can't put the Richter in his hands again. And are you expecting the same Wangle? Um, definitely the same ban from Professor's side. They really don't like the phase. We are seeing the Kalari ban again. I guess Press Tab have just decided that's the thing that they want to get out of the game. Even though they played against the Richter last game, when 0016, you know, classic crazy full fashion, he's hitting the hooks, he's doing the things that he needs to in order to generate picks, create openings for his team to take objectives, take towers, what have you. Um, they decided, nope, Kalari's still more important to get off the table. You know, maybe we see a different first pick here. We had the Zaris last time. Uh, I know Press Tab very much think it's very strong in both its roles, both offlane and jungle. Um, but it seemed to be a little bit disconnected with the ults last game where it was going in uh, away from the team or the team wasn't in a position to follow up. So we are going to see it as the first pick still. Uh, so we might be running back a very similar draft. Yeah, uh, looks like Press Tab is saying that they want their salty run back. They definitely going for the same first ban and first pick. And we see professors are locking in Gideon and Argus. So Argus most likely going over to Crazy Fool in support. Gideon once again going back to Soul Reaper in mid lane. Um, professors very comfortable where they're at right now with their draft with locking in those two picks. 
press tab i'm gonna need to see something from you guys you guys had a pretty solid early game or opening of your last game they weren't able to capitalize on getting that first blood and getting some momentum on the map so hopefully in their top three here they're able to get some picks that are going to be able to assist them with actually getting something going and hopefully they were able to do a little mental regroup because we did see them like looking a little shook up in that first game maybe it was just first time jitters and we should see uh, a better performance in this second game so narbash and rampage both being locked in very strong first or top three picks coming out of press tab so and then crunch being locked in over on the side of professors yeah so a couple things to break down here press tab very much fans of the narbash azazel seems to be his staple pick throughout the tournament so far and they really like it with the rampage zarus zarus i can imagine going slightly a tankier build in the latter stages of the game uh and they just want to be the team that are going to be running in uh with two beefy boys big frontliners running in jumping on whoever they want to and then getting beefed up even more by the Narmbash, but with the heals and with whatever stats he's giving based on the items, if he goes crystal tier, the ability haste, or things like that. Uh, but we are seeing the crunch come out. Uh, the Zarus and Rampage both, uh, you know, can get CC locked by this crunch pick, and we're seeing gadget bans and a Serith second ban for P-Tab, so I guess that's the one that uh, they did get terrified by last game, not the Richter pick. So we do see Drongo being locked in as the fourth pick. Once again, Survivor being the game day. Drongo OTP, only on Drongo duty. Uh, the gadget ban, very interesting because we didn't see that in the first game, unless I'm mistaken. Uh, but it is really solid into their team comp, into the Gideon and the Crunch. Uh, very interesting to see, like you mentioned, the Serith ban coming out from press tab. Uh, something that they're not used to seeing. So, you know, it's always safe. If you don't know how to deal with it, take it off the board. You won't have to deal with it anymore. And it's just a safe ban overall. Really interested to see what press tab do decide to lock in. They still need their mid laner and they still need their AD pick. So I'm, I'm assuming we're probably going to see another twin blast pick, maybe even another howitzer pick. And instead of the twin blast, we get Kira. But we're going to have a run back of howitzer in the mid lane very similar comp for press tab uh in this game as their last game severog being the last pick for the professors wangle what are you thinking about these team comps man um the severog pick something that has popped up very recently in professor scrims nitro is going to be piloting it in the off lane they're putting him in the weak side weak side princess he's going to be scaling for late game uh, but the thing I want to call out about this draft is the Kira Narb duo lane, something that's kind of regarded as one of the worst duo lane pairings in Predecessor. Two very low cryo picks, neither can clear the wave, neither can really even step up, uh, and it allows the Argus Dronga to kind of cast from range and always have the prio to do stuff. And that is the draft. But Grady, we this is game number two, and there's a lot at stake here for Press Tab. How can they beat the professors with this team comp? Well, they have a couple of options, right? They can look to shut down the Severog, get the Zerus big, get the Zerus all over the map, and looking to punish uh, the squishy targets on the side of the professors. Or the Rampage can do what Rampage is like to do, and he can go over and try to camp the duo lane. That Drongo and that Argus are going to be very, very aggressive in that duo lane, right? Survivor Crazy Fool on two aggressive picks into what Wangle said is a low prio uh, lane. So that Kira and the Narbash are going to have a really rough time dealing with that. So Rampage is over there to bail them out maybe land them a couple kills, they might be able to get some traction and get moving in this game. And lastly, Wangle, looking at the Professor's team comp, how can they continue to snowball and secure their victory in game number two with this team comp? Yeah, very obviously, uh, the crunch is going to have a lot to do. It has multiple things it can gank. It can uh, get onto the Howie if, he, if they're able to get some CC. Soul Reaper will be able to follow on the ganks. Howie can get picked. But the main thing is obviously going to be uh, the duo lane. Uh, around six spikes, the Professor's team is uh, probably the stronger team. Uh, I don't think the Kira will be able to get her ult off at all this game. Um, at least in an ideal scenario. So it's kind of up to Press Tab to slow the game down uh, and keep it even. 
Um, if they are, then the NARB will scale uh, and they will be able to play these fights a lot better. But professors obviously have the prior to run away with this game with their draft. I guess we'll have to see. Are we going to be seeing another lane mechanic swap 5v5 at mini prime? Ladies and gentlemen, we'll just have to see. We're going to throw it back to our casters, Lance and Tedium. Thank you so much, our dog. We are ready for game two here. A little bit of change in the comps. I'm still shocked to not see Richter banned or picked at all through that entire draft process. Give me your thoughts, Weedium. Honestly, Lance Ashishal, I think the big thing, professors, they don't want, you know, they like playing predecessor. They don't want to win too fast, maybe. Maybe that's it. Maybe they just want to, you know, take them off the Richter, let the game slow down a little bit, have some fun, take their time, enjoy a nice long day of Pred. Maybe that's what they're looking for. I do want to say, though, Crazy Fool is the self-proclaimed best Argus in the world and the moon. So we will have to see if they have decided to give them mercy by not picking the Richter or if they've decided to go full gas pedal by putting Crazy Fool onto this Argus. We also see Survivor on the character that he played and was like, I believe, 10 and 0 or something close to the end of the last game on this Dronger, the Dr. Ongo, how, where is the spot that Press Tab can get themselves back into this game and try to find an advantage? Well, it's certainly not in the duo lane. As Grady pointed out, Narbash Kira is gonna have trouble facing up against this Dr. Ongo and uh, the Argus. But in the mid lane, I do, I do kind of like Howie into Gideon. Maybe Feppy has, you know, seen what uh, was happening in the last game and maybe was able to make a couple changes hopefully but really the big thing for press tab is this off lane Rizbro is playing a very aggressive early game as i always say very strong level one through three on zaris and nitro is playing Severog, who is going to take a long time to come online so Rizbro has the opportunity to snowball this lane especially if he gets a little bit of help from his rampage who as who is similar in that he in comparison to the crunch is gonna have more impact earlier in the game i'm glad that you mentioned the crunch because i think that that's something that we also need to mention here six one of the best people at counting to three in the entire community was really heavily playing crunch during the first couple of months of the game opening up for its beta um way back in 2022 early 2023 he was all over that hero we talked about it a little bit before how he had kind of fallen off wasn't or not not six had fallen off crunch the hero had fallen off hadn't really been in favor we've only really seen nugslip from the high pick crunch in comp predecessor lately but with six being one of the best crunches in the game able to pick it up here play it into this rampage on the side of press tab we'll have to see what sort of advantages he can get as his clear early is much faster than the rampages is his clear is faster but his gank potential is certainly lower bears if he's landing these rocks he can engage along with a lot of his teammates from distance as i said in the last game this howie a rock from afar can be followed up with a rocket from afar or a boop from afar. They have longer engage range. And we see just like in the last game, Six coming over here to take the prio onto this Scion buff, try to get an early XP lead into the off lane or onto the side of Professors, at least as it does look like Six is gonna be the one who ends up picking that up. Crazy Fool does hit the stun into Azazel followed by the crystal, which is gonna pull him in. Gonna have to use the thunk for the disengage there as Azazel probably going to fall if that thunk does not land. And just as we said, uh, or just as Wangle said as we were leading up to this, so easy for Survivor and Crazy Fool to step up here, do some poke, do some long range chip damage and take the action two eps and azazel here on heroes that need several levels into them before they are too impactful in a game luckily for them though that chip damage that poke can be washed away by azazel and his walking fountain i think that these lane matchups i although it's very clearly in favor of dr ongo and argus they you know have some ability to counter it 
They do, and here is Six once again coming over to the offlane. He's going to use the Q to be able to get out. Going to have to flash away too from Rizbro. Probably doesn't want to stay and pick up this lane unless Six does walk away, which it looks like he is. So Rizbro not going to lose this experience from about a wave and a half. You're going to have to farm it under his tower, but they are already pressuring and identifying that this lane may be their weak side of it and that Nitro might need a little bit of assistance. The rest of these lanes have the priority, have the advantage so six can focus this and try to keep this Severog in this game early where he is at a disadvantage into the Zaris. Yeah, and when we're seeing things happen off here in this dual lane, Crazy Full Survivor are actually positioned pretty well. This gank from Bears might not be super fruitful. He's right by his tower. He is right by his tower, but the rock does land. The thunk lands after that, but actually it looks like it's Epps who is going to take the worst of this trade. Crazy Fool should be able to just get a back off and reset here as just Epps and uh, as, as Epps, Azazel, and Survivor are the only ones left standing in the lane. Rock's going to go a little over Survivor's head, so no counter get, or no follow-up secondary gank coming out here. Survivor trying to soak up some solo XP, but like you said, right by his tower, no real potential to jump in here and try to do anything to him, and especially with Six waiting right behind the fog wall. Yeah, but maybe Eps and Azazel are able to take this gold buff. Looks like uh, they do elect to take it. I was just getting some vision, but Crazy Fool and Six are in the area, and they have to retreat. Oh, that's that's not good the azazel is gonna have to flash there and we saw six at the beginning of that i was really hoping they weren't gonna take the bait and go for that gold buff they were they were licking their lips hoping that they were going to able to burn the flash out of it didn't get the kill that they were <laughs> expecting so reaper gonna ult from behind the wall here but pepsi pepe able to just kind of walk out of it as he is pretty full health and reaper just doing what he can to bully him honestly look i like the attempt from reaper he's out of mana he's just kind of like I'm just going to throw these out, see how much damage I can get out. Um, Feppy, though, was able to just walk away pretty much for free. So Black Hole being down does benefit him in the mid lane. But Nitro potentially giving the hands to Rizbro as he Colossal blows him back towards his own minions. Now into the river, and it's not a safe haven, Rizbro. Nitro with the first blood in the Sevrog into Zaris matchup, but now he's in danger as it's another interesting lane rotation in this game as well. The duo lane in the off lane for the second time in a row, and Nitro is on the retreat, but the chase continues as Epps and Azazel might take him down. He doesn't have the Q anymore, so no chance to pop the stacks as Nitro gets safely under his tier one. Oh, huge huge survive by Whoa. nitro there epps is able to flash in and pick six up so at least at least they get something for coming all of the way over here beside this wave and priority on the mini prime side of the map but nitro being able to get out there putting on a clinic on this hero are we sure that's not lobber but the way he's piloting this ever on Look, maybe he took a couple lessons from Lobber. It doesn't it, just because they're professors doesn't mean they can't learn from others. Now it looks like there's an engagement happening right here around this mini prime. Pepe uses the alt, and he now doesn't get any kills, but just throwing some damage onto this mini prime. Bears really wants it, but now Nitro is alone in the pit. Bears forced to blink away. He is going to pick it up, but he's going to die immediately afterwards as Soul Reaper opens the black hole up on top of his head. So yes, they get the global gold, but immediately the threat that can come with putting your orb or your mini orb buffed up member in a lane and empowering those minions is gone. You see Rizbro here trying to play into a lane with survivor as well but once again at a range disadvantage at a damage disadvantage at this point gonna be hard for risbro to consistently stay in here as you see actually it is the dual lane making their way back to their proper lane epps and azazel on their way to try to stop the aggression from survivor who is up almost 30 cs on epps at nine minutes look i think that's partly because of this rotation all the way to the other side of the map i do like it though both times in 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 last game and in this game eps and azazel rotating over to that solo lane did end up being you know impactful they got their some them their team a mini prime in this case it was immediately washed away but still that doesn't mean that their impact on this side of the map was not fruitful Oh, uh, and there's no way Nitro is... Oh, okay, I, I lied to you. I was going to say, there's no way Nitro is getting out of this. 
Coliseum is going to come down as I know he does not have his flash. Going to use the Slither to get out of there. Soul Reaper doing a very good job of body blocking bears from being able to pursue him. And nobody's going to fall there when it really felt like Nitro was absolute toast. But speaking of toast, Epps is going to get stuck down into the toaster as six roams around, gets that good gank off, which should free them up for this first Fangtooth of game two of our first quarterfinals. Look, there's just, uh, Epps is really, really impactful on the offlane, but he's struggling here on this side of the map. Uh, he is just getting, being able to be run down, and, and the key thing that happened there was Professor's actually made sure to stop dealing damage to Epps to give Survivor that kill, who is getting focused down by Fethi's ultimate. But run away. Oh, Soul Reaper Black hits a nice ult on the three of them, but he's gonna die right away under all of it which actually it seemed like the advantage was to the side of professors here after they had killed epps but the death timers are very short as we are only 10 minutes into the game they're going to get back in here they're going to pick soul reaver up who ults on the ground and it's actually press tab once again taking an early objective advantage in these games of these quarterfinals so far yeah, but they're not healthy enough and you know azazel has no mana so they don't actually you know want to stay up here a too long six is in the area but he is low health so will not be looking for a gank yep just gonna hit that reset off try to get back get a couple more items get that scaling going he is level six at this point so the full kit of crunch unlocked which is where he really does become a hero but let's talk about this level advantage in this offlane nitro up two levels on the zaris this is not something you want to see if you're a Zaris. Zaris is good into Severog, especially early. It's when they hit level 6 that Severog will not win the fight, but will be able to peel himself out of the cage because, of course, if Zaris leaves the cage, the cage falls down. So you just ult him off of yourself, leave the cage by just walking away. The fact that he's winning this is really coming down to the fact that they've he's been getting a lot more impactful rotations. He has been getting more impactful rotations. He's been to the places that he's need. And they also haven't been able to take him down at the times they need to, but they are going to try once again as Bears comes in with the Rock. Coliseum's going to fall down from Risbro as well. But just like you mentioned, it takes one colossal blow. That Coliseum is down. We miss Soul Reaper, but he does pick up the solo kill onto Feppy in the mid lane. And it actually looks like Risbro's going to be the one to fall. So Nitro gets ganked. Does not matter. He gets the he gets the kill back. The opposite direction bears has to retreat from his own red side jungle and much like what we saw in game one tedium it feels like ptab doing what they can to get these neutral objectives but the fights are going the way of professors and it feels like we're just repeating what we saw last game and the snowball is starting to roll down the mountain at this point as we said in the last game P-Tab's composition really wants to be engaging on the fights. They really want to be starting things off. They really want to be engaging when it's their advantage. And they just haven't been able to have these opportunities. They're really focusing on getting Nitro. And I think that's important because you don't really want a Zaris that's too down on a Severog. But I think at this point, they really need to try and focus on this dual lane because I, I think it's actually Epps who's going to be able to deal the damage that can follow up. If it's not going to come from your ADC, I'm not sure where it's going to come from. Feppy has gotten himself pretty far behind in this game. Rizbro kind of all but out of this game as well, especially into a character like Severog, who is now just so much more tanky than the amount of damage that Rizbro can even deal. Bear's going to have to jump out from his attempt to invade that enemy five camp. I think he was able to get a decent amount of that, so good for Bears, but still has a lot of catching up to do as the rest of ptab does as well yeah no mid lane tower anymore for feppy he's in a lot more danger and yeah you you push him into yourself he's just gonna ult you six comes in as well and feppy might be in danger Feppy is in danger. Reaper going to take the Torn Space up on top of it. Six going to be able to pick this up. Rest of the members of PTAB rushing towards the mid lane to try to keep that mid tier. Oh, actually, the mid tier one is already gone. So they're just rushing here to defend the tier two to stop themselves from losing that at this point in the game. Kind of surprised to see only one tower so far down and taken in this game 
14 minutes in. Sea Professor's here moving towards the mini prime, trying to secure that. We'll see if Press Tab decides to pop the Behemoth to make it, but they're going to be a little too late. Behemoth does come out. Big Coliseum is going to trap everybody inside of it. But are you trapping them or are they trapping you in there with them? Ep actually going to be the first one to pick it up. Go in to the purge. Going to try to do what he can to put some damage down as it looks like still only six has fallen. Survivor is getting very low in this fight in the 1v1 against Bears. You see Nitro having to use the slither away. Crazy Fool here with a little bit of peel to make sure that Nitro remains deathless and is able to get out there. So Mini Prime secured for the professors, but Press Tab does pick up a kill in the fight and are looking to maybe get this first tier one tower for themselves in the off lane and even up the score. This is exactly what I said. Press tab wants to fight when they have the advantage. The other team was on the mini prime. They were a little bit distracted. They were able to get a really solid Coliseum, and that combined with a behemoth just blocking all the damage, really. Epps was kind of free casting, and he ends up getting a double kill in that fight, taking down the jungler, who I assume got the mini prime, and also taking down the enemy ADC. And then they didn't end up getting the tower, but they got a fight in their advantage. That's what this team comp wants to do. Sadly, Soul Reaper on the other side of the map does take down the tier one against Feppy. He does take it down and it looks like they're going to get themselves their first thing to as well. So both of them getting the extension to their buff durations at this point. Neutral objectives have tied themselves back up as far as Fangtooth and Mini Prime are concerned. Both teams having won at this point. Both of the people who secured the Mini Prime also yeah. die immediately after taking it too. So a little bit of a Spider-Man meme. Absolutely, but Rizbro, he still has his tower, so not looking to be, uh, you know, towered of by Nitro. Instead, they're looking to just maybe get a kill and take his tower after. Ooh, Bears takes down the best Argus in the world on Crazy Cool. Rizbro getting pressured on the other side of the map, though. Nitro going to sneak behind him, hit him with the Colossal Blow. That should be a tier one tower on this side, but Survivor here against four members all by himself until Six shows up here. Behemoth does come out. Six going to come and do what he can to try to pop him up. Make it rain comes down from Feppy, and that's going to be Survivor falling as two bears picks up both of the kills on that now sitting at two one and three and they've got their eyes set onto this tier two tower six is here to try to defend it big black hole is going to come make everybody jump out and clear the wave as well from soul reaper here so the pressure onto the tier two now has been swatted but on the other side of the map as we've been saying these guys are doing a really good job of each of them playing the other side of the map and knowing where they have an advantage and have a disadvantage at. And right now, Professors has an advantage in the off lane, getting some ship damage into this tier two. An advantage might be an understatement. Nitro has clearly won this lane and it's not really all that close. Rizbro has been struggling. He's been getting focused though. Soul Reaper, as we said, loves to gank offlane, and he does it again. He ganks offlane, they take the tier 1, then Soul Reaper backs and defends his tier 2 on the other side of the map, but Soul Reaper has been in this offlane consistently. And that's something that I expect to see tomorrow if Professors wins this game and makes it to our semifinals as well. Soul Reaper, pretty much any time I've ever watched him scrim or do anything competitive-wise, he is such a heavy roaming champion and player always moving over to check out what's going on in the duo lane in the off lane making impacts helping to make sure and secure that his side lanes have the advantages in games which really appears to be the winning formula for professors yeah and it's not like he gives up on his uh mid lane advantage either he has won that lane pretty solidly as well the tower is gone and you know feppy is forced to defend his tier uh, two and actually soul reaper takes the red buff from bears he does take the red buff he's also going to take a little bit of aggression here as many members of professors three of them in fact have moved over into this red side jungle once again claiming their territory letting press tab know that this might be your side of the map at the beginning of this game we are 19 minutes in, and now this is our side of the map. Pressuring both Tier 2 towers, or trying to get waves into both of these Tier 2 towers in the off lane and in the mid lane. Nitro does have bears behind him. Gonna take a rock to the face, but as we've seen, a lot of self-peel potential 
for Nitro here, who is going to just kind of slap bears back and forth a little bit. Very unafraid to fight both of these. Does miss the subjugate. Will take another rock to the face, but just barely falling below half health at this point as he's been occupying two members' attention from the side of press tab. And there's Soul Reaper looking to gank this off lane again. Nitro not scared, saying, I'm going to push forward. I'm going to bait them in. And there's his Gideon. Black Hole's ready. Is Rizbro in danger? Uh, and Rizbro just used the stun as well. So he's going to have to commit his flash to get himself out of there. Behemoth does come from the side of Bears. But the portal from Soul Reaper going to be able to help Nitro get out as well. Feppy, I don't think, wants to step up into that. The rest of the members of Professors are over there in their blue side. But Epps, the single dingle, the solo bolo. He's going to put down Survivor. We said it early. They need their damage to start coming online. And Epps certainly has done so. They need to be focusing all their engagements around Epps. And then, on, of course, on the other side, Professors, they need to get Epps. He's kind of the real, I don't know, threat that PTAP has right now. And I know that Professors are, you know, maybe thinking, man, I really wish I had a Richter so I could pull that uh, little Kira in. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure that that is the exact thoughts running through their heads but we got to get ready for this the third fang tooth of the map is getting set to spawn looks like press tab has the inside track with them being on this side of the map the members have arrived first as well as survivor just passing his tier two tower but i feel like the enclosed area team fight although they've got a crash bang boom and the purge from epps just feels a little stronger for professors for some reason in these epps in a little bit of a forward position here kind of on his own they might be giving up their tier two in mid for the second bank tooth actually it looks like they're just going to set the wave get a good priority here as six does take a rock from it survivor now in retreat mode as he was isolated is going to get booped up by crazy fool with the crystal here try to help him survive a little bit but crazy fool now the one who is taking a bunch of damages bears is into the back line survivor's going to get put down crazy fool is going to get put down bears is doing what he can to get up on top of the six here but epps is going to pick him up as well going absolutely ridiculous here for a quick second is epps definitely doing a lot of damage is going to end up falling himself as well as Rizro. So with three members up on the side of Press Tab, two members up on the side of Professors, I don't believe we'll see anybody going for this mini prime. Epps picks up a triple kill in that engagement as they chase everyone from the left side of the map all the way to their base. But they do fall down in trade, and Six and Nitro just decide to take this Fang Tooth all by themselves. But of course, Bears is in the area. No ultimate available for him, though. No ultimate available, no Fang Tooth available as well. Gonna miss the point blank rock, which I don't think he wanted that fight anyway. It's probably good he didn't hit that and decide to go in after it, as yeah, Azaza was right around the corner. But Nitro has been putting on an absolute clinic on this Sephiroth. Probably would have been able to eat him up pretty quickly, even with that passive on Bad News Bears, giving him the extra health regen while in the jungle. There's just not much he would have been able to do there, in my opinion. No, his best bet was probably just a 50-50 coin flip. But really, what's been happening, and I really don't like pointing this out, is this is what happened in game one. Bears has not been accurate with these rocks. And it continues to be the trend here in game two. This composition really wants to engage when they have the opportunity, when they have the advantage off of the back of one of these rocks. And with them not hitting, they're kind of their whole team plan really falls apart. Epps trying so hard, there's not much he can do when, you know, there's not a lot of opportunity to start fights oh, on their own merit. Nitro, though, starting a fight on his own merit. He is starting the fight, and Nitro, you know, he dodges two of the big CC abilities and then comes back, hits a Colossal Blow right into his own team. Coliseum's going to come out, but there's already... Actually, it looks like the only member that has fallen so far is Six, and Nitro's going to be the next to go. Big Black Hole is going to come out of Soul Reaper here, right on top of Bears and Azazel. Azazel's going to be the next to fall. Epps falls as well. Make it rain from Feppy. Is it going to be enough to pick up Soul Reaper? Doesn't look like it is just quite yet. Going to get some assistance from the Orb Prime as well, who's going to beam 
Soul Reaper, and now it is Crazy Pool and Survivor in here on this alone. They're going to have to get off of this as they don't have anybody to take it or anybody to secure it, but that is the full five members dead. RGS ace for the size of professors in that fight. I actually thought that the, the engage from Nitro was really good, and then it I completely changed my mind halfway through that fight. Epps got a kill onto six. He got a kill onto Nitro. I was like, whoa, Epps is just doing so much damage, you can't even engage on him. But then all of a sudden, the rest of professors rotate in and blow up the remaining five teammates of PTAB. And uh, the fight looks completely different after that. Epps still remains the real source of damage and the real source of hope for PTAB. And the moment he's gone, fights look very different. The fights look completely different. It's also going to free them up a very, very free or prime as nobody from uh, from Press Tab remotely close to being able to contest it. And they need to be careful here in their own red side jungle as well. As if any of these members fall in here, it might be enough to snowball into the game completely finishing. Do still have to get through these tier twos, still have to get through these inhibs. But with the amount of siege that is in this professor's comp, and with having the Orb Prime buff up at only 25 minutes, there's a insane amount of pushing pressure here, especially with Pepe on the other side of the map trying to do some counter split pushing. Yeah, they don't have a lot of lane clear without Pepe. That's one of the dangers of Kira. She doesn't really offer much value when you're very, very behind at clearing these waves, but clearing health bars is what Crazy Fool does as BN Bears falls in his inhibitor. Ooh, Rizbros comes down with the Coliseum onto a full health crunch, so maybe just trying to lock him into place, but this could spell disaster for them as that Coliseum is down now. They also do not have their BPS frontliner in B and Bears as he got caught with a large CC chain. Make It Rain does come out, but it's not going to be enough to put down Crazy Fool. Soul Reaper's going to come in with the Black Hole, but it's the health bars of PTAB that is starting to fall. Rizbro's starting to go a little bit low now too. Big, long stun does miss from Crazy Fool, but very, very close. Good for the zoning. Actually, only Epps remains. Four members have fallen. The Purge is going to try to come in, but they're just going to bop him up. That's five members down again. That's our first quarterfinals of the day. Professor's going to take it down in clear, ex exquisite precision with the way that they played both of these games very very clean Epps did put up a very good performance in this game trying to do what he can to play hero ball but it's not going to be enough 2-0 for professors what do you think tedium um i think if i'm Epps, i certainly want to avoid pressing tab in that game and seeing what is uh going on with the rest of my teammates. Epps tried really, really hard, but when you're the only person who's really able to put any damage out, who's really able to do anything impactful in any of these engagements, and you're a Kira, that's... There's a, there's a ceiling to what you can do by yourself as a Kira. You can't clear waves. You are pretty vulnerable. You could potentially get your ult canceled right away. There's... Yeah. I think I want to give PTAB just oh, go ahead. I think PTAB just had exactly what happened in game one happen for a second time. And I think they actually had a worse ADC than they did in the first game. I, I struggle to disagree with it. I do want to thank PTAB, all of the guys, Rizbro, Bad News, Bears, Fepi, Azazel, and Epps for participating in our tournament. You had an amazing run. Con congratulations for qualifying for the top eight. But we got to send it back to our desk to break that game down a little further for us. Thank you so much, Lance and Tedium. Congratulations, professors. You are advancing to the semifinals. Exclamation point bracket to keep track of the games today. If you want to know who's playing on what team, what's the current score, exclamation point bracket. That'll get you to the website. GG's and thanks for playing press tab. Wow, I gotta hand it to them though. Watching game number two, Epps really popped off a little bit, but unfortunately it wasn't enough because game number two goes the way of the professors. Um, Wangle, what happened? What went wrong for press tab? Um, you know, first off, gotta say fair play to the boys on press tab. Uh, you know, much better performance than game one. Uh, really came out, really tried to show, you know, we deserve to be here in the top eight, made professors, uh, 
you know, have to think a bit, put some pressure on them. Uh, played much better as a team at times, but I think ultimately where it fell apart was not playing as a team in the right times and scenarios, not knowing who to prioritize, how to peel for them. Like Epps very fed in that game. Uh, obviously offlane was pretty behind, so Nitro is very big. Uh, but you know, if you have a fed ADC versus a fed Sev, you know the ADC should have the priority. The team with the fed ADC should have the priority. But Epps dying a little too easily in some of the fights, not getting peeled enough, uh, not getting focused or slightly out of position. Whatever happens. Uh, but really good showing from them, like really good job. Yeah, they did a fantastic job during that series. That was the eighth seed versus the, the first. But Grady, what else did you observe and how did the professors secure their a spot in the semifinals? Well, the professors are really good at generating pressure and also they're very good at dealing with pressure, right? We saw at the around the 12 minute marker, Nitro dealing with the 1v2 very easily and then ending up with a kill out of that as well onto the Xeris. He was very huge. He played the map very well. Everybody on the Professor, Soul Reaper, uh, managing his rotations very well, picking up kills here and there, getting the flashes for his team to help them set up plays. Um, and then I, the Professors did a good job of identifying who was doing the damage on, on PTAB, right? Kira dies, the game's over. And anytime they pick the Kira, the fight's over. Kira was making some big plays, but there were just too many members of Profs that were able to make something happen. And you could see how their communication just translate into their gameplay because they, whoever they prioritize, everybody would just hone in on that single hero or person. Um, but if you like what you're seeing here at the PCC, please make sure to drop us a follow, subscribe. We are on YouTube, Twitch, Discord, uh, X, TikTok, Instagram, all of the socials. We also still have our, um, we're still building funds for our prize pool and of course the PCC production. And so make sure to type in the chat exclamation point support um, and make sure to, to just support us because we're here and we're having a good time right along with you but game or best of series best of three series number two will be dirty lake and the boys versus flow state coming up next we will be right back
Welcome back everyone. My name is Ardog with the Triple G and I'm back with Wangle and Grady. We just finished watching the series between PTAB versus the professors and professors will move forward tomorrow to the semifinals. But now we will be watching Dirty Lake and the Boys versus Flow State. This is the second quarter finals of the day. So who will be going against the professors tomorrow at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time or 5 p.m. CET? That we will have to see as we go into this series. Um, talking about this series though, let's take a look at the head-to-head -head stats. All right, Grady, talk to me about what you're seeing on the on the screen here. So both teams very, very similar KDA. So both the teams like to fight well and they do get things from their fights. We did see in our last head to head that the professors had over uh, it was over five point, if not close to six point, if I'm not mistaken. So both teams like to fight, but not quite as much as the professors. So both teams still really like to have their farm and have some downtime. On the map, in terms of objective control, Flow State very strong in that department, whereas D-Lab kind of lacking a little bit in comparison. And in terms of the gold per minute, we're almost identical, really close. First time that we've seen that, and I'm not sure if we're going to see that anymore today, so really cool to see that. Damage per minute also only about 200 off, so very, very similar in that department. And in terms of CS, I mentioned before, both teams like their farm and 31.8 CS per minute versus 31.5 CS per minute definitely shows that there. What else are Most you seeing with yeah, the bands these, and the picks yeah. there, uh, Wangle? Uh, yeah, so on the side of Deep Lab, uh, most picked is the Drongo. They love to have Lakenator on that Drongo uh, just so he can play safe in lane. Uh, be able to farm up on his own, be kind of more independent as Toasty does like to roam around the map. And Jay on the Kira is a very classic pick that we've seen from Flow State, something that's popped up a lot in this tournament. He really thinks Kira is in a strong spot at the minute. Uh, and something I want to call out though is Huang is the most banned for Flow State. It is a pick that Lobbert really seems to like uh, from previous scrims, from uh, previous uh, group stage. So, you know, Lobber might be put off the Kwong, might have to go onto some of his other picks, like the Zaris. Maybe we'll see the Sev pop up again. And one of the heroes that both teams really like, though, is the Lieutenant Bellica. Grady, what are you seeing on the screen? So as we can see, just like with Richter, Lieutenant Bellica, very common pick, super flexible, can play mid or support, and just a character that can fit into pretty much every single team comp that you could imagine. 68 games played, 70% pick rate, 70.42% to be exact, 25.35% ban rate, and a 60% win rate. So we're seeing this character, we're either seeing it in the draft as a pick or a ban, and if it goes on a team, 60% win rate means it's most likely gonna win, depending on whose hands it's in. And one thing Alaka I would like to mention- is just one of those heroes, but yes, go ahead, Wangle. 
Yeah, real quick, something I'd like to call attention to is in the previous patch that has dropped in between group stage and this main stage events, is Bellico has been nerfed. So whether we'll see these kinds of stats, uh, I doubt it. They're probably going to be slightly lower. However, it is still a flex pick. Teams really love having flex picks in drafts. It allows them to move something to wherever thing it's most powerful in. Uh, it is still good mid. It is still good support. Uh, Gwussi, especially uh, every time that I see Gwussi on Bellica, I've never seen somebody hit more three-man knockups. It's kind of ridiculous at this point, uh, but four people in this game that I think are very, very comfortable picking the Bellica, so it can be a staple pick during the series. Definitely didn't see Lieutenant Bellica with that first series though, but just like what you both mentioned, Bellica just able to cause a lot of upset depending on which side she is in. And that win rate of 60%, that, that's, that's quite a bit. But let's talk a little bit more about these teams. Uh, Grady, I think you got some insider knowledge about D-Lab. Talk to me about them. So uh, I'm speaking as a former teammate of D-Lab. I played with them, if I'm not mistaken, in PCC4 and PCC5. So very strong players in every role. Have Appy Picker in mid lane, North, their new jungler in this PCC, Lobber, the off laner, and then the, the Canadian duo lane of Toasty, Lake, and Nader, both best friends that have known each other for a very long time. Very strong team all across the board. They really know how to play the map well together, and they know how to play off of whoever is generating that gold income and prioritizing them uh, in terms of wherever they are on the map. So not a team that's one-dimensional. They could play through any lane, and they're very strong all across the board. They've always been in our finals or in the semifinals, but they haven't secured a championship yet. Is it going to be PCC number seven? Who knows? But Flow State, Wangle, what can you tell us about them? So it's a team that's been together for the most part for a while now. Simba, Jay, and Gwussi uh, all playing together for a while. And Peak was the sub for offlane uh, last PCC. He played a couple scrims with them. so very much uh, a team that's very together and it's going to be kind of a weird match because Bry was the mid laner for D-Lab last PCC uh, very much known for his Iggy pick uh, wonder if we're going to see that come out yet or come out during this set I don't know we haven't seen it yet so far in the finals um, but Bry has always been close friends with Simba with Jay with Wussy like that kind of they're a very close-knit kind of friend circle, so he's fit really well into this team. They're playing really well. Uh, they're taking games off of top teams in scrims, so I think this is going to be one of the more interesting... I think this is probably the most interesting match of the quarterfinals. I don't know which way it could go. I have no idea either, but we got to do some predictions. And I did ask Grady the, uh, this question the the first time with the series but wango i'm gonna ask this question to you who are you expecting to win this series dirty lake and the boys or flow state so they played in group stage and d lab did come out as the winners however both teams i think have gotten significantly better but i think D-Lab in recent scrims have been looking very, very strong, even against Ooh. the top favorite teams for the tournament. So I'm going to have to go with D-Lab. He's locking in D-Lab. And what about you, Grady? Uh, I'm a little bit biased. Like I said, former teammate of D-Lab. I have nothing, I wish nothing but the best for those guys. Strong showings every single time. And, uh... I don't know. I, I definitely have to say I'll give it to D-Lab. I do think Flow State is going to have a really strong showing. They have taken games off of D-Lab. They are very close in skill, but I do think D-Lab have the edge and the experience. So that is definitely why I have to give it to D-Lab. I know with the previous series, I picked against whoever you guys picked, but I am going to lock in D-Lab as well. I'm a fan of the Canadian duo from D-Lab and of course Lobber lives in Canada. I'm from Canada, so I'm going to be supporting Dirty Lake and the boys. But now that we've had our predictions in, let's look at this draft. And I will say just real quick, I do think whichever way the set goes, my prediction is a 2-1. It's a 2-1, okay. Uh, Grady, picks and bans, what are the priorities for both of these teams? 
So I have been seeing Simba playing a lot of Richter. If d has been doing their homework, they could take him off that, knock him off of a comfort pick, or they might be able to just pilot that uh, or deal with them getting the Richter. I know Flow State really, really likes to prioritize heavy control picks. They like their Deckers, they like their Bellicus, they like their Richters, even the Argus. D-Lab already taken the Argus off the table. D-Lab saying Argus is really strong. Uh, we don't want Bri to have that in his hands. We saw him in the Swiss stage and the group stages piloting the Argus. Very strong showing, so a character he's comfortable with and a character that he can definitely do some damage with. Uh, Flow State, not really sure what they want to take off of the table. We saw that they really like to ban the Quang. Uh, North and Lobber, both very strong Quang players. Uh, I think Lobber is the one that typically gets the Quang if it goes to D-Lab. And it's just a strong offlane pick overall. He has seen some nerfs, but even with those nerf bats, Kwong is not showing any signs of resistance. Very strong pick, even still now, in my opinion. Yeah, I mean, I feel like this is going to be one of the hardest drafts to predict. I feel both teams have multiple different comps. Everyone has a lot of different picks. There's a couple things that uh, I think will be staples in this series. I think Steel Offlane on the side of Flow State. We're going to see a Kalari ban over on the side of Flow State. Uh, North is the type of guy that will pick these type of picks. He will pick the Kalari jungle. He even in rarer scenarios has picked Serith jungle in some of the Friday night tournaments. Uh, that one's probably not going to happen today, but it's a fact that these type of picks can come out. Uh, the reason that they're going to get banned, the reason that uh, Flow State are kind of evaluating them. Um, but I would say the easiest to predict lanes here are probably going to be off lane. We're probably going to see Zara's priority, Steel priority for the side of Flow State Peak, very much known as the Steel off lane guy. Uh, not many other people are playing it as much as, especially not as much as him. Um, and then we're going to be looking at Kwong picks as well. So those three champions are going to be the main staples for offlane. But everywhere else on the map, we might see a Kira and a Drongo, but can kind of go down many routes. And we do see the Zaris there, first pick for D-Lab. So Zaris getting locked in as first pick. We saw a press tab heavily prioritizing the Zaris pick. We don't know exactly where the Zaris is going to go because it could go to North or it could go to Lobber. Very strong first pick locked in for D-Lab. But Flow State, there's a lot of stuff on the table for them, right? We have Belka, we have Decker, we have Richter, we have Rampage. Lots of really strong picks across the board. Interested to see what they want to go for. In traditional Flow State fashion, like I said previously, they really like to prioritize heavy control. So I do expect to see maybe a Decker Belka, maybe a Richter Belka, maybe that nerf bat hit Belica a little hard like uh, Wangle said. Maybe we see them stray away from that Belica pick. So I'm interested to see what the first two picks from Flow State will be. They could look to take away the Drongo from Lakinator uh, because Jay also has a strong Drongo of his own. It looks like, however, we are going to see that Belica and we are going to see Flow State take the Quang. So instead of banning it, they want to pick the Kwong. We don't know exactly where it's going to go just yet. So very strong flex pick. We see Severog and Drongo being locked in. So we know where the Zeris is going to go. We know where the Sev is going to go. Drongo being locked in for Lakinator. Tourney Day comfort pick for him. And just a strong ADC pick overall. So Lobber on his own comfort pick as well. The unstoppable Swedish force. Severog is a character that he is known for. The character he is known for. He is the Sev guy. So I de I definitely a strong pick being locked in for D-Lab. Yeah, and I think the interesting thing to note about this draft is the Tsar Severog will be a double flex. North seemed to be the only jungler consistently playing uh, Severog jungle uh, in the group stage in the play-ins. It is something that he's very comfortable on, something that he looks very strong on. Uh, so Tsar Severog can be double flexed. We do see the steel. Um, so uh, double flexes on both sides. Both teams have the option to go either way with the draft. Uh, the Severog into the Kwong or Steel does get to scale pretty well. Um, but if the Severog goes into the jungle and the Zaris goes off lane, the Zaris can't really run down the Kwong as easily, but it can kill the Steel. So there's a lot of interesting matchups that we could see b between these two lanes. The Iggy getting banned for D-Lab, getting Bry off of that signature pick, something that allows them to just sit in mid lane, scale up, uh, contest wave pressure and do lots of damage to a comp that wants to 
run forward and the Narbash ban for flow state again something that allows teams to run forward very hard uh you know become very tanky uh get a lot of uh get good scaling but also good pressure uh yeah again i don't know i don't really know what we're gonna see from these last two picks on either side gideon coming out for flow state very strong in the previous series we saw um bry very good at it as well and yeah really good looking comps on both sides so far i do want to point out that in our top three and both bands for both teams no richter to be seen so very interesting as both these teams do like to play richter richter very strong pick overall nobody picking up the richter nobody banning the richter so no one's even scared of the richter as it stands uh richter still uh are available for d lab they have not locked in the support pick yet uh i do see that the toasty narbash the signature narbash we saw him solo cold with narbash in uh, my 1v1 gratis gauntlet tournament it was an iconic moment everyone loved to see it uh, so if you're able to solo an adc as narbash you know you got some hands on narbash but phase and howitz are going to be the last two picks locked in for d lab so we have the phase drongo lane uh the appy special howitzer going into the gideon typically gideon is a rough matchup for the howitzer but appy saying bry i'm not scared of you i got some hands and i'm gonna show them to you and i got some r2000s to go with them kira being locked in as the last pick for flow state we know that jay loves his kira and he's gonna show us what he can do with the kira both these comps are looking pretty powerful from both of these teams wengel what do you think about them uh, on the side of Flow State, very much a press R type of comp. Uh, you have the Steel ult, you have the Gideon ult, they want to combo together. The Kwong as well can hit the tether um, and like cause picks with that. You do have the Bellica to follow up on the tether, Steel CC. Uh, they would like these kind of CC pick comps. It's something that they played a lot during groups. Um, they have very good team fighting capabilities. The main thing I would look out for is D-Lab playing for first mini prime onto the Zarus and allowing him to push in the steel as the steel doesn't have anything uh, good to clear the wave. So that might be the main weakness with their comp. And then the D-Lab comp, very brawly, uh, scales very well as well. So good comps on both sides. I gotta ask though, Grady, they, Wangle did mention that D-Lab's comp scales really well, but what's the strategy with their team comp going into game number one? So for D-Lab, it depends on where the Sevrog is going to go. Uh, we're not really sure what the matchups are going to be because, as mentioned before, we got flex options. Zerus and Sevrog could go either in the jungle or the offlane, and then on the same side of flow state, Steel Kwong could go in the jungle or the offlane. So matchup dependent, depending on where these matchups are uh, line up. Uh, if it's a Sevrog a Steel matchup in the offlane, Lobber's going to have a, a very fun time over there with the free scaling matchup. They'll probably put him over on an island, and they're going to look to prioritize making things happen in mid and in duo. So I believe if we get Sevrog over in the offlane and we get some action happening early in the mid and the duo lane, that is going to be D-Lab's key to victory here. Dirty Lake and the boys versus Flow State. Get those points in. Get those predictions in, everybody. This is game number one in this best of three series. We're sending it to TJ, DJ, and Tang. There are three things guaranteed in life, death, taxes, and a banger series when TJ and Tang are on the mic. Welcome everyone to the casting desk and what a matchup we have. Flow State versus D-Lab. I think it's fair to say as well, probably two of our most evenly matched teams, Tang, going into this one. There's a lot to look forward to. Yeah, definitely. D-Lab and Flow State, <clears throat> they did, did meet each other before in the Swiss stage, and now we get another treat of a game. It was close then. It is hopefully going to be close here, especially if we listen in to what the analyst said. But yeah, definitely the game to watch for this quarters, in my opinion.
Absolutely. And also watching these teams as well in our preparations for this quarterfinals, as we are going to jump down onto the battleground, you can see the beautiful overlay, the graphics. You can see the rosters as well as they stack up. I don't know, Tang, there's something special about both of these rosters. I mean, D-Lab in their recent uh, results and their group stage performance looked like a different team with that addition of North in the Jungle. But Flow State probably exceeded a few expectations as well, coming out swinging in that Swiss stage. So we're expecting this one, I would say, to be pretty close and pretty brawly as well yeah I, I think if you if you're not familiar familiar with flow state and you think it's just gonna be an easy win for dealer but i think you are gonna be mistaken flow state has been proving themselves over and over again we saw wangle mentioned before as well that they have been taking scrim sets off of teams that you mm. really wouldn't expect and they're definitely not sort of like the statisticians that stand in the backgrounds but they are also the protagonists they used to be deja vu before now they swapped out the jungler and they're back with a vengeance for this pcc and i'm really looking forward to what they can cook up in this game because on based on that previous uh, knowledge as well with d-lab and flow state thinking back to that group stage as well and also the scrims that we were watching in preparation for this matchup as well there seems to be two very common threads flow state coming out of the gates very early having a much stronger early game but it's just that one objective fight either that second fang tooth or the first all prime that just doesn't go their way and d-lab just take it to the house so we do we think that that could happen again I think it's it's almost a trend at this point, right? You, you just you just mentioned it. It's it, it kind of happened every single time we saw those two teams uh, uh, sort of play against each other. It was always just flow states, getting those early objectives, getting those early carries, playing really well around those early item timings. But then, as time goes on, D Lab sort of uh, team fighting just pulls them back uh, from a deficit. Now on the dual lane, Lakinator gets hit up. Oh, he's going so low as well. I don't think Jay was able to proc that ability. He's only level one as well. But already, this duo lane starting to feel the pressure as well. And I think that's a good segue to maybe look into the composition as well. We saw Professors banning away this phase in their game. Of course, that's a bit of a historical ban for the Professors as well. But D-Lab taking the Drongo and the phase lane tank. How do you think it matches up? Yeah, I mean, we, we can see right here that Gusti is just doing a bit too much. Mid lane gank by North is going to get the stun onto Bry. Mm. Forces the blink away. So not even giving us a chance to talk about the dual lane. But now I can maybe just go back to that point. It is sort of Gusti smurfing on the Bellica usually. Toasty just looking to deny the playmaking potential from the Bellica. And then hopefully towards the late game, just come out ahead in terms of scaling. Oh, it's just got to be getting to that point as well. As I say, these games also seem to be very drawn out. 25 plus minutes. We're not expecting them to be as quick as our first quarter final. Just having a look here at the junglers as well. Lorba might be in a bit of trouble here coming uh, in from the gank from Simba on the steal as well. Got a double buff. So that bull rush is going to land immediately. Going to force that first blink. So a little bit of pressure being attached to that right hand side at least as that first blink gets blown. That's a really good gank by the steel. Ganking at the time of where the Cyan is up, that's something we've seen a lot in those sort of comp games. It's the jungler just making the rotation over to get that Cyan. Ooh. Now Lakinator gets really low, has to blink away. Jay follows and gets the first blood. Toasty in a bad spot now as well. Is able to escape, but first blood to Jay. The pressure just unrelenting in that duo lane and first blood on the board for flow state as well. Going into Jay's pocket to start that uh, we were expecting here. But, you know, wanting to see how flow state want to transition that as well, because that was in isolation. That was an isolated two versus two kill as well. No jungle or mid lane interaction just yet. So maybe that segues over to North uh, as well. So what can he do to maybe uh, do you think he's going to try and answer back that deficit or is he going to look elsewhere time? I think he kind of has to look elsewhere. Like with that, with that uh, phase, a Drongo lane. If they, if it goes behind, it's a bit rough, especially against the Bellica. Like you can still have that long range setup with that phase beam. But I would actually expect him to play around Epi more. Like we we highlighted it before a tiny bit on the desk. It's just Epi really good uh, with most mid laners, especially on that Howitzer as well. And it's so, sort of the playmaker for D Lab. And I'm expecting North to realize that play around the mid lane, get him ahead and then once epi gets a lead in the mid lane he can transition that towards the dual lane or towards the off 
It's taken a little bit of a leaf out of the professor's playbook as well, thinking back to that first quarterfinal matchup of the day. We were mentioning backstage, kind of this Gideon into the how it's a matchup is a little bit more Gideon sided. So maybe going for those early rotations, trying to impact the side lanes as well. But so far, so good, at least for uh, the Flow State team as well. Gossi we'll being a bit aggressive, not going to find that starting assault just yet. Simba showing face. On this left-hand side, neutral starting to spawn. Fangtooth just popping up 30 seconds ago. Mini Prime about a minute and a half away from spawning as well. We're just seeing where the junglers are going to be right now. As Simba is going to be spotted out north, right place, right time in his blue side to maybe dissuade a gank from Simba on that left-hand side. And it's smart positioning by the dual lane of Dealer. Realizing that they are weaker, just playing a bit more back with Toasty on that phase. It should be really hard to get a good gank in. On that off lane, though, we see Held first dropping its peak, getting a trade into Lorba. Lorba going really low, but nobody should die off this gank. No peak potentially. I mean, if you had that Fury of the Heavens, you might be looking at a solo bolo in this right hand side. But uh, not for the first time this game as well that Lorba and uh, Peak have been just trading out consistently in that solo lane, both going very low, both having to reset as well. I'm just going to maybe look ahead as uh, I'm trying to think with that uh, first mini prime fight as well with the, the jungle matchups as well. How do you rate that matchup, you know, in the 2v2 kind of the, the mid and, uh, sorry, uh, sorry, jungle and solo lane matchup against these two? Well, I think it's it's whoever gets level six first. And I think North just stole away that red buff, got a cheeky invade in. So if he actually turns to level six, it could be a good time. Now he's looking towards the dual lane. AJ and Gorsi, gotta be careful. The energy lance will be thrown out by Toast. Not gonna find the route just yet. North looks to the barricade stun, but it's a very uh -oh. split target. And you can see that D Lab starting to return a lot of damage. Lake Nator will uh, get pulled away. Flow State want more. There's a J gonna shadow glide forward. Gorsi leading the charge, decides to be a sort of void. Uh -huh. I'm gonna land, gonna make its mark, and that's a kill. Gorsi getting the killing blow. The energy lance comes out, but can't tag onto J. And Flow State find a second kill of the game. And that's exactly why you don't want to play around the lane that is losing, because then even if you are the jungler, then you're just going to get boxed out. You are still going to lose the trade, as we saw right here. It's just Che with the Shadow Glide getting a lot of damage on top of Lakenator, securing that kill and making the lane even harder to play. Also pushes the Seraph a bit behind in terms of, of tempo now north on that offlane. Lobber already forced down low, subject connecting, connecting on towards Peak. will burn that blink very early, but he has at least got the explosive plant to get some distance. He will keep himself alive this time, but North trying to make moves on the side lanes. Peak still sticking around, maybe trying to challenge, but actually North gives him a level six and throws down the column. See him now, Peak has to be careful, got no blink. He's gonna look to the heavens, look for some divine intervention. He's not gonna find it, North gets to kill. And now Happy Picker is in trouble in the mid lane. Simba with the gang of members, so Assault ball rush damage, able to proc down, but Happy blinks away from the shield slam. And now it's Simba, has got to be careful because Lorba is here. The Severog wanting to make amends, wanting to get revenge, and Simba's in a world of trouble. He's going to use maybe that Blast Flower, but he's not going to find the angle. Still has to get away. Might have to take the long way round, but Lorba's just going to run him down, subjugate, siphon, going to connect. The Simba doing what he can to delay time, but I think Simba's days on this map are numbered. Yeah, it does look like he is. doesn't want to give the killer over to Saras. That's why he just runs around the ro ring right there. I don't know how the saying goes exactly. But ring around the rosies, I, do know... I think is the... Uh... <laughs> yeah, but what I do know is that the kill does go over to d -Lab that has sort of uh, gotten the advantage back after having a bit of a rough early game again. Nine minutes hmm. in, no objectives have fallen yet. We've seen kind of a trend. We've seen Jay being the strong side for uh, Flow States and for D-Lab. It's uh, the Sarahs making those plays. Of course, yeah, you know, North finding that uh, that kill on towards Peak again. Might have to say a few question marks about Peak Lunky to rearrange, but North wants to collect, wants to get another stack. Peak, though, even with, without his blink, still has to respect it. Doesn't want to overstay his welcome, but Lorba is at half HP as well. Also has to be careful, the Teva going to connect as well. He's not quite going to go for the full oh. commit. No, North is around. Lorba throws a colossal blow, expecting the dive. But he's just going to have to go back to base. Yeah, that was a colossal something. But yeah, it doesn't connect with the Quang. 
That's a big cooldown blown by the Saras. Uh, excuse me, by the Savrog on that offlane side. Um, a bit surprised, right? With all the time invested by Saras before uh, chasing after the Quang on that offlane, securing that Cyan buff, etc. Like he had a chance to go for that Fang Tooth to trade out something for that, but instead he did go for the Howie Gank that didn't go as planned. Now mini time being started up by Flow State. And it's just those moments as well, those coin flip moments, the rolls of the dice not going in Flow State's favor. As they are going to start up this Mini Prime. Like, as evened up at least the kills of the Mini Prime going away. Going to be given over to Peak as well, just to make Lorba's life in this solo lane a lot more miserable. We know what Lorba can bring on a Sevrog, one of his signature picks, but it feels like it's a very, very big hill to climb to get him to that point. Does Adil have one to respond though? Going to start up onto this first Fang Tooth. And with resets coming in from Flow State, this one should just be secured by D Lab. Shouldn't be in time for the steel to actually get there. So it, it, it's something we see a lot of, right? Trading those first objectives, the mini prime for that Fang Tooth. Who does it benefit? It's always the question, right? Like if you can use that mini prime to open up the map to get a few tier ones, then it's definitely the mini prime giving you so much mm. gold that you can easier contest the second one. But if you are not able to do anything with the mini prime, then I would. Would just rather take that thank to from us for sure and we didn't even see peak make that rotation from the solo side with the mini prime buff over to help out with that fang tooth play as well so that is something that we see from other teams as well a bit of a standard playbook simba just moving over to this left hand side of the map the lake nator and toasty having to play so safe they are in a deficit in this dual lane as well and they probably know north is not gonna help them out much more so they have to just get through this laning phase at least, but just looking at the towers, we're still very much in that laning phase at the moment. No towers have fallen across the map. No towers have fallen. It, it is Peak trying to change that on that offlane with that mini prime, but no chance so far. Che gets caught by North, good knockup. Yeah, the seismic assault just buys so much time. Gussie using our blast flower, but it's just gonna hit straight into a pillar. Colosseum comes down. Gussie burns the blink, but Jay still hitting that damage. This Kira just feels so accelerated in this phase. Mid lane and a, a nice DPS check going between Happy Picker and Bry. And Bry looks like he's gonna win this. He's gonna miss an ability, but a meteor from above collects that kill, and Bry is able to get a solo bolo. A good solo bolo there by him. Uh, secures the kill with sort of the the black hole locking the howitzer in space couldn't use the uh, ultimate to escape so definitely a good pickup it's sort of camping the rotation over now on that dual lane side we see a bit of a push into that tier one tower they really want to get something right peak on the off lane trying to get the tier one but lorba is there colossal blow secures peak under tower forces the blink He's got to be careful as well because look at the minimap north and Simba are on the way. This is a 2v2, but it is going to be in favor of D-Lab with the health bars. Peak thinking about the re-engage the tether, not going to find this mark. It's just both junglers showing face and just dissipates all that pressure in the right-hand side. But look at the minimap. The pressure does not relent. Left-hand side, duo lane tower is going to fall in isolation, picked up by the flow state duo lane. Yeah, Jay and Gwursi just not relenting with the pressure, getting the tier 1, the first tower of the game for themselves. That's definitely some good pocket change in their pockets, right? Jay getting stronger mm -hmm. and stronger. 1-0, 120 CS, finishing up the Vanquisher already going in the sec for the second item. Could be a Sky Splitter, not 100% sure, but what I do know is that he is going to be one scary Kira this game. And it seems as well that both these teams having that scary late game character as well, the Kira that can hyper carry. And if Lorba on the Severog is able to reach that point when Severog is able to do Severog things with the pauldrons, with the spikes, all that health, being able to tank a lot of damage coming through. But again, with how this game is going, that matchup feels a lot further away it is for Lorba. He's just got to get through the next few minutes of the game. I mean, for here and Nado Flow State, as we were expecting, coming out the brighter, we're now a bit stronger as well starting to group up with that first tower dropping on left we'll see moving in towards the mid lane happy pickers landmine is at least going to dissuade the engage from the size of the assault and energy lance coming down as well so toasty responds with the rotation a bit of a grouping up here a bit of an na ramp starting to form as well north goes and presses the button no coliseum on towards grussy the size of the assault buys a bit of distance but to make it rain over the top and now bry looks for the black hole looking for the re-engage they're able to take down north happy picker is saved by toasty but it costs the jungler's life 
that yeah is good. They know there's no blink up, no peak against Lorber. Lorber gets the better of him. Colossal blows him away, but doesn't have enough damage. Peak goes back in. Oh, he's gonna trade into peak? him. Peak one HP. So is Lorber. Both of them at the knife's edge. No blink for Peak. Lorber is gonna get engaged on. Misses the Q. <laughs> but blinks forward with that. Q is gonna secure it. Oh my word! That kill felt personal in the right hand lane but oh my word so close to death i think the minions might get the mvp award as well for so much damage on towards peak really playing with fire as well and lorba that kill felt good that kill definitely felt good it allows the savrock to finish the second item also gives him the fast track over towards that fang tooth that's going to be the next objective we see a bunch of members getting deep vision we see Appy looking towards a uh, simba it's gonna get caught here takes a bit of damage for his troubles landmine does by the distance able to get some space between them but so uh, looking at the map no peaks not on the way those lobo goes in subjugate on towards two members and gussie just gets burned by the rad rounds lake and a to get a kill under his belt but now peak is here maybe flow state want to re-engage this will be a numbers advantage the fang tooth was what they were duking over for and that's what d lab are going to pull towards but a simba is still here he still has his shield slam he still has his ultimate as the fang tooth going to be started peak leading the charge on the front line if they can get to north if they get any cc peak maybe looking towards happy figures right goes to the back Old Pay North has to be so careful to make it rain over the top. A lot of ultimates being committed, but no one dropping just yet. But d -Lab pounces and able to at least get one on the back line. The Simba goes for the re-engage. Flow State actually steal away that objective and even out the Fang Tube as well. Lorba and Lake in the prime pit trying to take out Peak as well. He's just buying so much time. Simba arrives with the oh. shield slam as well. Able to get a kill on towards Lake Such a crazy fight. Help bars are low, but of he's here off of the reset, wanting to make a Men, size the assault, gonna knock up one. Toasty in danger. Toasty gonna be shot out of the sky. D Lab gonna lose two, and Flow State also picking up that set that first fang tooth. What a crazy fight that was. Such an extended engage that Valeka off the death was already there for the reset. And you highlighted it that it's the steer securing that fang tooth. It was a bit of a split call by D Lab. Half of the members peel off the fang tooth in order to turn the other half. Uh, is still on it, so it's actually just a steal for uh, for the steal that was still in the pit, right? And now Lorba definitely not happy with that play. Press the disconnect button. That definitely stings for them. We're having a bit of a tap screen. 516 to 530 CS, a bit of a lead uh, opening up, but definitely not as bad as the objective lead is at this point. Securing that mini prime in a second as well, together with that bank tooth, definitely stings for the lab. Yeah, of course, it's very important to mention as well. As you say, Lorba has disconnected. We are past that point of no return for the reset. So D-Lab will have to play the next few moments until Lorba is able to come back in a four versus five flow state. More than happy to uh, accept that as well, as we mentioned before in the build up to this game as well, that this was normally the point D-Lab come back. It was fights like that that's in the preparation in the previous games have gone D-Lab's way, but now flow state. Granted, of course, they have been helped by that uh, disconnect by Lorba, who is back on the map as well. D-Lab still have a bit of an uphill battle to get to because Flow State's side lanes are looking pretty terrifying right now. They definitely are, right? But you highlighted it before, like the comeback potential of D-Lab is still very real. Mm. With the Zevrog in that off lane, I'm definitely expecting him to get the, to, to sort of win out against the Quang sooner rather than later. Lorba loves playing Zavrog. It's one of his most played heroes and he is really good on it, right? We've seen a few solo bolos against the Quang. We see the side of Flow State looking at him again, though. Yeah, definitely are echoing your words. Never, ever count Dirty Lake and the boys out. And now they, uh, again, still feel like they're in, in this game with that combat potential. Lorba in a one versus two, throws out the Colossal Blow. Gets Simba out of his face at least, but Peek is still on the hunt. Once more, Bright Horn spaces forwards, but the Blast Cone just gets enough Ooh. distance. Peek actually chases it through, but he's not able to find the burst. Lorba does get away with his life, but that's a big commitment from Low State, from Flow State on that right-hand side.
Yeah, that was ugly. Blinking up by the Quang against the Sephiroth that still had like a quarter HP remaining. Yeah, I, I don't think we do that. Like, that was a bit of an overstep. My peak has to pay with it with his blink. Nothing else, at least. So that's a good thing. But it gave a bit of time to Happy Picker that was able to shove out that wave with Bry having to rotate over. It's always a, a sort of give and take. If you use your time to impact the offlane, uh, the other lanes are gonna suffer at least a tiny bit. Now in that mid lane though, Epi Picker has to be careful. Quang is close by. Yeah, just I feel like the the key here for Dead Sick and the boys is making sure they monitor where Peak is now. Lorba, of course, with that disconnect, is probably gonna enjoy the solo XP and the solo farm on that right hand side. And as long as Peak is kept in check, I mean, they know exactly where that Quang is. Those executive like boys can kind of weather the storm as well. I mean, we've mentioned about kind of looking towards late game, looking towards scaling as well. We know about the Sevrog, we know about the Kira, but what about the rest of the composition, Tang? How does the late game look for both of these teams as we pass that 20 minute mark? Yeah, I think one thing before we get off the Sevrog, because we have talked about it quite a bit, he actually does have an XP lead, right? Even with the disconnect. So I definitely think that Loba mm -hmm. is all online already. I don't think they need to be too worried about the Quang. It's for the rest of the members. It's always like Ceres makes the uh, the ADC's role really hard to play with Kira, not really having anything to disengage from a Ceres that just cages her. It's gonna be always be the blink that saves her. Maybe the Belika being close by is gonna help as well, but usually North loves to play those corners, loves to play out of vision and then just pull the trigger. And then with the Howitzer providing the damage with the Make It Rain, with that R2000 rocket, that could be a game changer, right? Kira has a lot of uh, flow states gold, and if they manage to shut Jay down, that's a lot of damage gone for that team. Jay with a bit of a target on, on their head as well, but that just such is the territory. And you are the ADC as well, and as you highlight as well, that dive potential, that burst is still there for Dirty Lake and the boys. Looks like Fangtooth number three is going to be the next matchup, our next location for a potential fight. You can see the flow states are already here. Dirty Lake and the boys grouping up in towards the mid lane as well. He's slicing that push. Neither mid lane tower has fallen as well. So this, the flying two, can be a bit more tricky for both of these teams to navigate. Lorba actually looking for a play. He's going to whiff that colossal blow on the right hand side. That's going to be a big cooldown to burn as well. Subjugate landing on towards peak. But still, has a lot of his HP bar remaining. D lab reinforcements do arrive. Not looking for the pick. But North goes and presses the engage. But some peak looking to be the target. The energy, energy lance not going to lock him down. It takes some time. But they do eventually grab peak. Now they want more as well. He's going to go in towards the black hole as well. But all members are out. And to make it rain. Tech straight to the face. Simba going for the re engage. They want the wombo combo. But Dez taking the boys. Playing this so patient. Drawing this one out. Lorba does drop though over on, in the mid lane as well. Simba goes for the re Treats, having to be careful, can't afford to lose your jungler just yet. It's a drawn out fight, it's only a one for one. It's only a one for one, but with HP leads over to the side of D-Lab, really well played. A bit of an over commitment onto the Quang means that they are actually gonna go up ahead in this fight, managing to secure that Fangtooth peak a bit out of position, even with the kill being traded out by Lorba. Uh, falling at the back end of the fight, it still means that the second Fangtooth for D-Lab is going to be secured, giving them a bit of bonus movement speed. And here we see again, TJ, like the team fighting of D-Lab saves them in the mid to late game. Of course, and uh, we just had a little look at the score, uh, the slash lines as well for Lakenator on this Drongo. Uh, sitting on a 1 and 3 mark, had such a rough time in that duo lane alongside Toasty, but this is where Dirty Lake and the boys, this is where their comeback factor comes in. Their team fighting in the clutch moments, you can always count on a member of the D-Lab squad to come in clutch and get that high reel mo uh, montage moment as, as well. As uh, The only neutral objective is going to be that All Prime on the right-hand side. Yeah, it's a bit of movement from the D-Lab squad over towards it as well, but I don't think they're confident enough to try and pull your prime just yet, at least. So it might have a little bit of a lull state teams trying to find an advantage, maybe trying to find a pick here. But that tier one tower on the right-hand side might be the first target for Dead Lake and the boys. 
Yeah, it might be. Sarah's being close by. I think another thing to highlight is that both mid laners actually push out the left hand side. They know that the dual lane is a bit too um, exposed if they go towards the left hand side, because if the enemy team starts up that prime, it could end up being bad for them. So we have Lakenator and Toasty in the mid lane. Now Epi Picker will actually join them. They should be able to put, push down the tier one in the mid lane. Good link up plays, making sure that they get the standing gold on the map. Just a bit of tidying up as well. These towers were pushed low by a bit of splinter damage. Well, we're going to find a subjugate. going to find a colossal blow on towards Peak, having to burn the blink. Bang's going to go down. North goes with engage with the Colosseum, but Simba's there. Big double shield slam comes down. But the fight, the burst is all dirty lake, and the boy is a slobber. Gets his soul stack on towards Peak, but Simba ball rushes forward. He wants more. Reinforcements have arrived, though. Dirty lake, and the boys are here. And Flow State look to pull back. They just don't take any damage. Lorba and North getting caught by the Shield Slam. They just shrug it off. It doesn't deal any damage to them. Lorba coming out almost with more HP after that fight as before. And yeah, definitely the strong team fighting, the strong sort of hero picks scaling is what, what I want to highlight on Lorba, on that Ceres as well, just paying off dividends, just sort of getting the better of Quang for the last few minutes already. And now bit of a dance around that prime pit. We see deep wards by both teams, but it's still flow states having a bit deeper ones, but Howitzer is on the other side of the map. That is a wave that Peak has to catch. It's going to be responded as well, let's say, with uh, Peak immediately going over towards the left-hand side. We've spoken a lot about the D-Lab composition and kind of their win conditions into the later stages of this game, but the flow state comp, the desk highlighted as well, that everyone kind of pushes the funny button, and they really need to hope that D-Lab die at the end of it as well. And uh, the flow state, though, they haven't seemed to have found that combination yet, Tank. Yeah, and it, even if they did, it was only on those tanky members. Like, I, I don't want to see a shield slam going onto Savarog or a Saras. They can just shrug it off, as we just saw just there before. But we want to see it on that phase Drongo duo, maybe on that Howitzer as well. Those are the targets you really want to affect. That is why you pick the steel. It's just like those easy ganks. Now Simba is going to look for Lorba again. Gonna go and try and find that CC. Blast Flower gets a little bit of distance, but Lorba taking so much damage because Jay just hits like a truck and Lorba finally bites the dust. But now North wants Jay. The Shield Slam comes down to lock it up, but North wants this Kira and he's gonna find it in the Coliseum. Black Hole comes out. North stuck in his own Coliseum, trying to get away, trying to juke the AoE, but the Meteors just have a bigger hitbox. And now reinforces Gussie is here to avenge his fallen member on the right hand side. Looks like it's going to be Flow State to clean up house over in the solo lane three members drop for d lab for two of flow states yeah and here we, we see the strength of flow states uh team comp right like even though the steel couldn't save the kira till the very end he could lock down the Severog for long enough for jay to dish out that damage jay we saw in that early game got so accelerated and we can see the damage he puts out now definitely can just shred the Severog that had to spec into a lot of magical defense as well to win the side lane against the quang but definitely suffers against the kira now and of course, as well, with Flow Stator, more than willing to rotate their duo lane out into the solo lane, into the mid lane, wherever Jay and Gussie need to be. That feels like the key for this Flow State composition as well. And there's plenty more opportunities to find as well, because now we're going to get the first primal fangtooth of the game spawning in just a matter of seconds on that left-hand side. Flow State are the team in a much better position right now. But uh, Lorber moving over towards the right-hand side, oh. but Toasty's got to be careful. He's able to be tagged by the Tether. Pete just running him down, able to buy some distance. The Blast Flower actually becomes a little mini landmine as well. I've been able to buy some time. Happy Pika forced out the Make It Rain. Pete going very low. Lakinator is here. What can they do? Simba in towards the back line. Lorber finds two with a colossal blow, and D-Lab just needs to find the damage. They've already grabbed Peak, and now Simba has to be careful. Or shield slam to re-engage when Lake Nature blinks and Simba blinks back to keep himself alive. Bright hits by a landmine and having to find the tour space through. Lorba follows, wanting more. Happy Picker wants more. Lake wants more as well. But close. I'm gonna give him north with the Coliseum play 
bounce towards, towards the back line, but the black hole comes down. Epoch strikes post from Happy Picker. Another landmine splits apart this team like pins on a bowling alley, but it's all going the way of Flow State right now. They've got oh. Abby Picker. They're going to get Lakinator. They're going to look to clean up the house. Toasty is an elusive one, but Jay procs to Dusk, and Toasty is going down once again. Free fall for the side of Dirt Lake in the boys. They completely lose the team fight at the beginning of it. Flow State fighting without the Kira, but the second they overchased, the second D Lab overchases, it is Kira dealing out the damage. Jay making sure that his team is not gonna fall. Now they will get a good reset. They're up in chaos and they instantly go for those objectives. There were still a few death timers on the side of D Lab. It's gonna be really hard for them to get there in time. Saras though is up, so is Severok. They might look for a steal. All eyes going to be on North as well. Simba is here, but Simba's not zoning. He has to be here for the secure North. Lorba arriving towards the pit, but that all prime is still taking damage. Flow State looking to disengage. Seismic Assault on connecting on towards North, and they are going to at least secure the all prime for themselves as well. A good subjugate. Buys time for Lorba to try and get away, but it's the full retreat coming out. The Tevas landing, but not going to find their mark. Flow State with the Fireman Collapse picking up the all prime. A lot of damage taken there by the Saras, but now it's going to be engaged onto the mid lane, Simba! Oh, it's Flow State just uh, going to get caught out by a subjugate, by a landmine as well. And just as it was going their way, Dirt Lake and the boys never count them out. Pull that old prime buff off for three members and Peak and to, uh, uh, Peak and Gideon have to get away. But D-Lab, what an answer back. What an answer back. The Prime has been taken, but Lorba just doesn't care. He just goes in, gets a good uh, colossal blow onto the entire backline, and it is just the immediate swing starting up that Primal Fang now as well. Peak in the vicinity trying to do something. Yeah, but he's not got Simba with him. So with that uh, steal as well, North is not here. So it was actually a potential of peak if he was able to get closer towards the pit. But the primal fang tooth, the primordial blaze, gonna be picked up by Dirty Lake and the boys. On to four members as well, going to reset. But this tang is what we said, what we were expecting. Flow state coming out of the gate stronger, but D Lab finding their fight to pull them back into this game. Was that picking mid lane? Was that collapse the fight they were looking for? It definitely was. Getting the Primal Fang and at the same time getting their third Fang Tooth off the game. Granting them not only the temporary buff that is going to make those team fights even easier for the next uh, short while, but also giving them just permanently more armor, more damage. Both in AP and in AD is definitely going to prove to be really good for D Lab, especially with some unkillable demons in their roster, right? With Lava on the Severok just barely taking any damage. Now looking towards the invade again. Flusted knows that they are weak at the moment. Have to give up a few camps that won't sting too much. With them having the big prime, it's at least not going to be anything more. It's really hard to sort of uh, push into those tier twos, into those inhibs if you play against a uh, buffed up uh, minion wave, even if it's only on two members. Sure here, and they can see the response as we're expecting. Flow State just respecting it. They can't afford members to be caught out. This Primordial Blaze makes an already difficult team fight that much harder for Flow State to play as well. Peak split pushing on the left hand side. Lorba going to respond diagonally on the right as well. Peak able to at least get the mini wave underneath oh. the tier two tower. Toasty goes fishing as the uh, the light stream comes down, able to block that from coming through. It looks like the tier two tower on the left hand side is going to fall to the minions, but. Peak wasn't there to cash in on the gold. He has to be here to try and protect the mid lane with the team. A few resets. It looks like uh, D-Lab will just put, uh, push down another pin with this tier 2 tower. You've also got Lorba on the right-hand side. The siege goes on. They should be able to get those towers unless Flow State actually wants to fight. North goes in. Oh, no. North goes in with the Colosseum, but he's so far forward. It's going to be a, a bit of a delay for the rest of the team to get here. But Simba is just deleted as a Vanishing Act is pulled. And now they need to retreat because Flow State wants some revenge. But Lorba is here. Peak goes in, but Peak is also going back towards his base. Flow State losing three members and the Siege still does not relent. All five members of D-Lab still stand. 
So now it's Primal Fang being un uh, not on the heroes anymore, but Lorber just goes in onto the Gideon that does manage to buy some space, but Inhib is the real target. Are gonna get the mid Inhib. Right one is gonna be rough, so is the left one with the tier 2 still standing, but still really well played by the side of D-Lab. Flow State's getting a bit too confident, uh, walking up a bit too much, and North finds the target we're looking at him right here just always pressing the triggers knowing uh, his limits just so well especially on the Tsaros with that Colosseum locking a bunch of mm. flow states and members in right there at the inhib just before that primal fang was about to expire and just winning the team fight that way North's Colosseums in these last couple of team fights have been game changing as well. And as you highlighted, Tang, it makes the fight so much more difficult for Flow State to play here. It just feels like Jay hasn't been allowed to at least get that damage down. And you highlighted as well those raid bosses, the unkillable demon kings are here uh, with Lorba and also with North leading this charge. It's so difficult for Flow State to try and find a way in. They still have tools available to them. We've seen throughout the past 34 minutes of this game what flow state can do but it feels like they're just hitting a wall at the moment with the steel lab team yeah definitely and usually it is the other team that is supposed to hit the wall if you play against the steel i'm sorry for that but yeah flow states definitely not coming out ahead in those fights but now Primal Fang has expired. Remember, the permanent buffs are still there, but at least the true damage is not. Big Prime is going to spawn next. We see a lot of vision being invested over towards that side, especially by the side of Flow State, making sure that D-Lab cannot pull something funny. Sweepers coming out from north as well. Let's say just get the vision back in towards their favor as well. See the response coming in, and of course with that inhibitor dropping in the mid lane, constantly needing to have someone there to push the minion waves back out. Also, gives an a avenue for Dirty Lake and the boys to pull up, especially if they win this next fight as well. But with 35 minutes into the game, you saw the death timers from that last collapse. There, we are at one minute plus on all members. Whoever gets caught out here could very much decide the game. Probably why team, by both of these teams are trying to play it safe. This dance goes on, but no one wants to overstep just yet. Nobody wants to overstep. Quang actually clears the wave without showing. That's actually pretty big, but because now D-Lab is not confident enough to start up those fights, Quang also didn't show on those wards. Did manage to get a ward onto the Primal Fang to make sure that D-Lab can't sneak that while the rest of the members of Flows that are busy with that Prime. Now Savrock still there. North gets the D-Ward onto the Fang Pits. They might be looking for something. Yeah, and Flowstate able to just pull more members in and North having to be so careful. He's caught out here, but now the rest of the team are able to respond. But if they can get North, they can get the jungler down. This will be a good secure as a CC and the chain is so good. And that is North dropping before the fight begins. And Flowstate want the exit frags. They want even more. Pete can't find the tether. A good subjugate from Lorba. Able to buy space. Able to buy time as Bright uses that with a torn space. The black hole on towards Abby Pink. Oh. That's the mid lane down. Flowstate blinking forward. So I'm not going to find the mark. But now Lake holds down the left click button trying to get a damage down they've lost two members north appy down and flow states gonna pull towards the left hand side the, maybe it's a calculated bait lorba popping that razor back as well to face check here peak is a little bit too low to do that damage as well but flow state with the advantage with their health gonna start up the primal fang two for themselves I'm a Fang Tooth is being started up. Peak has to recoil Savrock still in the vicinity no smite for the side of D-Lab they still want to try something now, maybe this will take a bit of a miracle steal as well. Simba, your timing has to be correct here, at least, as the Primal Fangtooth will go their way. And with a stacking objective like Primal Fangtooth, it's very important to mention at 35 minutes, the Primordial Blaze, that damage over time is the strongest that it will be at this time. 37 minutes, we're approaching 38, and it looks like Flow State want to complete the, the double neutral objectives and go for a double bubble buff. Yeah, and with that Primal Fang having been secured just before, it's going to be such a fast take for them. There's no way that Cyrus is going to make it in time, especially with the mid laner still being on that gray screen, just uh, respawning now. That's going to be the Howie back. So all members for the side of D-Lab are alive to fight for a different day, but it is going to be really hard. You highlighted it. Primal Fang has stacked up to the maximum. Prime is always going to be strong. It's going to be cannon waves all the way at this point in the game. And they're all going to be 
uh, buffed up with that prime buff, giving them more durability. And it's going to be so hard for the side of D-Lab to fight into this. For sure here as well. And uh, looking at Flow State as well, looking at Kira uh, in particular, uh, played by Jay as well, sitting at full build, actually going for the Mesmer as his last item to give himself a spell shield to maybe survive and just a little bit longer in these team fights. Lakinator does not need anything more trivial than a spell shield. He's gone for that Imperator last item because he's got Toasty's Tether to pull him to safety as well. And Dirtlake and the boys, the talisman player, Lakinator, needs to be the member that they rally behind. Is Flow State going to start the siege? And of course, much like before, Dirtlake and the boys have to respect it as they had the respect shown to them in their last siege. The energy is going to go for the pickers north. Once Jay is going to try and get away, Shield Slam comes down, make it rain from Happy Picker as well. They're going to try and burst down Jay, but they're going to get Simba at least one member down. Make that two. Gwasi is out of the fight. Peak wants to re engage a Bryce Black Hole as well, but Toasty is there with the bodyguard to save Lake and Aether and even able to get him over the wall. But Lake and Aether still takes so much damage as Tether lands on towards Toasty. The tick, the tick, the boom, the damage over time from the primordial blaze takes the life of toasty as his inhibitors start to fall inhibitors start to fall but really well played by dlab recognizing that it's a uh, three members in mid while the sidelines are being pushed so they actually fight they actually win it as well two for one they lose all three inhibs for it so it's definitely not the best result for them but considering playing against double bubble but 14 minutes in the game kind of saves them the game makes them able to live another day i feel like i've said that before though but definitely gonna be them surviving with flow state having to run away a bit of a sort of greedy um positioning by them i was about to highlight it there as well tj it is like they are playing three lanes but at the same time they're not waiting for the side lanes to actually push up so North does what North does. He just blinks in, gets a Colosseum, forces Chase blink away, which is going to make his next team fights harder. But it's also gonna, it was also the steel uh, dying at the back end of it. It was the Bellica falling as well. Even with those inhibs falling, at least gives D-Lab a chance back into this game. So all members are going to respawn on the map. One more second for Toasty to rejoin the team. And that's going to be all five members of D-Lab and Flow State as well. The base, though, is in tatters, as we mentioned as well, for Flow State. That is still going in their favor. The buffs, probably not going to last much longer if they have not already expired as well. They still need to group up. And now we are at this point with 41 minutes into the game. Full items being completed. Full levels starting to be hit. I can see that Peak and Bry on the side of Flow State are level 18. But also Lorber, right. North and Abby Pick are level 18. Peak though is in a world of pain as all five members are here to collapse. And he's just going to be knocked about to bounce back to his spawn. Lakinator gets the killing blow. But Flow State can't afford to lose members like that. And I think that is a really bad death because that will overlap with those objective timers as well. Just a big misstep by Quang. Didn't see anyone on the map. He sees his team in the blue side jungle. He thinks he has enough space to actually push out that wave, but doesn't. Drops to a five-man rotation, and now it's going to be rough. Fang Tooth is going to be the first objective spawning. That is also where we see most of those wards being invested. But three inhibs down means that they need to respond to those waves. Minions are not a choke. They can threaten the core as well. So Severog on that right-hand side is going to push that out. It's going to be a four versus five for quite a bit longer. 35 seconds the death timer for Quang. But D-Lab has to play this smart, has to play that fast as well. And we see them making the rotation into the river. They just need to get that vision down, need to play this safe. As I saw about death timers at this point in the game, that was 70 seconds before Pete can even get on here. He's not even going to be around for this next fight as well. He's still sitting on that grey steam screen in the spectate mode. But this is a fight. Five versus four. Simba is still here. So is Bry. Lorba subjugate going to land on towards Simba. It just simply colossal blows him out of the fight. And that means the Primal Fang is going to be very easily secured for the side of D-Lab. Flow State, though, don't stick around. They retreat immediately. But D-Lab wants a double bubble buff for themselves, maybe, because that all Prime is going to be the next target when it spawns. 
Yeah, it definitely can be. Now at least five members for flow states, but fighting into that primordial blaze is usually not a good way to play the game. True damage really ramping up the later the game goes. And at this point, everybody has complete items. And since that buff uh, is percentage based, it's going to be such a bad time if you are ever fighting against it. It's the Drong, which is dealing infinite damage with it. It's even mm. the face applying it with the beam. Just it can't really tank through that, even if you are the steel, even if you are the Quang. But they need to be careful. And careful they definitely are, because TJ, look at all of those wards. Lit up like a Christmas tree on that right hand side, four walls down, Loba gonna add onto himself as well, but he's just gonna break that line of the uh, nice uh, dusk wards being placed over that all prime entrance as well. But of course, as we said before, three inhibitors are still down and not going to be fake inhibitors just yet. So super minions are still going to be pouring in. And that's why D-Lab having to respond. They can't afford for one of these minion waves to sneak through. But maybe if they can burn down the objective with that primordial blaze as well, it's North Lake Toasty. Now Lorba joining him as well. Abby Pickers in the red jungle. He will join in just a moment, but all five members of Flow State are here. Teva lands on towards Lorba, but just decides not to pull. Decides not to pull the trigger just yet. Abby Picker is here. That all prime went down so quickly looking for the re-engage this could be the game deciding fiber with the buff in favor it looks like it's going to go the way of dealer but no they've actually lost abby picker jay is still in this fight now lorba stuck in between four members flow state just simply turn and they're going to simply burn their way through the lorba severok they've got the buffs off three two members they're looking for a fur but north the coliseum is huge onto jay who leaves for the purge but the spear of near executes is able to take it down Simba wants to kill onto north towards north but he's not gonna find it because there's no one left dirty lake and the boys ace flow states in 45 minutes on the right hand side and look at the death timers, TJ. 60 seconds for the Gideon. That is going to be the first one to respawn. They're just going to run down the mid lane. They should have enough time. Have the Prime buff as well together with Primal. And just again, superb team fighting. A bit too much hesitation by Flow State. And it's Dila pushing for the core. Back and forward, back and forward. Such a swingy game between these two teams. And it comes down to that final fight at the All Prime Pits. But what a game one of this best of three series. 45 and a half minutes. I mean, Twitch chat, we promised you a banger series. And this one's not, uh, not, uh, it's going to meet the party? expectations as well. My mind is absolutely fried at the moment. I'm definitely going to uh, enjoy my sit down at least. But uh, holy, what a game one. Yeah, I think after this one, I think we are allowed to be a bit out of words because that was definitely a banger. 45 minutes. It's Flow State completely in the driver's seat. They're about to win the game, get the primal fan, get everything in their favor. And then... It's Loba just swinging the entire fight. Then it's Chase swinging the entire fight. And then suddenly we had 50 minutes in the game almost. And it is D Lab winning that game. Again, took him a very long time. Mental has to be strong in these games because it is a best of three series. But we are going to take a much needed sit down and get some fluids. We're going to throw it back to the desk to break down that game further. Thank you so much, TJ and Tang. I was definitely drinking my water during that game because who else was sweating? Welcome back to the desk. My name is Ardog with the Triple G. I'm back with Wangle and Grady. Wow, these two teams were just neck and neck. Just a reminder that exclamation point bracket will take you to a link that shows the tournament bracket and the current scoreboard. And currently we are, we just finished game one, which favored Dirty Lake and the boys. Just, there were so many fights here and there and 25 minutes in, we were still seven and seven for both sides. The team fights were just so intense, but it came down to that final fight at that prime pit. Wangle, what just happened? Uh, to be honest, that was one of the wildest games of Predecessor I've seen in a long time. Just super, super cagey, Zara's pun not intended. You know, both teams sitting off from each other, farming up. We hit level 18 like 10, 15 minutes before the game even ended. Uh, and then just out of nowhere, Bomba, team fight starting. Everyone like <laughs> going in, dying, flashes being blown everywhere. It was just... Uh, started off uh, with 
D-Lab over chasing into uh, the F8 um, red side, uh, getting too, getting caught out uh, too far up there. But then it was just uh, D-Lab taking inhib, then F8 taking triple inhib, and then D-Lab ended up being the winner out of, I don't even know, my mind's kind of blown. Yeah, all of our minds were definitely blown. Grady, what were the highlights for you from game number one? I mean, Wango said it best, Bumba. Uh, it was basically <laughs> just like, I don't know, as a, as a spectator, I enjoyed the game. There was a lot of action. Well, there, when there was action, there was action, right? But as an analyst and a player, the whole game, I'm just like, like, I, I, like I'm half watching, half not looking just because both teams know, right? It was throw into throw into throw like it was a one team commanding position able to try to close out the game able to apply pressure they make a mistake other team capitalizes so it's good play and bad play on both teams right so for me i enjoyed watching the game but i think both teams gotta tell themselves like hey it's game day it's tourney day when we're in the driver's seat we gotta slow it down slow it down stop making the mistakes pay attention to positioning of our team versus enemy team if we're gonna run the one three one like flow stay did when they had double buff and they were pushing to end if you are the three and you get aggressed on by five back it up let the side lanes push in but they did end up getting triple inhib off of that however because they lost multiple members they weren't able to close out the game giving d lab the opportunity to get another double buff so there's three double buffs in that game right d lab get double buff flow stay get double buff d lab get double buff finally end up getting a team wipe and closing out the game so both teams Very well said. when you're in a spot to win slow it down and make sure that you close out the game properly We'll just have to see if they're going to take your guys' advice because I do urge everybody in chat to do this one thing. Please go get a drink while we take a quick break because game number two is coming up next in this banger of a series in this best of three between Dirty Lake and the boys versus Flow State.
Welcome back everyone to the desk. I'm R Dog with the Triple G and I'm with some super cool and knowledgeable desk analysts, uh, Grady and Wangle. So we just finished watching game number one, but now we're gonna go into game number two. We saw that Lobber was able to pop off as Sevrog. So let's take a look at some Sevrog statistics. Wangle, walk me through what you're seeing here. Yeah, so Sevrog's somebody that we haven't really seen a lot of. He was kind of very low prio in the play-ins, only having 12 games picked. A lot of the staple Severog players not playing it as much. Lobber especially, I, he maybe had one Severog game in play-ins. Um, but it has kind of resurfaced. We saw Nitro playing it in the Professor's set. We've seen Lobber now playing it. Uh, it is just, you know, a, like stable scaling tank. Um, yeah, it's very interesting. So I guess we'll just have to see as we dive right into this draft. Are we going to be seeing a Lobber or Sevrog yet again? Grady, what are you expecting to see in this in this uh, draft? Well, I, uh, I was thrown for a loop in the last draft, so I'm probably going to get thrown for another loop here. But we see the Argus already being taken off of the table. Once again, D-Lab saying, no Argus for you guys, Flow State. We're not going to deal with that. Not really sure what Flow State wants to take off of the board. I don't know what they felt was the main threat of the last game. Of course, uh, you know, Lakinator didn't have a very strong showing in the laning phase on that Drongo, but he came up big in the very end to close out the game. So maybe they try to take that away from him as a ban. Uh, Richter on the table as well. Kwong was played for Flow State, but maybe they move away from the Kwong prior. Maybe they try to take it off the table. Don't even let uh, D-Lab get their hands on it and they won't play it either. But once again, they're going to stick with the same ban as last time. They said, North, we don't want to deal with your Kalari. We're taking it off the table for you. Yeah, obviously. And here we go with the Zara's first pick again, kind of running back uh, the same draft. Uh, you know, uh, we can. I think we'll see a lot more variation. Um, Obviously, people want to stay to their comfort picks. We saw, I mean, never mind. Maybe no variation at all. Maybe we just run it full bank. Maybe the draft wasn't the issue. Uh, Belica Kwong, I was, as we said, uh, Belica on Gwisi. Uh, was doing a lot of work early. Got a couple picks onto Lakinator with the Belica Kiro dual lane. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'd like to see some variations. I think the offlane uh, matchup could be improved i don't think the sever like obviously you pressure in the severog but it's very hard to kill the severog with the kwong maybe a slightly more aggressive offlaner um to not allow the severog there is the severog you see it right there um and the gideon on d lab you know something currently with a hundred percent pick rate uh in all of these games so far very strong mid laner very aggressive gives a lot of prior so we see a tiny bit of variation, but really it's just heroes changing hands. Gideon on the side of D-Lab instead of Flow State, putting it on Appy, very strong pick for him and denying it from Bry. Bry had an amazing showing on the Gideon last game. And then Drongo going to Jay, taking that away from D-Lab. Very solid pickup. They also look to ban the phase. Flow State was not a big fan of that. They were running, uh, they were running Toasty and Laken down in the lane and still landing kills with the phase but they said we want to make our lives a little bit easier maybe not put forth as much effort and we might still be able to land those kills so very smart band for flow state uh d lab we're not sure where the kwong is going but we can definitely take a mid laner off the board and right we see that right there iggy off of the table not letting bry play that wangle mentioned it previously bry is very very strong on the Iggy, it does well into D Labs comp, especially the Severog. So getting rid of that, and then finally, finally seeing that Richter locked in at the fourth pick for Flow State, really late in the draft. Not something that you normally see. This one probably going into the hands of uh, Simba. It is still kind of flexible because mid or uh, Belka could go mid or support. Richter could go jungle or support, and then Twin Blast Narbash being locked in to round out D-Lab's comp. 
Yeah, so we can flex the Bella commit here and give the Narbash a bad lane matchup with the Richter. But historically speaking, uh, in the group stage, uh, we saw Simba play this Richter jungle both games against D-Lab and against Rognan. Uh, they very much like it with their pick comms, and we're going to see it in the hands of Simba. Uh, but the Richter with the Kwong tether, with the Bella can knock up, and even with Gadget Gate combo... They love these pick comps. Uh, very easy to play. If you can hit your CC on someone's out of position, get a lot of value for it. That's a lot of combinations from both sides there. But Grady, I got to ask you, this is a little bit different of a duo lane. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that matchup between Twin Blast and Narbash versus maybe a Drongo? Um, and I'm looking to see that's going to be the Bellica there. Yep, definitely the Belka going in the hands of Gwissi. Gwissi had an amazing game last game on Belka, applying a lot of pressure, opening up a lot of kill opportunities for Jay and Gwissi in the duo lane. Uh, Twin Blast and Narbash are going to be a little bit safer in terms of sustainability, and also they have really good wave clear with the Twin Blast, so I imagine they're still going to be trying to play keep away, away from the very aggressive duo lane of Jay Gwissi on the Drongo Belka. They had a lot of kill pressure last game with the Kira. Drongo, that doesn't really change much. If anything, that's a little bit stronger of a lane, in my opinion. So we're probably going to see Jay and Gwissi try to run down uh, TB and Narbash, Lakeinator, Toasty lane. And lastly, Wangle, you are one of the strongest mid laners in the game right now. So talk to me about that matchup between Gadget versus Gideon. You knew exactly what I was looking at here. The Gadget, I think, is... Uh, the most interesting pick this game. Uh, in my opinion, uh, she's not an amazing mid laner. However, in the right scenarios, still very pickable. Every mid I think is pickable currently. And this is one of the best scenarios for her. You want her to counter the Zarius Gideon dive. Uh, that is what she's going to be doing in this matchup. Anytime that they want to get that ult combo, even the Narbash as well. Uh, she's going to be putting the dome on, making it very difficult to perform. Uh, but if uh, D-Lab can punish the early wave clear with the Gideon being able to hard out roam. Uh, the map could blow wide open. Yes, we'll just have to see because game number two is coming right at you. Please take it away, TJ and Tang. Thank you so much, R Dog. And when I promised you a banger series, I was not lying. Although I will admit, I probably wasn't expecting 45 and a half minutes for game number one. But here we are. That's just how the dice go sometimes. Welcome everyone to game number two between Dirt Lake and the boys versus Flow State as well. A few changes up in that draft tang as well, mentioning uh, just backstage about that uh, duo lane. I think that's where we wanted to start our focus, especially considering the amount of pressure that was coming in from flow state early on yeah definitely i think starting off with this right is like we look at d labs comp just in general and we are saying like okay we just had a 47 minute game let's just draft around 47 minutes games right like let's get the twimblers let's get the narbish let's get the Severog, let's get all the scaling heroes on our side and we're just gonna have a repeat this time again with the twin blast with that narbish not really strong in that isolated 2v2 but they scale pretty well tb dishing out so much damage in the late game and toasty on that narbish having that lockdown together with that healing with that sustain making sure that his Severok, his saras his gideon is are not gonna drop too low and that's definitely what they want to do because playing against gussie and jay on the duo lane in isolation has not worked out too well for those two no absolutely not i mean they lost that 2v2 in isolation they lost their tower in isolation as well lake and Tosi just feeling the pressure coming out from this flow state composition and i think jay and gussie even taking away this drongo feels like an even more terrifying lane with drongo having a little bit more of that upfront damage when compared with the kira but both equally as scary in towards the later stages of the game and uh, maybe that's where we're going to look at the flow state draft uh, to look into that one as well picking up the gadget tang i do know that you'd like the gadget and uh, wangle said as well not in a good position uh, position in the game right now in terms of competitive meta but in the right place at the right time it can be a very crucial pick 
It can be, yes. Uh, I do agree, kind of. I still think that other heroes could have performed slightly better. I, I do agree stylistically that Gadget wants to play into dive, into heroes like the Saros, into heroes like the Gideon that want to get on top of you, and then you can drop the Tesla Dome in order to disengage or in order to, to get some damage back. And that is the strength of the Gadget. Mm. Mid lane, though, Gussie is going to look towards Epi Picker North, is on top of the gadget that might be already the target, has to blink away, Ooh. should be able to escape. And over, also in the left-hand side, you can see Lakenator and Toasty actually seeing this half of their duo lane as well for the first time this series as well. Able to at least answer back by hitting, looks like an earlier level two as well. But D-Lab being the first on the board to make the moves. But yeah, Jay, uh, sorry, Gwosi as well, that early roam in towards the mid lane, not going to find the mark, but Bryze Blink being burned as well. Definitely sensing a target okay. for D-Lab. Off lane, Gideon makes the rotation over. Quang needs to be a bit careful. Is gonna use the search to get away. Epi Picker still chasing. Lorber connecting with the subjugate. Might have to force the Ooh, blink, what? but Lakenator gets Che on the other side of the map. Gideon goes in deep, might get peaked. Doesn't quite. Simba is there. Trading into two members. Has to back off. He's gonna hit the red flash though. I'm gonna try and get the damage down. Body blocking, gonna force a blink out of Appy Picker. But more importantly to D Lab, they get first blood on the left hand side. But Bry's got something to say. Not gonna let this one go for free as Simba blinks in and Bry with a tick tick boom sticky mine. Gonna at least answer back one apiece. But first blood went to Lakenator in that duo lane. Lake and Aisa not accepting any slend on that side, just making sure to get the 2v2 kill. Really good trades when we were actually hovering over it, somehow getting the better of the Velika as the Narvish. And with the Velika making the rotation towards the mid lane, it allows the duo side with Lake and Aisa and Toasty to get more damage onto Jay that finally oversteps, trying to uh, sort of get a wave crash in. Forces the death out of him with the first blood going over to the man right here, Lakenator. And I'm wondering as well, what does that change in the dynamic of this duo lane as well? We are, we mentioned behind the scenes uh, that Lakenator and Toasty just playing another very safe lane, looking towards that 45 minutes. Uh, just by the way, guys, please do not go for a 45 and a half minute game. I don't think my vocal cords can last that long, but uh, it's going to be a banger nonetheless here. But Lake and Toasty already getting that lead in a duo lane might change things and might change their fortunes in this left hand side. It might, but at the very least, it allows them to play it safe. Peak, though, has to play safe as well. Lorber is going to pop the plant, make sure Peak can't use it. Sarah is still close by, is going to use the barricade, but does not connect with it. And Peak just walks it off. Very much like game number one as well, Peak was taking a lot of pres presence from North on that Zaris pick as well. But now North is showing right-hand side. Look at this grouping up. All four members of the remaining Flow State team are going to go for a very early Fang Tooth start as well. It's only been on the map for 10 minutes when they started it, and no possible contest coming out from Dirty Lake and the boys as well. First neutral, looks like it is going to go the way of your team on Dusk side. It's definitely not something we would have expected when we saw the early kills coming in. Even if it's a one for one, it's still D-Lab collecting first blood. It's D-Lab getting the better of uh, flow state in terms of getting those CS, right? So it's actually Simba using the, his strong dual lane to get that Fang Tooth early. He's still hovering around. Mm. Toasty needs to be careful. Sure, here just hovering around the mid lane as well. But Simba gonna move in with looking for the rip flash, not gonna Ooh. find it. Funk just takes the chain out of his hands. And in the mid lane, though, no. Happy Picker looking for damage, not gonna find the Mark North Spear of Near needs to connect, oh, but he oh, gets this oh, oh. the wrong way. And Bryce sidesteps and gets away. Yeah, really well played. He actually only lives, the gadget only survives this because the shock absorber passive procs in between Gideon's abilities, giving him that extra uh, shield, that extra shield that scales off his magical, uh, his, his mana, excuse me. So he is actually going to make it out alive. Didn't have the blink off that off lane play from before, but him taking all of that pressure sort of gives Simba sort of an excuse to go back in his jungle, right? He wasted a lot of time over towards the dual lane but luckily mm. for him Saros couldn't do too much because the gadget played it well enough to not drop to that gank 
And also as well, playing without that blink cooldown available to them as well. North just putting a target on Bry's head as well, punishing that lack of mobility. Maybe another very easy Colosseum target as well when we look towards the later stages of this game, which we're kind of expecting this one to go once again. But one to one in the kill department, at least one neutral, just going over towards Flow State. Bit of heavy trading as well by Lorba and Peak as to be expected. I think Lorba getting the Severog as well for a second game in a row. We can see that uh, he's actually able to at least win out on some of these trades on the right hand side. North in the mid lane. So gonna North actually going to go into the Coliseum. Yeah, Black Hole going to come down with a Testo over the top as well. North takes a lot of damage, but with Happy Picker there as well. Easy as you like. Bry's going to drop inside the mid lane. That's gonna be a drop by the gadget. Uses the micro, uses everything, as we both mentioned, but did not, well, was unable to escape his faith. It's really good targeting by North, right? You, you highlighted it before. He knows that the blink is down, and he's just gonna go to that lane over and over and over again. And Bry definitely feels that. Does go for the Mega Cosm first, but hasn't have it, does not have it completed quite yet. Doesn't have the damage to disengage the dive, and is just gonna get picked up. So definitely a good play over to the side of Lila, but Simba responds. Yes, and we're going to get that kill on towards North. It looked like in that red jungle as well. I'm not going to see exactly how it happens. But I'm going to see the outcome as well. And uh, for North to drop as well in isolation as well. Not, again, not really sure exactly how it, it happened. At least we can infer. But uh, we just know that Simba getting that pick back. And North might lose a little bit of tempo from this. Yeah, North loses a bit of tempo, and I think the biggest problem for North right now is that it's really hard for him to start up those objectives because his his side lanes are kind of losing in isolation, not because of player difference, but mainly because of comp difference. Savrog takes a bit longer to scale into the powerhouse he is than the Quang, and on the other side of the map, even with that early kill onto Lakenator, that Lakenator collected, it's still sort of rough to play into those other heroes, so it's hard for North to make those lanes come to start up those objectives, but he's certainly gonna try off lane, might be the target. Loba looking for a subjugate. North is here for yet another gank to the right hand side, but Simba following. The Fury of the Heavens comes down. Simba is here. Coliseum follows on to Peak. They're trying to get the member, but the Riplash comes down. And Loba throws Peak away from the member for retreat. Coming out from Dirty Lake and the boys. But Bry is here with the Tezzer Dome. Just needs to connect a few more attacks. North looks like going to be the first target. He is going to drop. Loba tries to do Ooh. what he can, but it's not going to be enough. Two members going to drop. And now it's going to be the mid laner. Happy Picker is here. Peak is low, but Simba bodyguard duty forcing Appy Picker away to keep Peak's life on the map. Peak is greedy. He's still there. Does not hit with the tether, but Appy Picker is gonna get hit by this. He's gonna get low has Simba. to blink away, but the head connect secures that kill. Ooh, five kills to two here. Flow State turning up the pressure, but this time in the right-hand lane, it feels that even though North has been putting a lot of their eggs in the solo lane basket, ganking peak over and over and over again, Bry just has so much more value from that rotation. Yeah, it's crazy. That gadget actually feels like he's all over the map, even while getting ganked in the mid lane quite a bit as well. Should be pretty accelerated now, has the item complete and should be doing pretty well into the Gideon in isolation. Usually the biggest problem with a gadget in the mid lane is that his her wave clear is not good enough to actually outshuff most of the other mid laners. So if, if Gideon only needs the Q RMB combo to clear the wave, gadget takes a bit longer to do so. That's why we usually see the Gadget stuck in lane, not really proactive, but Bry not afraid to drop a few minions. We can see that on the tower HP in order to get something for himself across the map. And it's a mirror as well from game number one as well. Saw so Bry being so um, so present in these side lanes as well. He was playing the Gideon for himself, but as we sense as well, he's going to be on the gadget this time. And Aki Picker just not able to match the rotation speed just yet. Second Fangtooth now on the board as well. Simba is here. He's hitting his rip lashes as well. And he's going to look Ooh. and find another one onto Aki Picker. Combines with a size because Salt, the burst is there. And Jay finally gets the killing blow. Aki Picker is down, and the Fangtooth will be their target. Sarah's on the other side of the jungle is not going to be able to go to the Fang Tooth. That should be secured for free instead. He might be looking for Peak again, or he might be looking for Mini Prime. No, Quang is the target again, as we see Fang Tooth being picked up. 
say, but maybe North wants a response on the right hand side. Peak trying to take the Cyan buff. Tether is going to land North. Coliseum used. That's two level difference as well. Peak wanting to box, wanting to return the damage, but Lord, but with the blink, the Colossal Blow in towards the law, uh, the wall. Peak goes for the surge. A good sidestep as he oh. gets underneath tower. Hits it. Going to hit the tower, but Norba is able to just take away that final killing blow. But now the reinforcements are here. Simba and Bry. Lorba so low. North hasn't got much left in the tank either. Eyes on Simba. If he can hit the Rift Flash, maybe a bit of a juke, and he's going to find the Rip Flash connection. He's going to use the ult, though. He's not, because Bry is actually chasing out Lorba. The tick, tick, boom. Not going to find the kill, but Bry still wants more underneath the tower. No. He got no damage, and Lorba actually gets an execute and gets himself back to base. That's just the worst case scenario for the side of Flow State. They don't get a kill. Now the wave is crashing into the tier one tower on the right hand side and might actually just fall to minions, denying the Quang the, the gold as well. But Richter starting up that mini prime. The tier one didn't fall on that side of the map. Is one hit. So it's 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 not actually it's actually not the worst because it was a lot of minions denied for several, even mm. though no kill credit is given. Mini prime being secured by Peak, making sure to get that tier one. Now they're looking towards the mid lane, actually. There's going to be the Gideon having to be careful. Getting that uh, grouping up, we are seeing a very similar play here coming out from Flow State, sending the mid laner over towards the left-hand side as well, as it looks like Lake Nator was able to at least cash in on the gold on the left-hand side, taking the tier one tower, able to maybe free up the rotation as well, but Flow State coming out swinging, and, you know, as for Flow State fans, got to be very happy about this, but there is that one bugbear on your shoulder. How many times have we seen Flow State pull ahead but still have their core being destroyed at the end of the game. Lorba playing pretty smart, trying to deny the tier 1 tower right there, but does not able. the minions are not able to get it. Um, TJ, one thing is that Quang actually doesn't have the mini prime. It does look like that Rickster did get it with the hunt, and they're going to mm -hmm. use it in the mid lane instead. North for close by is going to use the ultimate on Quas. Yeah, he's going to combine the Colosseum with the Black Hole, but members of Foe State able to get away. The skewer comes down onto two members of Rip Bash, not going to find the mark, and Lake Nate hits the one, two, one, two. So much damage. Simba having to blink away, but Lorber is here. He was trying to get a lockdown. We'll see. Maybe the target peaks here with the surge, but the judgments of Ventilate from Lake Nate just chasing shadows. Our oh, Dirty Lake and the boys can't find any lockdown inside of the mid lane, and incredibly, everyone gets away. Yeah, they get away with murder, securing the tier 1 as well somehow, but a bunch of flashes were blown. Guasi had to flash out of the Colosseum, and Richter had to flash out of the Crash Bang Boom from Toasty. So all in all, tier 1 falling, a lot of resources invested though. So it is a good play by Flow State, but now it is on D-Lab to capitalize on those, on those resources being down, on those blink timers being down, on those ultimates being down as well. And I'm expecting that to matter because Fangtooth, the third Fangtooth is going to spawn soon. And that would be the third Fangtooth for Flow State. So they, de they definitely want to get it, but it might be a bit hard into the, the comp of D-Lab that has proven again and again how strong they are at team fighting. Resilient in the face of adversity as well. Still with the kill deficits against them with these players. Never count Dirty Lake and the boys out, especially when it comes to those objective team fights. And I definitely want to echo the words that you said there, Tang. With that third fang tooth spawning, you're expecting D Lab to contest. So we're going to try and get the pick though on towards Lorba. This Severog has been causing so many problems for Flow State in game one and starting to in game number two as well, trying to maybe put Lorba down. It's just going to result in Simba showing himself on the right hand side. No blinks, no resources going to be burnt. Wolf is here as well to respond in kind at least so all members are just going to simply handshake and move away and go back to their lanes i'm surprised that tier one is still standing on the right hand side it's just a sliver of hp for the last few minutes um but yeah Zavrog was defending it quite well lorba on that Zavrog, like we saw it in the game before definitely a, a player to watch but now i think the, the more important thing to watch is actually going to be the fang tooth because we see five members of both teams make the rotation over wards being placed everyone has to be careful peak has a tendency to get caught in those team fights has to play smart has to play safe it's gonna be a contest Lorber is here as well. All five members on the left side of the map. 
to see a bit of the poke coming down from flow state as well not going to find the damage lake into here as well see with the way that the map is designed flow state have the easier way in towards the pits but d lab have an easy way to get into the pits utilizing that explosive flower a little bit splits two members in the mid lane and three moving around the back of the pit as well and flow state are going to respect this as well safety in numbers as well pete's going to try and aggro the fans you maybe try and get members in Lobo moving forward, a bit of a dance, grab your partners and go for a bit of a dozy do around this neutral objective. Neither team wants to step too far forward, but North goes for the blink, goes for the Coliseum, looking towards Jay. Lobo's here, Simba hits the rip flash, keeping him away from Jay, but Jay's too far away and he's going back to spawn. And Dirty Legger boys want to collapse because Abby Figures got a black hole all onto three members. The full duration flown back in towards the ultimate. There's so much damage in this team and watch Flow State drop. Watch them fall. Flow State more like low states losing four members and d -Lab find their objective fight. Low state like low state. I like that one and d -Lab likes it as well. Securing that thank you at the, at, the, at the back end of this fight as well. Four kills and we were talking about a kill deficit before. Definitely not anymore. d -Lab, seven kills to six. Just bouncing back as they just do every single time. Lorba staring at the tier one making sure that no local gold is going to be gained. I think Rai was just a tiny bit too far away. Smart play by the Severok. Finally denying that tier one gold for real but yeah just a team fighting che a bit out of position there and north on that saris instantly recognizing that instantly pressing the trigger and just securing that kill with no problems whatsoever when you have players with the experience that dirty lake and the boys have I mentioned it on the desk as well how many times these team these players have been in the pcc this is not their first rodeo at all not their first trip around the block they've been here forever second but there's something about this team as well that never say die attitude it certainly is endearing as well flow state drooping up on the right hand side mini prime is still on the map could be taken be before your prime but there's like the boys wanting to disrupt that wanting to make sure it doesn't fall into flow state's hands who have been playing so well but once again it's that one objective fight that doesn't go their way and north just seems to be the boogie man he's gonna throw down the quality team on towards peak that is meant to be a tank uh, swang and he is just gone and now Appy picker with the black hole it's only gonna be on to simba because jay and Gussie are out of the fight as simba throws down a good impale able to hit down three members but there's just no damage there's nothing left in the tank a leg and he's got to ventilate and he is gonna put the bullets into simba two members drop make that a third lake and cleans up house and the boys have full control of this map they full control. Mini Prime has despawned in the meanwhile, but the big prime is gonna spawn in five seconds. 30 death time, 30 second death timer on gadget, 20 on the Richter, five on Quang, but they might have enough time. It's only Drongo, it's only Bellica, it's only the dual lane of flow state to actually contest this. It might just be a bit too hard. Toasty has the healing, the rest of his team has the damage, and they're looking to bust this down. North just needs to hit the hunt, and uh, that is exactly what he's going to do. But Jay and Gussie moves so far towards the pit, as that's going to land the subjugate from Law, but the Grim Reaper is here, and his name is a Savarok. And that's the demise of two members. The duo lane is down once more, and once again, Dursley and the boys have a numbers advantage. They're going to reset and spend that hard-earned gold. They have so much gold in their pockets now. They have the big prime as well. Just when it spawns at 21 minutes, we are having a look at the scoreboards. We're seeing the, the team of D-Lab being loaded up with items, three items deep on the TB of Lakenator, make it three and a half for good measure. It's just so much damage, right? And four, zero, and five. What a bounce back from the very first game where Che just had the battle of him, but Lakenator and Toasty just showing why they're so consistent and in those PCC events, always getting to the final or at least into the semi-finals, sort of the forever second, but they're definitely looking to change that with a performance like this. Absolutely, there's something special about this team tank and when they're playing all on the same page, once again, maybe another deep run in this tournament, but Flow State are still here. We cannot count them out. There's a reason that they've had 
such a strong start to this game. But right now, with Dirtstick and the boys, their composition, which is already scaling late, has now become accelerated. But Flow State, they have the Rip Flash, they have a Seismic Assault, they have tools to maybe try and find something back, and they're going to be looking for it. Tang, how do they do it? How do they crack this code? They have to do what D-Lab did before to them. They're playing 3-1-3-1 one, one, as we saw before, but now they need to pu push the trigger, actually get a kill in the mid lane while they're overextended. We see them in the mid lane trying to do this as oh, we Simba. see Zavrok trying to dive. It's actually going to drop though because Simba just kept Lorba underneath that tower for so long. The tower does the work and Simba more than happy to provide that CC. Okay, one member without the Orb Prime buff, but it's still four members still sieging Abby Picker, taking tier two tower on the left hand side. Starting to get a mini wave underneath the inhibitor, but it's only him for now. Flow State, a little bit more spaced out across the map. It's got to defend from three ways. As you said, they were playing 1-3-1, one, one, maybe not a 1-2-1 one, one for now, as North marshalling in the right-hand side as well. North isn't very healthy here, and with Simra Bright on the way, it looks like this all prime buff is going to expire with just a clear house of all of the towers being taken. Yeah, we're saying just, but it's actually kind of insane. Getting all the tier twos at 23 minutes in the game already is going to prove to be so much gold in the pocket of D-Lab, pushing them further and further ahead. Now, for that fight around that primordial fang, 23 minutes in, they're going to have the big advantage. They still have prime for a bit longer, but it should time out any second now. They're doing a fanatic death brush. Oh, maybe even using the Shadow Person. That river buff might be the death. It's all on the pain train for Simba. as a black hole from Abby Picker in the back line. Jay is down north. Once again, takes down the ADC. The Tesla Dome is thrown out to try and disengage. But Flow State have had that flow interrupted. They're lost. Two members once again. Ultimates are on cooldown. And Dersek and the boys pull on to their primal fang tool. Yeah, and there should be no way to contest this. Richter is down, no smite for the side of Flow State. They do recognize it, sending the gadget to the other side of the map, trying to get at least some resources before that map shrinks even more, before D-Lab is able to invade into those two jungle halves, pushes down those inhibs, making sure to fight sooner rather than later while they still have the prime buff. The only good thing for Flow State is that those double buffs are delayed now. Big Prime not up yet after that earlier Prime play means that it's going to be a pretty hard uh, time for them to just straight out push down those inhibs. There is a gadget on the enemy team that, even though we saw how, I'm going to say it, how useless she seemed in those team fights, she still has decent wave, wave clear at least. So it's going to be not too easy for D-Lab to get more unless they just straight up dive and look for the kills. Well, I mean, if you're after straight up dive, North is more than happy to provide the Colosseums. What we saw at this point in game number one, which is so devastating for the Flow State team and kind of that recurring nightmare is back for them as well. Excuse me, as the siege starting to come through once again, as that Primordial Blaze is still on the members of D-Lab for a little bit longer, at least for the siege as well. So as you see, it looks like going for very similar styles before try and play across the map as well. They're going to send Lorba over towards this left-hand side. So it's two in the left, two in the mid lane as well. It's Lakinator able to push another minion wave in. That inhibitor still remains pretty powerful. And also, Lakinator has to be careful, though. He has got his Liberator, mind you, but a Seismic Assault, a good Riplash, could be uh, just ruin Lakinator's day as the siege starts to continue once again. It's continuing. Left wave should be cleared in a millisecond, and now it's going to be the big cannon wave. Can they do something with it? Well, we've seen Lorba leading a charge with a Subjugate into Colossal Blow. Maybe he's going to look for yet another as Flow State have their backs against the wall facing elimination from PCC7 in the quarterfinals. Need to find their moment. Simba looks for a rip flash, not going to find it. On towards Law, but they're just going to take that, that left-hand side inhibitor and back away. Spend that gold. Do not want to overstay their welcome. Very disciplined coming out from your team on Dawn's side. And very different compared to the last game. Last game was like, we are fighting until nobody's left. Like, I don't care about the buffs. <laughs> we are just going to fight. It's fun fighting always. 
brings a big smile to my face. That's why we're doing this. But this time, D-Lab probably is scared after that first game decides, no, we're going to play it smart. We're going to get that in it. Not going to overstep because if we do that, we are going to have first move towards that prime. And that's exactly what they're looking at. Simba's actually inside of the pits as well, and D-Lab have actually pulled away very split because this old prime has still been aggroed. Simba might be able to take it away as the skewer comes down, interrupting the hunt, but Simba just can't get the hunt off. D-Lab pull away, there's no damage. Abby Picker with a black hole, whilst the distraction is there. The old prime still being a sixth member for Dirt's Lake and the boys, and that just allows Lorba and Abby Picker to clean up house. North throws down the Coliseum. They've also grabbed the old prime. They've also grabbed four members as flow states are down once again outside your prime pits. And they have decent waves with the prime. It's only Quang there to defend, and it should be good night for him as well. Lorba and Epipick are getting some more damage onto Peak that has to just run back to spawn. Watch his inhib fall. Watch the super minion wave on the left hand side also push in, and this should be just an easy secure on that core. And that's the response you needed after that first game as well. We were thinking that this game would be like the last going the distance, but now 27 minutes, nearly 28. The core is the target, and that's going to be their prize as well. Dirty Lake and the boys are going to lock in their spot in tomorrow's semifinals. And definitely a deserved win for Dirty Lake and the boys with Flow State. Definitely making it hard for them but dirty lake and mm. the boys they do have the resilience to push through to show us that while they did not have the cleanest first game there's a reason why they ended up winning it anyways really well played in those team fights even if they get behind sometimes i i, I think it's fair to say it's because of flow state playing the early uh, game well rather than them playing it poorly yeah, absolutely. And uh, it's just that kind of consistent pattern that we've seen right from Flow State. It's just every time that first 10 minutes just always seems to go their way. You know, whether it's be uh, whether it be Simba, whether it be Jay, just these players stepping up, making the moves across the map, finding first bloods, finding isolated towers. But it's just been their bugbear that one objective fight falls and then it's all D-Lab all the time that's going to do it. it was an absolute banger of a series many congratulations to dirt Lake and the boys back in the semi-finals once again and commiserations to flow states to break down that game and move us on to the next series in this broadcast we're throwing it back to the analyst desk Thank you so much, TJ, DJ, and Tang. Wow, game number two, our fourth game of the day. Welcome back to the desk. I am our dog with the Triple G, and I'm back with Grady and Wangle to break down that game for you guys. Please type exclamation point bracket to keep track of the games today. GG's Flow State, thank you so much for playing. And of course, congratulations, Dirty Lake and the boys. You're advancing to the semifinals tomorrow. D-Lab just played so well together. Enjoy your points, D-Lab fans, because the combinations were just nonstop. You have the North Coliseum, Crash Bang Boom, Colossal Blow to the Face, and a Black Hole to finish it off. Grady, what went well for D-Lab? Well, to start things off, Toasty and Lakin did not fall in lane early, so they were able to safely play the Toasty Lakin way, putting Lakinator in the island, Toasty roaming around the map, creating havoc, supporting Appy, supporting North, um, forcing Gwussy out of the lane so they can't play the 2v2. North applying so much pressure in the mid lane, Bri just couldn't breathe. On the scaling pick, not allowed to scale. Bri was still able to put in some rotations, but D-Lab was able to shut down every single thing that they wanted to do. So North map pressure with the Toasty Roams, Appy applying a lot of pressure, and then of course Lobber and Lake in, in the side lanes able to just scale for free. But on the other side though, Flow State, Wangle, talk to us, what went wrong for them during game number two? Yeah, I mean, it's a really, really good showing from Flow State, obviously, like, very much show that they deserve to be in this top eight. They are con like consistently uh, making it difficult for a top team like D-Lab that are one of the teams touted to win the whole tournament. Uh, might be feeling in a little bit of a low state after being eliminated there. Uh, you know, had a little bit of a couple throw states in there. Uh, unfortunately, with a couple fights getting picked out a couple too many times um, in the wrong positions after such a good early game, especially in that game. Um, 
but you know big props to flow state they showed their medal they show that they're gonna be a consistent group of bun like group of players that will be in this tournament and we'll probably see them next time and i very much hope to very good group of people and they definitely put up a good fight. We saw how they played in game one and we saw how they played in game number two, but unfortunately it just wasn't enough. Thank you so much for watching everybody. Um, if you like what you're seeing, please drop a follow, subscribe. We're on YouTube, Twitch, Discord, all of the social medias you can think of, exclamation point support. If you like what you're seeing, which will take you to our GoFundMe. So this will be going towards our prize pool as well as the PCC production. We do unfortunately have to say goodbye to Grady and Wangle though. So Grady, how will your fans keep up with you? Uh, of course, I'll be on the desk again tomorrow. You can also catch me uh, in my stream. I stream just about every single day, twitch.tv slash Grady. I think yeah, it's, it's just right, right, right there. Uh, we have a big tournament coming up next week. It'll be Grady's Gauntlet number two, a 1v1 tournament uh, with 16 players that you guys will be seeing here in the PCC. Uh, so make sure you guys check that out. It'll be going on all next week. Big tournament. So make sure you guys stop by. And what about you, Wangle? Um, main one is going to be my Twitch, uh, twitch.tv slash I'm Wangle. Uh, you can catch me there. I will be resuming streaming, uh, as soon as I'm back in America sometime around mid May. So definitely give me a follow over there. We're going to be seeing more of Grady and Wangle tomorrow, but up next with our next best of three series will be the chefs versus what if. Please don't go anywhere. We're going to take a quick break.
Welcome back to the PCC, everybody. My name is R Dog with the Triple G. I'm your host here at the Prime Championship Circuit. This time I'm back with some new desk analysts. I've got Easy Ed with me, three time world fault champion, all the way from North Dakota, and captain of the Implication Pontoon. How are you, Ed? I am good. I'm excited to be here. This is going to be a fun time. <laughs> And of course, we've got Lance, skilled caster and talent coordinator here at the PCC. Not a big fan, big fan, big, big fan of Crazy Fool, PCC 5 champion. How's it going, Lance Cecil? <laughs> Sorry, Lance, we can't hear you. Totally it's amateur agreement. hour over here, dude. What a professional. <laughs> I am so good, our dog. If I was any better, I could split into twins. This whole day is a celebration, and I cannot wait for this next series. I am also just so excited about this whole day. It's just been banger after banger, series after series, and now we're entering our third quarterfinals of the day. Let's pull up the bracket. Okay, Ed, what are you seeing here on the, on the bracket that's on the screen? I mean, it, the games have been pretty close overall, but, you know, 2-0 and 2-0, it's, it, it's almost looking like there's a trend starting here, and we'll see if that continues with the next two, uh, two sets, too. Yeah, we've got the Chefs versus What If, battling it out head-to-head -head for this next best of three series. So it's going to be in between these two teams, and then... Um, We'll see who will advance to the semifinals to battle it out against Indecisive, or is it going to be The Hive? Definitely going to be in an intense series as well. I don't know if it's going to be even better, but we'll just have to see. Let's talk a little bit about these two teams though. Lance, what do you see on the screen? So the big thing to point out and to notice within this is that all of the numbers aside from like one is bigger on the side of chefs, which means they have better 
statistical outcomes in all of the games, but I think something that is worth noting, Chefs did only drop one game so far in PCC7 through Swiss and through groups, whereas What If has taken two losses. So in their wins, they are looking a little bit stronger, and in their losses, maybe a little bit closer with these numbers being so close. Really, the only edge that What If has is in KDA. So I think although a lot of people are predicting this to be a pretty easy series for chefs, I think what if has a lot of potential to stay competitive within this series, maybe take a game, maybe take two in the series two potentially to push themselves to the semifinals, but it's going to be an uphill climb for sure. We'll have to see, is it going to be another two and oh, or potentially going to be a two and one with a third game in this series? But looking at these heroes at the bottom, Ed, talk to us about them. Uh, I mean, you see the most band on each side of Kalari and Richter. You know, um, Kalari, they they don't really like the, uh, the, the chefs really don't like the, the sneakiness of the Kalari. Um, you know, you're not really able to see where he's at on the map too much. And one thing that Mav does really well is controls the map because he's got vision everywhere. Uh, getting rid of that Kalari for them definitely is on their strong side. And we definitely uh, and then do the... have to go ahead, Ed. Oh, sorry. And then with the most picked of the Quang, I mean, we we all know that Sneaks loves to play that both in the mid lane and in the off lane. But with the seismic acquisition, uh, you know, Sneaks over or Sneaks over on the on the off lane now with with Quang. That's such a strong hero. It's gonna be it's gonna be fun. It definitely is going to be fun. And also talking about the most picked hero, one of them being Rampage as well. We've got some Rampage numbers coming right at you. Lance, talk to us about Rampage. So Rampage has been a consistent staple in competitive predecessor pretty much since the beginning of it. Did go through a short period of time where he was a little nerfed, but if you take a look at these numbers, 58 games played, he's picked in 61.97, so basically 62%, banned in almost 20% as well, a little below 50% for win rate though, which is interesting. However, he is still being prioritized by these teams for all of the different things that he brings in. We talk about the boulder, we talk about the behemoth in order to become so tanky and soak up so much damage and stand in front of your ADC and kind of make him untargetable or at least much harder to hit, I would not be surprised to see Rampage be a priority in the drafts in this series either. We'll definitely have to see who will be able to acquire this champion in their team comp. Is it going to be the chefs or is it going to be what if? But now it's time to talk a little bit about these two teams a little bit more though. Easy Ed, you know the chefs a little bit. What do you know about them? I mean, they're just a bunch of guys being dudes. They're they're gamers through and through. They've got a lot of experience in the comp scene, you know, picking Seismic back up, taking him out of retirement. We love to see it. We love having Seismic back in the community a little more and on the big screen again. So this is going to be really fun to watch. Uh, you know, Cold is obviously, in my opinion, the best the best AD carry in, in, in the game. I mean, there's there's no if, ands, or buts about it. I think he I think he gaps everybody. Sorry if you're uh if you're a fan of another guy, but I think Cold Cold's just the man, you know. Uh and then Mav, like I say, he controls the jungle super well. I think this is a really good, well-rounded team through and through, and it's gonna be tough to pick them in a bad spot. And that's definitely been their strategy going into these games time and time again in these tournaments was to play around the duo lane. But this time around, they're able to put pressure with Seismic in the mid lane this time. But on the other side, we've got What If, Lance, what do you know about them? I know that everybody knows these guys. They've got two of the largest content creators in Predecessor on their team with Pinzo and with the big guy Crashy. So a lot of fans, I think they're at a little bit of a disadvantage as far as skill is concerned within these matchups as far as how they match up lane to lane into chefs. But I watch enough anime to know that the power of friendship can accomplish anything and the power of having everybody behind you and cheering for you can be enough to push you to glory. And I think that's the only chance what it has in this series. We definitely will have to see because we've got Dr. Flick, Crashy Pinzo, Skype Hamster, all the way from EU, and of course, Neo, who is going to be their ADC versus Cold. It's time for some predictions. Ed, I'm going to start with you. 
who wins this best of three series? I, I think it's going to be chefs through and through. We're going to have a repeat of the last two series of a two and oh, I no BM. I don't think this is going to be a uh, very, very slow game or anything. I think this is going to be a fast paced game. Cold's going to grab everybody by the ponytails and just ride. He is going to, he's going to go with it. Um, but as far as, uh, you know, the numbers that we saw earlier, I think a big reason that uh, the chefs kind of had some lower numbers on the KDA is I think they're just single handedly running games you know they're 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 winning really fast and they don't really have the the time the gameplay time that um the other games do so i think they're just winning really quick i'm throwing back the same question to you lance chefs or what if gamers of pred lift up your hands and give them your energy i've got what if in a three game series three game series it's going to be a two to one all right, Lance is locking in what if. That leaves just me to pick in between the chefs versus what if. I'm, we, we've seen a lot of chefs. The thing is we haven't seen a lot of what if. So I'm curious to see what they have. So I think I'm going to lock in what if. Even though we haven't had a lot of their games during broadcast, we know the chefs, they, they can cook up a storm, but we don't know what, what if has up their sleeve, okay? So I'm gonna lock in what if for this best of three series. With that being said, let's dive right into this draft. Okay, Ed, I know you didn't like that, but <laughs> what else are you expecting to see in in this uh, draft that's not Rampage? Uh, in, in the draft, I mean, Colt, he's got he's got uh, variants on any carry that he's going to play, so they don't really need to prioritize that too much. I think from the the streams that I've watched and such of, of you know what if players. Uh, crashy on Grux, I think that's going to be his comfort pick. That's that's the one he's going to go to. I think they will try to prioritize that. Um, you see here the the phase for the first ban of the of what if here. Um, I I don't know. I it, personally I would get rid of a Decker or something like that. But you know they're they're trying to get cold in a situation and make sure that he can't get pulled away right away. I think it's very hard to ban somebody like Zihi out though, as these picks are just flying and how it's going to be banned from chefs, which I'm a little surprised to see. And what if going to immediately put the Polish powerhouse of Skype Hamster onto Gideon. So now it'll be chef's turn to get some answer here Two probably pretty strong picks coming out of them. As we've seen a lot of Gideon early in drafts so far today, I personally, as a mid lane person and a, a big gadget stand, I'm a little surprised to see the priority on to Gideon here, but we'll have to see what Chefs decides to answer it with. Right, right. I mean, Seismic, he, we can see a Faye game here. I know he likes to play Faye. I, I've talked to him a little bit. He'd love to play a Countess game if he gets the opportunity. So we'll see how that goes. But you see the the Drongo and the Zaris here. They're looking to get some CC action going and, and take other players out of the game and, and the team fights. You know, Drongo silence is really effective. Zaris holding them down in the pit and then going from there. Oh, but there's the Wombo for what if the Rampage into the Richter. It's so easy to hit those boulders from a long way. Crashy very good with the aim as well, which is going to just free Pinzo up to right click them. You're going to get rocked. You're going to get pulled. And then there's a good chance there's a black hole on top of you for a portion of that so far with this composition that what if is building. I actually really like to see it out of them. Like, nice to see that they are not just rolling over and they're going to put their best effort into this as you would definitely expect from them. So how do you answer this if you're chef's what if? Or if you, if you are what if, what if Ed? Whoa, I cannot speak today. That's right, you're trying, you're trying. Pressure's, pressure's on, we get it. But uh, I mean, you gotta have a beefy front line here, you know? So you're gonna need, you're gonna need a Severaga, you're gonna need to steal. Otherwise you're gonna just get picked apart and that, that meaty front line is gonna just bully you around too much. But you see the Decker pick up, it's really strong. So now they've got two little forms of keeping the animals in the cages and just to separate uh, separate Cold from, from the danger coming his way. But the Chimera ban and the Wraith ban here, these are some interesting picks. So, you know, Mav is a really good Chimera player. He loves to run around, but you know, taking that away from him, his player pool is is nuts. He's gonna have a lot of opportunity. I could maybe think a steel jungle game here or something if they if he doesn't take the Zaris, but we'll see. So the Kalari is still up 
for the side of chefs here and i know that it was their most banned hero but i know sneaks loves that hero the beginning portion of this game he was a jungle main to begin with and he specialized in kalari it was basically all he played i also want to point out and give a little props really quick with this wraith ban as we see the severoth severog come in neo the adc for what if was the first person in the game to unlock the affinity skin for wraith but his secondary hero is the twin blast that we just saw him come through with yeah i see the i see the quang and the tv coming through here now too i i really like what if's draft again they have a lot of power in the front and with that gideon alt too um you know really the only thing that's gonna take gideon out of his alt is a decker bomb right now um that's that's going to be interesting unless she takes the silencium or something too but there's there's not a whole lot of counter to the gideon so sky pamster might have a fun game here but again they are playing gamers so they're going to have a couple tricks up their sleeve and we'll kind of see what this last pick comes in and i mean it's it's going to be for the mid lane i would love to see a fey maybe or we'll get that countess game seismic was talking about so we'll see watch this be a narbash oh it's countess okay so we see countess that's gonna be that's gonna be seismic on the countess seismic also known for a little bit of decker mid lane himself so i wouldn't have been surprised to see that kind of shift around but the countess into the gideon which is a great matchup for countess here i expect this to go pretty well if they can get past the first 10 15 minutes of this game for the countess i just they gotta say i, I must let be him snowball yeah and now that is our draft and talk to us we kind of see what what if is going to go into this game with just looking at their team comp but what is the strategy with the chef's team comp I mean, it looks like they're 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 a high damage team and a and a pretty solid CC team overall, but they are pretty squishy. So their their benefit is to just get TB out of the game as quick as possible, and they definitely have the utility and the skills to do it with with two different cages, with the Severog R, with it, as soon as Countess can get on there, you know that that TV's dead. So this is gonna be these are gonna be some scraps in there. Probably advantage goes to what if if uh, if the chefs don't land their abilities, but again, this is this is a really good team they're playing so they need to be top tier and lance what are the initiations and the engagements coming from what if side so like we talked about earlier in the draft it is the it's either the tether or the rock now that they locked in that quang as well into that richter pull if pinzo can hit the person who's not holding still and that has been stunned with the hook the wombo combo potential and the team play for what if honestly looks superior here it looks like chefs is trying to just skill check them game number one ladies and gentlemen of this best of three series between what if versus chefs we've got ego and Frauken as our casters please take it away gamers welcome in welcome in it's pcc7 and on the menu today you got ego as well as the man the myth the legend Frauken with a large beverage included because we're going to keep the cast refreshing Frauken, man are you excited for these games i'm very excited and honestly that draft is very surprising i have to agree with this where what is draft is just superior in basically every aspect and says off just trying to skill check what if which i mean it's a little place definitely possible but it's kind of just like an ego check oh man i like the way you slid that in there but i have to agree the boulder in combination with the rip lash already has been a devastating tool at this caliber of play and i'm kind of wondering if this team has a way to just directly counter it or if they're just going to be playing with a lot more confidence as we are going to be loading into game one of what if versus the chefs and we'll have to see exactly where both junglers want to uh, start their sort of um, conquest of the jungles because I think most of the lanes are going to be pretty quiet, especially in this mid lane. Countess is going to be pushed under tower multiple times by Skype Hamster on this Gideon, and it's going to be a while until Seismic can actually be unlocked to roam into these side lanes. And especially on the dual lane as well, you've got oh, off lane, sorry, you got a several into a uh crank which you know it's just kind of going to be quiet there's not much going to be really happening so i'm definitely looking towards both mav and crassy in this game to start things off for their teams 
Yeah, and that's kind of the mentality that a lot of these junglers have, knowing that a lot of things do start and end with them. However, for me, I'm wondering which one of them are going to start it first. I know that Mav, very well known for giving a little bit of pressure to the mid, but with Psy being added onto this team, we've seen the dividends that he's been able to pay already throughout not only this series, but throughout the entirety of his time within the PCC Falcon. Yeah, definitely, and it's actually interesting. Seismic so going for that solo slip at level one, not going for that wave clear instead, just trying to press out Strike Hamster where he can. Obviously, this is going to cause Strike Hamster to have that wave first, and he's going to be able to push it in, get an early ward for his team as well if he so wishes. And in terms of junglers, it's going to be definitely the side of Crassy who's going to have a better wave clear or jungle clear compared to Mav on that Zara's Just Rampage is the king of the jungle. He has got that passive extra attack speed plus all of his abilities. So there's going to be probably a um, prioritization for Crassy. And I mean, outside of the mid lane, I think there's nowhere else he can really use it. Yeah, and I'm excited to see what this 2v2 within the mid lane is going to look like. Rampage, truly the king of the jungle, but is he going to be able to push some of that omnipotence into some of the lanes? All of these players, of course, are of the highest caliber, and I have no doubt within my mind that they're going to be looking and anticipating some rotations coming out of math as well as Crashy. But within these games, especially when you're so close to the finals, all it takes is one small slip up for the momentum to completely shift. Noble is very, very strong in this game, and we can already see Dr. Flick having that presser in the solo lane means that Crassy can invade onto the blue side jungle of Sesk. Mav is aware of it, however, but with Seismic having to already back first, that means that Crassy is going to have prioritization over this jungle. Mav might look for a fight, though. Yeah, maybe looking to get engaged here around the blue buff. It's going to be Mav being the aggressor as Crash is going to be brought below the 50% threshold and maybe just forced to get out as hot on his tail. It is going to be Mav that does get first blood, but it doesn't look like he's quite done yet. As Dr. Flick is going to look and find himself a disengage first blood over in favor of the chefs. I'm not entirely sure what just happened there. We've got Dr. Flick also going on to sneaks, but Mav is still around, so he is going to have to back up. And, I mean, Crassy did have the fire in both mid lane and the off lane, but neither came to help. We actually saw Scrape Hamster go towards that dual lane instead, which was definitely a mistake on his part. And now that Mav has got that first blood, that means Zarus is going to be able to get those items online a lot faster. And... We've seen already in this tournament how strong Zarus can be in that jungle, especially if he gets those Colosseum stacks on early as well. So, not a bad start for the Seths. It would have been better to get it on a lane probably to get that prioritization, as I've already said. But either way, Mav is going to be happy with that. He does keep his blue buff as well. So, we'll have to see what else he can do in the map. As the boulders can actually enter the duel, lady. Zoned out and killed within the duo as now Crashy helps put his team on the kill board. And uh, that's why you pick Richard from Rampage on the same team. Uh, does an easy boulder into an easy rip plus, followed by Neo doing the damage where it was needed. See, he didn't even have a chance to blink away in that fight. So an easy return kill for What If. Set to their dual lane ahead as well, which is going to be really good for him for them and once Trim Blast does get that wave clear presser online as well it is going to be a good snowball position to go for as Neo takes down cold yes off screen it is now going to be a kill advantage going in favor of what if they're just playing to what this comp is capable of and what we predicted Spear near going to come out onto map but on the back side it's going to be the stun the cage is going to be relegated as not as useful as rampage is going to be able to get himself another disengage creating some space with the burst flower yeah, a good jump over the cage just meant sure that he was out of it. I think the rock was a bit ambitious. I'm not so exactly sure if he was going for the river buff there or was just trying to catch a Mav. But either way, he is safe. Just a bit of time lost farming up. But as a rampage, that's not too much of an issue. We see that both junglers are level four. So they are still pretty even with that first blood still going over. But it's definitely going to be a game about duo now. Neo having two kills at five minutes into the game is going to be a great boost for what if. I really want Crassy to try and prioritize and get an early thank you for now. Dr. Flick is holding himself well in this off lane. But it doesn't look like they want to try and stop the farming coming out of Severog. But Mav has other ideas. 
Yeah, he's going to begin in a disengage on the spoon saw as he's going to be able to utilize his blink to flash out pretty immediately there, understanding that the kill potential is going to be pretty high on him if they're able to get that CC chain landed. So very good play coming out of him early as it is still going to maintain to be in two to one on our way to 10 minutes in. And we start to make the Spike Hamster both now level 6. We're probably going to see a bit more action in this mid lane, or at least rotation. Seismic already just trying to move as much as they can, wants to get those passive stacks on as much as they can. And Pinto, again, stuck in that cage. He has no blink. And this is going to happen more. And as we punish are... this blink from Pinto. Yes, indeed, as Pinzo, again, without that blink, he is going to be relegated to being in a little bit of a riskier position, but not as risky as Hamsters. He is going to be forced to blink underneath the tower. Now it's going to be the Countess Hulk coming out, but the blink in response, the Spear of Nier locks out another kill, but Crashy will be back here to get in blood. I, I mean, just a bit too overaggressive from Mav there. They got the kill onto Scrape Hamster, yeah. But, I mean, one for one in the total there is not great. And Crassy is going to be able to hold that mid wave as well. Uh, if they didn't lose Mav there, that could have been an easy spank to for Cess. But either way, because that did not happen, they are going to have to reset back away. Seismic is going to get a bit of free farm online as well. So, overall, not really a game for either side. And honestly, considering what we were expecting from Seth is kind of body roll with this um, game. It's rather close. Yeah, and all things considered, I do think that what if can put themselves in a very prominent or leading position if they are able to maintain this kill lead and maybe begin the process of locking down some of these neutral objectives. We do see Richter as well as his carry on the TB playing this way a little bit closer to the Fang Tooth, possibly looking for a rotation to it as Gideon's going to drop out to lane. I think they're just looking for rotation here, definitely. They have got Pinzo in the rings as well. There's no wars from the side of Cess. They do know that the rotation is coming because they're missing, but the Torm stays through. And Z, now locked out once again on the back line, is going to be forced to use their blink in order to get out of what would be certain death. Mav, though, now making a rotation. Probably not going to be looking to rebuff the enemy team in what if, but maybe alleviate some of the pressure that was just established within the duo. What if just used two big ultimates, didn't gain anything out of it outside of Zhi's blink? So Seth's can go for something if they want, but Seismic has just recalled. They need time to get back. They can't start the Spank Tooth immediately because there is still a numbers advantage for the side of a What If. They have started it now because Seismic is coming back. And with Black Hole and the, uh, uh, sorry, the Behemoth out of the way for What If, I don't think they can really contest it, but... Yeah, as you said, Chef has backed off from it, though. And, you know, we are very aware of the Chef's play style. It's definitely a winning play style, and they do put a lot and a lot more pressure on these Null of objectives. And if they're able to get one or two, they're normally able to run away with the game as Crashy is going to be looking to maybe run away from an engage, utilizing the Blast Flower. It's going to get them real close to nowhere as Decker is going to put the Behemoths within the cage. Oh. Crashy missing the jump up in order to get a disengage, but Pinzo onto the back line. It's actually going to get some solid damage by getting a kill now onto Mav as he is going to be looking for a way out. One that they will not find more than likely as they're also going to go down, but Seismic is going to making a trade as they do get the big ult on to Pinzo with the back line looking to peel TB it's free casting bullet but it is not gonna be enough to save the Richter like Pamster is going in they have got Dr. Flick in the background he's going to taunt space through gets the hit on to cold a few autos Dr. Flick steals it with the sword seismic is still around the black hole is back up Dr. Flick is coming back around he has got the rest of the abilities Neo is also there this should be a very dead seismic is going to go over to Skype Hamster so overall four kills for the side of what if and I believe only two members uh died so a good advantage from them and because Crassy died so early on in that team fight he can immediately come back and start this fang tooth yes this gives time for sneaks to get free farm on Severog, but this is definitely advantage early game for more this is advantage that they're really materializing here, kind of forcing oh, through no. using this draft. We saw there's some really solid damage did come out of the chefs, but the damage still a little bit raw at this point of the game just wasn't enough. And you pointed it out yourself. It was a four to two trade with a fang tooth on the back end. Really, you can't ask for too much more out of an engagement like that. 
I mean, if you want to ask more than that, then I don't know what you are looking for from the side of bosses, because the only other person was Sneeze on the other side of the map. You're not going to take any tower at this stage of the game with that little damage. And now we've got an interesting situation. Dolph Flick is holding this dual lane against Cold and Zihi. Neo's then rotated into this off lane with Pinso coming around. And this is the setting up for the mini prime. They know there's no objective on that dual side of the map or the side of Cess to take. So if they can gain Thresser in this off lane and help Skype Hamster to push out this mid lane, they can then rotate onto this mini prime. But Cess have to be aware of that. I'm pretty sure they are, but the question becomes for me, are they going to do anything about it as we're instead going to see some attention put over into the mid lane as Heisman is going to fall below that 50% of the black hole. It is going to barely okay. be off kilter, but with pins on the back line being chased by Mav and Zihi, it divvies up what could potentially be a team fight, but instead it looks like the chefs are going to be rotating towards the mini prime. They have got the pressure in the mid lane. Skype Hamster is just way too low to engage. Seismic can also regen if they so want, but they are just going to reset. Cold is in the duo lane, so they have got numbers advantage if what if want to go for it. Crassy's also around. They can go for a steal. And now Behemoth activated on the rampage as he's going to be looking for the engage. It is going to be a steal they get as Hashi crashes in and takes what he wants. Zarius is now going to be forced to utilize the Colosseum, but it may be a little bit too late as Pinzo is going to build a pin of the conversation of Seismic, sending him to the gray screen as onto the backside. Severog is going to find himself in a 2v2 situation. And with Decker being able to offer some CC and spatial control, it's going to be left to the tether coming out of Dr. Flick as he secures the kill onto Sneaks. It's all going the way of what if Crassy got a miracle steal against Ray the Drekic CC was not enough to stop him for an extended period of time. They lost Neo in that fight, yes, from the Colosseum, but they gained so much more. They also killed Sneaks and Seismic in the background of that as well. And now, I mean, they are just ahead and they kept the mini prime. Crassy stayed alive in that team fight. So now they can use that wave to push in whatever tower they want, most likely the off lane to allow Dr. Flick to rotate more or for the mid lane just to open up that in general. I don't think they'll look for this dual lane. And considering the farm is also nearly identical at this point, what if I'm in the lead against the Seths? Oh man, and the, my, my biggest question is what if this is where it ends as we are going to see Seismic with the mid lane having something to say about that but with three rotating onto him I'd be looking for a way out as well as the damage is going to start coming out out of Skype Pepper utilizing the teleport this feels like an all but certain death for Countess as it is going to be the Vampire Rest who is laid to rest by Neo the Twin Blast picking up a kill and extending the kill lead I don't really know why Seismic was there um, I think he was just going for a pick, but now that leaves the mid lane open, this is going to be able to be easily pushed in with Skype, Hamster, and Crassy. They are going to need an extra wave because there's only range minions on that, but there's going to be a no defense on the side of Seth's. And we just had a quick look at the Countess build. They've gone for the Orb of Growth into what looks like the Spirit of Amir, which I don't personally agree with. It's going to take too long for him to really stack that up and lock, get online. I'd rather prefer a combustion wave like in his penetration build for the assassinations. And I mean, we've seen it there. He's yeah, he's a bit tankier, but he has basically zero damage at this point. Wow, we're speaking of damage. See, he looks like he's about to receive some. The boulder is going to be offline, but still the crashing in of the what if team composition is going to force a blink out. And as the black hole comes down underneath tower, Zihi just barely survives. But with him so low, that's not going to help alleviate much of the pressure that is being put on here by what if. They're just pushing it out. They didn't want to go for the tower because they knew Mav was around. Seismic is also going to start rotating over. I think Seismic should have stayed in the mid because they lost the local gold on that mid tower now, though. So that's kind of a loss overall for Seth. They could have gained a bit more gold. And with Skype Hamster resetting a bit earlier, that means he's going to be back in time for the second Fang Tooth to spawn. And I mean, Crassy, I don't think he has the mini prime up anymore. I think that's run out by now. So it's going to be hard. It's going to be a 4v4 in this situation, though. But if Crassy backs, this could be a plenty enough time for Seth to take it. 
most definitely as Mav has already started it with Z. He's helping with Cole to making a rotation. This basically feels free as we do see Gideon is relatively close, but we're not actually going to see a contest out of what if as the Fangtooth almost assuredly is going to be going into the pockets of the chefs. I don't really know why they didn't have any contest. Maybe they just didn't have the good back timings. They were all waiting on items to buy. But either way, they should have been either back in 30 seconds earlier once they got off of that tier 2 tower or tier 1 tower in Jura like Strike Panther did. Or just go for it. Because they are in the lead. They can get this team fight. Sneaks was on the other side of the map. So it wasn't guaranteed 4v4. So a bit questionable by that. But either way, Sefsa do get on the board with an objective. And that does mean that there's no third fang tooth until Primal comes up. Rashi's come again. Crashy with the rotation is going to mitigate the mid part of the pressure and then relegate a boulder actually onto that window. Seeing Mav maybe looking for a rotation is going to be able to peek into the jungle a little bit safer now with Skype being able to accompany him. This almost looks like a full rotation to the mid, but I don't foresee any large camp going down anytime immediately here as both teams are going to have enough space to take a little bit of a breather. And there's no objectives to take on the map, as you said, so it's just going to be, I would like to say, a farming sim uh, simulator for a while. However, knowing NA and knowing the PCC, that's definitely not the case. Neo is very much in danger. You do not want to walk up there. Skype Hamster and Pinzo are coming back around, but they, they need enough pressure to allow Neo to do what he wants to do, and that's just farm up. And also another thing, Sneeze has taken Tau on Tier 1 at some point. I'm not exactly sure when that happened, so he can actually rotate a lot easier compared, but Black Hole's coming in mid. Yeah, and Sai is going to be able to use the Blink Black here, coming at a Countess in combination with the actual Blink in order to get out with just barely above 50% of that HP. We do see some resources used on both sides, though. Gideon's Black Hole as well as Countess's Blink are going to be down here. He always take the Blink over the ultimate cooldown. That's just going to be a lot longer and means that the next Black Hole that does come up is going to be much harder for Seismic to escape. I'm not exactly sure if he went Epoch, or what Questy has gone, so that could be useful. Sneaks, however, is going to be pretty big. He has level 11. Neo is also around with Crashy, but see, he's here as well. Yeah, the Colossal Blow being expended is going to knock Crashy a little bit out of position as he is now going to be forced to use his Disengage in kit and Blink going to be down for the next couple of minutes as it looks like priority for this mini prime is firmly going to go over to the chefs who have seized the positioning. Yeah, without another steal, this is going to definitely be inside of Steph's. Cold is still around as well, so this could be a 5v5 fight, actually. Oh, it's going to be a 5v5 briefly as the big three-man skewer is going to be able to come out, playing this base onto the backside now. It is going to be Z. He, who once again is getting melted without any of his damage, to be able to back up of Skype Hamster, being able to hit a Magnificent Suck coming out of the black hole over the top, is going to relegate those who do survive only briefly to minimalist levels of HP as we're looking at a two to four trade, swinging in favor of what if we're making a play for the mini prime. And that was just a complete comp diff. Pinsa got a beautiful three-man skewer just to lock down multiple members of Seth. Seismic died from that situation as well. Yes, they got near at the start, but there was just way too much front line. But what if for just Cole to deal with? He's only got two items. He needs that demolish before he can actually do damage to the lives of Crassley, Dr. Flick, and Pinzo. And with Skype Hamster getting another great black hole of top of multiple members, it just means what if gets another mini prime for themselves. This is going to mean that they can push in these last tier one towers. And with Trent, 15 seconds on the uh, map, sorry, all prime is spawning. I want to I get in your headspace here, Frauken. Looking at the score right now, objectives as far as Fangtooth's tied up, but kill lead going in favor of what if at the 20 minute mark, 25 minutes ago, would you have anticipated this being the game one we were casting? No, definitely not. Um, in terms of composition, what if did have the advantage? We all agreed on that, but it was still assessed. This is still a great team and what if are relatively new they've only started playing pinzo might be getting caught out though this map is still looking around they can't afford to lose richter here however he's getting burst down as the coliseum is going to go down so is he as cold is going to be able to sink pinzo 
yeah, just out of position from Richter. You still have no mobility and you are still a support. So with mortal members facing him down, I can be an easy pickup. And that's going to be with the thank you spawning as well. You see Colt has just reset himself. Hopefully he has got that demolisher for the side of Seth's. Because if not, he is still going to struggle. And seven, six seconds on the side of Pinzo before that spawns. Valentine is going to spawn before that. I don't think Seth is going to be in a position to actually fight it though, because Sneaks has just reset himself. So what if have got the advantage around the pit? It'll be a question of if they want to use it or look for a pick first. Looks like Crash, he may be looking for a pick himself, as we're going to see the Decker Cage go up while they're going to be looking to deward. Not too much happening happening immediately here as Crashy, as well as some other members from What If, are going to be looking to get some farm while simultaneously pushing this wave. But the chefs are looking for more as they're actually going to be able to CC first to Lasso Blow. Break down one member here as Dr. Flick is in need of medical assistance. And soon to follow him is going to be the rampage. The chefs telling the opposition to calm a bit down. It's going to be Pinzo who sinks within the third seat, looking like a one for three trade, at least at this instance. But the subjugate does come up, forcing the blink out of Skype Hamster and positioning. And basically, this neutral objective is guaranteed to go in favor of the chefs. What if we just split on that area there? They had multiple members in the mid lane trying to deal with that. They had Neo coming back towards the duo now. And Crassy and Dr. Flick were just way too far up just for the two of their members. Jeff was able to collapse on them so easily. We see how strong the Severod can be in that situation just to get the subjugate into that double colossal blow. Then that Crassy and Dr. Flick were not able to do anything. See, he also started that play with that double rift walkers into their ultimate was such a good pickup from Seth as well and now they got that second fang tooth primal is going to be spawning around 27 minutes into the game which is going to be a very strong buff to pick up it's going to be around i mean five hasn't been taken yet so they might split the buffs if they so want and what if can't really afford to do what they just did they need to make sure that skype and neo are with this front line because otherwise they have zero damage I have to agree with you. They need to tighten up that positioning or the damage is going to be next to zero as the Colossal Blow is going to come out. Sneaks is going to be in hot pursuit. The Subjugate is going to be right up off the back end. But with the CC coming out of the yeah, quote, yeah. this may be a reversal of fortunes. The Boulder is going to connect and sever wrong. It's going to be disintegrated at the face of the damage coming out of what if. Look where Seismic is, though. He's still looking for side of Skype. He is going to back off now, knowing that multiple members of What If are rotating back around. And Sneeze, dead. Mav is half HP. There is an all fine situation. Skype Hamster is going to have to reset, though. And it looks like they don't want to risk the 4v4 just yet. They want to make sure that if they go for this all prime, it is a certainty. Seismic is still looking around. He has got the three items online. But look at the items. It's Spirit of Mir. Orb of Enlightenment and Worldbreaker, he hasn't got that full burst damage. He's just there to do as many rotations of his combo as he can. And Neo honestly shouldn't be that scared of it. Honestly, I wouldn't be. How actually, who am I lying to? These players are several calibers of being me. They could come in building all tank on the Drongo, and I'd be terrified. Nonetheless, I would like to see what if kind of go back into that playstyle we just saw. Maybe wait for an engage, come down to the chest, get a pick, and then make a rotation onto something that's going to be a little more profitable, whether that is one of these neutral objectives or another kill, as we are now seeing all the ingredients start to come together for an initiation, but. It looks like both teams aren't ready for the main course quite yet. Both teams just pandering around this orb prime. Both of them know that they can't actually start it, so just the pick is coming through. You see the mid lane is also just on the other side of the map, so there is a 4v4. And, I mean, in terms of pick potential, both teams have actually got pretty good. The subjugate and the ball from Decker is going to be strong enough to assess if they want to get some CC. But unless it's on Neo... It's not much point. Yes, they can probably burst down any other member, but it will take quite a while. And another big thing to mention, Sneaks has finished that 160 stacks. He is going to be a raid boss.
160 stacks that's so much tank to have to deal with as we now may be looking at an engage as the chefs are going to be rallying around the enemy side of the jungle pins are playing the space underneath that tower as now given this team once again in the chefs space and positioning to kind of just wait hey if you guys don't want to fight we'll take our time and when you do We'll be ready. Crashy may have to find out the hard way, oh. though, as he takes a peek, but there's no CC waiting for him. Instead, he's going to be using his leap and his blink to create the space he needs. Pinzo wishes he could as he is going to get burst down. The hole. skewer comes down, but not as quickly as he does. The big black hole over the top end is going to be able to subjugate in a different way. Multiple other members with seismic being able to pick up the kill. Now, Neo looking to maybe play the space. A little bit of a matrix situation he finds himself in. He's oh so low, but not dead until he is with sneaks being able to pick up the kill nonetheless now within the mid lane it's going to be dr flick oh so low and completely eradicated on the back end as it looks like the chefs have prepared the materials and they're ready to cook they are also loaded crassy is basically full hp i don't think he can really look for anything outside of just a rock which that went wide oh well uh, that's basically it Chefs do have to reset though, they need the HP before they can look towards this or Prime. And I mean, we want to point out, it was basically center, square center on the screen. Snakes was taking zero damage from Neo. And I mean, that's mainly from Neo's build. He hasn't got that sky split online. He's gone for that preferator instead of Demolisher, which is a big mistake against a character that HP stacks like the Seven Rock. So I don't think Neo is going to be doing that much damage in this game against him. It's going to be down to Strike Panzer, who has got that um, Megacosm online, will be bringing into Kostka. And what if. I mean, oh, their builds are just no. not great. Pinto's also just caught. The forced blink out is the only timeline in which he survives that as he got hit with the subjugate into the cage into a surplus of damage as now the chefs find a way into the pit. There is a grouping, though. This could be ultimately contested as we are going to see them get some gauge and make a play onto the Alpha Zone team. It's going to be What If Mav looking to get a kill onto their Sky Hamster. A big skewer, though, is going to be able to come out as Sneaks is going to be bursted down to that sub 10% threshold of his total HP. But it is a complete and utter brawl now, Mav looking for an engage onto the backliners. Finds the front line instead as Seismic is going to be able to lock down a kill onto the Richter. The boulder goes up. Up, but it's not going to really bring anyone of note down as Neo's going to join three other of its teammates in the Grey Street. Neo's once again held up three members of What If. Pinzo, Crassy, and Neo could not kill him whatsoever, and that left Skype Hanson and Dr. Flip to die to the four members of Cess. This is going to be an easy or prime for the side of the Cess, and then they can immediately go into that primal fang to get up the third fang as well. So it's going to be a massive turn for the side of Cess. They do look like they want to reset first, get those items online. And I feel like, I mean, the smell of CC that What If has is great, but if you don't have the damage, it doesn't matter. And against Sneaks, he's a one-man army at this point. Dude, he's the raid boss, so one-man army. He's the one giving out commands and subjugating those who do not meet his demands. He has been just such a large contributor, one, two, and nine. It doesn't quite reflect how much of a problem he has been for this team. And what if being able to just stand in front of the carry in a lot of instances, and if not, the subjugate is setting up his team to free cast a very powerful spell and bullet as cold is going to be forced to utilize his own to get away from the behemoth myth rampage now math looking for an engage will find it as over the top and it's going to be a black hole but the first one to seek into it is going to be two members of what if as now crashy has to look for a disengage he surely will not find this is the same song it's on replay i've read the story it's another four to five oh trade losing nothing in favor of the chefs what if thought that they caught cold, but the amount of damage that was coming out, once again, was not enough to kill him. And then Cess did the exact same thing. They found Neo, they picked him out, and then were able to immediately rotate and manage to peel off Black Hole from Cold. I believe it was Zihi with the status ball getting the stun off. The True Silver Bracelet was already popped at that point from Cold, so the CC was enough to stop it. And then from that point onwards, the team fight was just over 
But aside of what if, Seth's now have got that double bubble buff. There's only two towers left up for them to be able to take. And with Neo and Pinzo being the only ones alive right now, this is probably two inhibitors right now. There's only a couple things within this life for Alkin that yeah. feels certain. Death, taxes, and some of these structures going down as that mid inhib is going to be one of the first to fall. Now, crowding around the left side, it is going to be the chefs. And with no defense, not even a soft one set up, this could spell the end of the game. But we do get a big riplash coming out as sneaks onto the back line it is going to get a solid engagement and find a kill onto Skype Master as it is going to not be one, not two, but four members. Dr. Flick needs a remedy for the illness that has been presented out of the chefs who are going to just take game one. It looked close until it didn't. Sneaks, once he got into those team fights, created so much space for the side of Seth that the fights were basically over. The early game went really, really well for the side of What If. They managed to use their comp effectively. But coming in that mid game, they just didn't have the damage. They didn't really have the build to deal with the side of uh, chess tanks. And especially around that all prime fight, it wasn't enough. And I mean, yeah, there was some communication disconnects on the side of what if as well, especially Neo getting caught, Pinto getting caught a few times as well. But that was also on the side of Seth. So overall, it's kind of a close game. And uh, they might need to focus sneaks next game. They definitely do. And throughout the early and mid game, I was I was ready to be surprised. I was prepared for the bamboozle. I thought that what if was going to pull the lead out. But when we got to the team fighting stage, the chefs, they just seemed so comfortable. Yeah, they had an objective lead, but even with it, it was a little abnormal. They were looking for fights that they surely should be losing with the CC stacking that the desk and we talked about at the beginning of the game. Nonetheless, they do have an opportunity to possibly bring it back as that's only game one of possibly three for Alkin. Yeah, and I mean, it's going to be hard for what if. We'll have to see what desk thinks and see if they can make any alterations. Thank you so much, Ego and Fralkin. That was game number one between Chefs versus What If in this best of three series in the quarterfinals. Please type exclamation point bracket to keep track of the current score and standings. But the Chefs just came out on top for game number one as what the caster said. It looked close until it didn't. But Lance, what exactly happened in game number one? So what happened is that Chefs built a fully scaling composition. Every single hero, aside from Decker on there, wants to get the ball rolling, get a couple of stacks in, get some passives built up that allow them to take over a game. And although what if, what if looked like they had control of it early, there was a timer set on them and they didn't accomplish what they needed to. By the time that timer went off and Chefs just full reversed it on them, started taking control of the game, Seismic became a monster, Cold became a monster, and there was just nothing left for what if to do easy ed what else what what were your observations during game number one i was sweating a little bit at the start there uh the chefs definitely looked like they were stumbling on their feet and then once they got got back on they were they were sprinting they were going good um what if definitely played really well at the start game but as lance said they just didn't capitalize when they needed to and they didn't apply enough pressure early when they had those big leads and you know they the chefs just kind of took over they definitely did as they were able to secure their victory in game number one. While I have your attention, please go ahead and type exclamation point support to help um, our PCC organization, our production, as well as to help with our prize pool. We've already hit the $1,000 mark, but we have still yet to hit those $3,000 and $5,000 incentives. So go ahead and that will take you to that GoFundMe link. We're on Twitch, YouTube, X, Discord, all of the social media that you can think of. But don't go anywhere, chat, because we still have game number two. What if they win and will chefs cook up in the kitchen? We'll be right back.
Welcome back, everybody, to the PCC. My name is Ardog with the Triple G. PCC is a community-based tournament where we show you the best predecessor has to offer in competitive gaming. I am joined by Easy Ed as well as Lance. We just watched game number one between What If and the Chefs, and Chefs just showing up and taking game number one away from them. But we got to talk about one of the heroes from this game, and it's got to be the Zaris Lance. We got some stats. We do have some stat stats. Codename Lizard in here. 55 games played, picked in 63%, banned in 14 as well, with over a 50% win rate, which is really what you are looking for. We saw what North was able to do in our last series between Flow State and D Lab on it. We really just saw Mav have a pretty impactful performance as well. The KDA doesn't always represent how well a character like Zaurus plays. The Coliseums can be so big, locking down a priority tar uh, target, getting people stuck in it, splitting a team fight in half, basically, where your team can enter whatever side you want while the enemy is stuck on the other side of the cage unless they've got a very high jump in order to be able to get over it. So Zaurus, very impactful so far in this tournament. Expect him to continue to be impactful in PCC7. If you're within range, there's no way you can miss the Colosseum on anybody. And if Zaurus is able to lock down on you, you will get instantly deleted. And we've seen that during the games here at the PCC. But now it's time to get into the draft. Ed, we know that Zaris is one of the priority picks or bans. What else are you expecting to see in this draft? I'm definitely expecting to uh, not see a Countess again mid. You know, Seismic Tournament Day, Seismic definitely started to show up there for a little bit. And uh, he, yeah, he, he struggled a little at the start. But at one point, he was six levels up on uh, on What If's support on Pinzo's Richter, and it really showed off. That orb first was kind of a questionable call, but he really scaled well off of it. I definitely think that Rampage is going to be a priority pick again for What If. Crashy played pretty well on there overall. There, there's a lot of lot of interesting things to go here. Oh, but it's going to be the Belisha first taken off the board from the side of Chefs. I don't think that's a terrible ban at all. A lot of the players on What If can go for it. But once again, they are going to respect Zihi's phase. What If going to ban that away? Don't want to have to go against the extra range, the extra safety for Cold, trying to keep him vulnerable. But just as we highlighted, Zara's very high priority, going to be the first pick, probably once again in the hands of Mav. Yeah. Zaris, Zaris, and Mav, I mean, they're going hand in hand right now. It's it's really fun to watch. Mav's playing really well. You know, we may try to see that Decker cage with the Zaris cage again. It seemed to work really good for them in the team fights. As long as they have an answer to that Gideon, if what if pulls that again? Sky, there it is. Sky Pamster just had a monster game with that. Didn't have a lot of answers to it, and he was just playing for free. He was doing a lot of damage, and he was kind of the heart and soul of that team for a bit. So I would be very interested to see if Chefs is going to pick up Richter on this rotation or if we're going to see a clean rinse and repeat from the side of what if, because I would assume that they're going to lock that down. Going to start by picking up the Drongo and then there is that Richter to take it away. Still does leave other long range CCs available to him. They could pick up the Argus here for what if. They could also pick up the Decker if they felt fit. Yeah, I think Richter's a really, really good pick here for Chefs. You know, it's it's going to take away the, the Rampage Rick combo that What If used so well last game. Pinzo had a lot of really, really good plays with that. He was kind of playing out of his mind. He had a really nice ultimate over at the, the Mini Prime, and that started to really make some people sweat, me and me included in there. It, uh, it was interesting, but, you know, I'm, I'm curious what they're going to do here now with the Twin Blast pickup that's going to give uh, Neo his, his pull away that he needs and stuff and a little bit more is maneuverability and we'll see what the bands come up here as i wouldn't be surprised to see them target the mid lane out of the side of what if here as that hasn't been locked in for chefs but i gotta tell you i think seismic can really play just about any hero wouldn't be surprised to see him return to that countess even though i know you advised against it we're gonna see the quang taken away as dr flick was looking pretty strong with it early in the countess ban as well so skype hamster not wanting to play into that counter as well seismic's gonna have to go to his second option 
Yep, yep. And with the Quang Quang ban and Countess ban, you know, you're not seeing a lot of a lot of picks from last game stuff here. But the Chimera for the well, this is interesting. So are they gonna go rampage support here with the Chimera jungle, maybe? Rampage offlane is gonna cook, I bet. I bet you this is Flick on Rampage offlane. I don't know for sure. Maybe he's playing Chimera. I think if you have to take one of these two into the offlane or into support, Rampage is the one that you move around. We got a highlight really quick. We did have Shinbi and Gadget picked up. Gotta talk about how great the Tesla Dome on top of the Coliseum is with the Zaurus and Gadget combo. But all of my attention right now is on what if and where they're going to put these heroes. Yeah, I just I just don't see it. I know Dr. Flick, he was big on Rampage in the offlane in, in Overprime, but he's not the same that he is in Predecessor. So he might have a little bit of a rude awakening here uh, discovering that, but with the Decker pickup, good. That's that's great. You know, you see the Zaris and Gadget, that's going to be a monster combo with the Drongo Silence in there. There's a lot of outplay potential on both teams right now, but that Rampage is just a, just a big question mark we see. And that is the draft right there. Lance, we're looking at this Rampage, you and me both, um, and and the Chimera as well. It sounds like you're leaning towards the Rampage offlane, is that correct? It is, but either way, these heroes are giving up their passive by taking them outside of the jungle for the most part. Yeah, you can kind of stand behind the fog wall if you're Rampage and get some of that health regen, but it scales up the longer that you're in it to a certain point. And I know that the enemy team's name is Chefs, but it feels like what if they're the ones cooking here? I think the burner might be on a little too hot. I agree. But now we're looking at the Chefs team comp though. What are you seeing from them, uh, Ed? I see a lot of uh, a lot of team fight potential here again with the Zara's gadget combo that's really strong. Shinbi into that rampage. I think she's just gonna poke him to no other. You know, she's just gonna be able to press Q over and over and over, and it's gonna peel that rampage down. And I think Flick might have a really hard time doing it. But again, there's not a lot of outplay potential on the Gideon here. I think Skype is going to have another really impactful game. I, the most they're going to be able to do is put a dome on there and hopefully hit a pole with the Richter. But if Skype can avoid that and play his abilities at the right time, he's going to be really strong. He's going to be a fun one. Game number two, ladies and gentlemen, what if they win and will chefs cook up in the kitchen? Ego and Falcon, take it away. Gamers, welcome back to game two. We got what if, we got the chefs, we got Ego rocking out with you, but never rocking alone alongside me. I got the man, the myth, the legend, Frowkin. Are you excited to see what these teams are cooking up? I'm excited to see what Dr. Flick is thinking right now. Don, there is the Rampage offlane, as Desk did say. I was personally thinking it might've been in Chimera, but it looks like Dr. Flick is going for that Rampage instead. And um, I'll be brutally honest, Ego, like I normally am. I don't like it. I don't see the point in it. I don't understand why they would go for something like that when you know you're playing Minions against the Simbi. And I don't see a world in where Dr. Flick can actually do anything this game. I have to agree with what you're saying here, man. I don't like it comparable to what other options were even open. Bringing it in and bringing in against a Shinbi especially, it's going to be very difficult, especially scaling out of that early and mid game. I do think Dr. Flick, as well as all of these players, are high caliber players, so maybe they're just seeing something that we're not quite seeing, but I definitely do think the Sneaks has just such a strong advantage within the solo. Yeah, it does really give Sneeze a free lane. There's not much pressure coming out of Dr. Flick. He hasn't got that much good CC. He ha uh, sorry, Wave Presser. He's got good CC to deal with any sort of ganks that come in the way. And if Crassy does want to focus down Sneeze, I could see that happening. But, I mean, this allows Sneeze to just basically farm from range like we've seen already. Crassy is going for level 2 jank though. Yeah, we do know that Blink is going to be up, so the kill potential here is going to be the greatest as the ambush does come down. Sneaks instead is going to find their way out of that engagement, more than likely taking this time to back and reset, giving this rampage, all things considered, a little bit more time to farm up. 
it does look like that is what its game plan is to just focus down this solo side have the cc from the rampage help the chimera do the uh, counter jungling as we can see and i mean yeah dr flick can counter jungle as well he's obviously is rampage he has got that passive to help him do that extra clear and we'll have to see how it goes either way they do have the advantage in this off lane now sneaks is gonna have this a time in this lane considering he is still level one compared to dot flicks level three who is just going to be starting back now the question is what can mav do on the rest of the map i'm assuming that mav is going to be putting some pressure on the mid here as we see zars making a rotation out towards sky pamster but getting very smart he's just going to play the space a little bit closer to that fog wall lock himself down a river buff and now with the rotational help coming he's going to be pretty safe and pretty well off i'm kind of excited to see how like last game these team fights develop within the early we saw what if get a lot of value as they're going to burst down some of cold's hp on the edge of that tier one tower it's going to be a hard lane definitely for Zeehee and Colts into that Decker trim blast. It's going to be a lot of damage. And if Zeehee misses that whip blast, it's going to leave Cold for the dead. And it might even force a blink out if, um, sorry, Pinzo can look for a continued stun. Dot Flick is just going to go for maybe a walk. But another thing I want to point out, Mav didn't counter jungle. So he's actually massively behind compared to Crassy right now. Is looking for that sign buff instead. Might just try and take it for himself. So he has at least some sort of farm coming on. But Dr. Click is still around. The hunt does go through though. Yes, indeed, man. And this is kind of what we saw last game, right? Crash, he gave him a little bit of a lead. What if potentially maybe getting a little bit of momentum with him the early, but now we're going to see Sky Pants looking to capitalize on that. As Crash, he does make the rotation. It's going to be a blink and it gets burned in exchange for another. As First Blood, yet again, is going to go in the pocket. So, what if? Just a good heads up play by Crashy, knowing that Seismic had no mana. And Seismic just walking down onto that area there meant that he was bound, basically guaranteed to die because he had to blank out already. But that wouldn't have taken him far enough into the tower. So Crassy and Skype can follow up. They did use both of their blinks and they're being punished. Oh, man, Crashy getting punished, but not put down as at sub 100 HP. He is going to survive. You know, the Rip Flash is ready. And as it goes out, it brings nothing back in as Z, he and Cold are just going to be playing the space around the tier one tower of Neo and Pinza. It's interesting that Cold and Z, he actually managed to get the way to the tower. It should be the case that Neo and Pinto have all the, the pressure in the world in that duo lane, especially with the double race advantage. So I'm not exactly sure how that happened. It might have been a bounce back by purpose. Hard to really say because we have both junglers on this side of the map. Crassy is finally doing this blue buff five minutes into the game. So that's um, I've been waiting there for quite a while at this point in time. And I mean, considering he got two camps outside of mouth he's still the same level so i'm not exactly sure what he's been doing outside of that first blood yeah, and I, I, in retro side, I actually do like that first blood play a lot, knowing that, hey, I got this ambush loaded up, and if you want to blink, then I'm going to be on top of your head, regardless of blink for blink exchange at the worst, a utilization of the ambush at best, regardless, both of those equal out to first blood, and maybe an opportunity for this team to be able to build a lead, but this time maintain it. Already, we're going to be seeing Crashy making a rotation back to Seismic, who, once again, does not have the blink as it's already been expended. Looking to run away now, it may May not be fast enough. The burst flower utilized. Seismic is all but guaranteed to go down here. But Mav might have something to say for that in exchange as the ambush comes out and Seismic may make it out alive. But with the jump on coming out on the rampage, it is going to be the behemoth who's going to be able to lock down the secondary kill for what if. What if does have two junglers? If the first one, the first one's gank doesn't work, just send in the second one to get a nice kill onto Seismic. Once again, I love Swipe hamster just blown up the blast flower as the whip blast comes through. Yeah, but no value gotten here in an exchange. It is going to be a burst enabled by this cage. And with C, he being dropped below that 50% threshold, there was an opportunity for a kill to go there. But Neo, low on man, and Pinzo, low on HP, don't want to overextend and give some wind into the sails of the chefs here. Duo hasn't actually backed for what if yet. I think if they had backed a bit earlier, obviously the lane might not be in that state, but they should have had the arrows to kill it. Either way, they have finally gone for that back. I hope 
Neo is going to be building better this game compared to the last game because they really need that to happen. But either way, I do expect still that penetration build to come through. Seth's in general aren't the tankiest uh, team, especially with Steve's on at that Simbi this game. So penetration should be especially lethal on this Twin Blast. Yeah, being able to penetrate some of that armor and HP that some of the other members are going to have as Sneaks is going to be looking for a disengage here. Crashy, hoping to close the space. He's going to use the ambush, but the boulder able to follow it up. It is going to be a forced blink burned out of Sneaks as he's going to have to run underneath the tier one. It's actually surprising they haven't gone for a gank on Sneaks earlier because that was just a perfect time for that thing to come back up. If they did it a bit earlier, they might have been able to get a guaranteed kill on Sneaks. Either way, there is a bit of counter farming once again happening on Crassy, but with Mav on this side of the map, they don't want to risk going for that blue buff. And Pinzo, once again, might be in danger. Riplash out, and it is going to find purchase this time in combination with the Dragonade. It is going to guarantee some solid damage onto the Decker. Nonetheless, with that blink being up, it was all but certain that Pinzo was going to be able to get themselves out of that situation. But this is something that has to be touched upon as we've seen it across every PCC game that Richter is present. Yeah, when that Riplash is down, he's a lot less scary, but the ability to pull you in close, lock you down, and basically guarantee damage for his carry can be so lethal within these games i'm gonna be honest i have just paid attention to what neo has built and i'm crying inside um he's building all the components of stormbreaker didn't get the ironwood bow just considering he had the money to buy it and is not going into penetration against double maids plus a drongo that's a massive mistake i don't understand why he's done that um, obviously on here it's going to be really good against Mav and Zihi in this game once he gets that Scyther to online, but just, it's just bad. Yeah, but maybe can be made up here if Crashy is possibly able to pick up Seismic yet again, the damage coming up good, but it would be better if it was materialized into a kill as Skype is going to just play the wave and get some CS to scale himself into that mid game a little bit quickly. Yeah, it's coming up 10 minutes and there's actually been very little action on this map. No Fangtooth or mini points have even been looked at so far. Only those two kills that we saw in the mid lane as well have been picked up. And overall, I think this definitely does favor Seth's this slow game. Once they get that online, especially Sneaks, once he gets maybe two items online and just be a split Chris uh, menace, then Seth can do a lot more options. And I think what if, especially with this Chimera, need to look for these early engagements a bit more. Yeah, and we know that chefs within the mid game, they just become a completely different kind of force, knowing that they're going to be looking for team fights. We are now going to see Sky Panzer off the back end of one. They initiates Bleak in and then Bleak out, seeing that it was not working out for him. It is not going to be Z who's going to be able to wait at the pearly gates of the Decker cage before leisurely rotating his way onto that Fang Tooth. We see a grouping of blue. That's going to be the what if gamers making a rotation led up by Dr. Flick and Crashy. But do they they actually commit on to this Falcon. I don't think they do. I still think you need to wait for Skype Hamster, but there's not enough damage from the side of Seth to actually do this Fang Teeth in time. Dot Flick is going to be walking in, and all members are caught here. Yeah, we do see the old coming out of the gadget in order to maybe guarantee some space off of the back end of the behemoth being used as Zihi onto the backside is going to be able to circumvent some of the damage looking to come in. But Dr. Flick going in along with his team is going to watch as Crashy is going to be the first one to fall. Nonetheless, Zihi also very low is going to be able to continue surviving now, turning his attention onto the other side of the pit. We're going to see Sky Panzer and Dr. Flick both looking for a way out as it's going to be cold and sneaks on the rotation why did Crassy hit the fang tooth he was on the heart under half hp he was going to take more damage than he was going to regain with his passive mav just walked in used the spear and killed him and then that was the lost team pipe of what if that made i'm sorry my brain just lost some brain cells watching that um going back to it though no fang tooth has actually been taken from either side Sneaks did gain a lot from that gained multiple waves on his own is actually uh, a level ahead as well from dr flick and has managed to counter jungle as well 
So although there was nothing gained, Seth definitely allowed Sneaks to gain as much as he could in that phase. And look at the rotations. What if they're going for this early uh, prime instead now? Yeah, turning their attention onto a neutral objective. They're not going really to be able to secure positioning for it, but with the damage they have, it feels like they potentially could just pick it up. And seeing that, that Fangtooth is it being pulled onto the other side of the map, this is looking like we may have a team fight stirring over here as map makes the rotation over, but it's not going to be able to get the Miracle Steal. The Necker Cage comes down, as does the layer. Now it's going to be a Colosseum, but it is not going to be enough to save Mav as he is going to be the first one to go down in this engagement. See, he, with the hat on, makes a blink over it is now going to be able to complete another kill courtesy of Seismic. Looking at a two-to-one trade here, Frauken. But that for another one. Pinto's going to go down. Sneezy catches him under the tier two tower. Does a bit of BM for extra thing, um, problems. Skype is also nearly caught. The Riplash does go wide for the torn space. Dot Flick is also here. But on his lonesome, there's not much he can really do. There's going to be a tier one tower on the side of Cess. And Zihi got a perfect three man skewer under the Tesla Lope. And that's oh just God. caused a win for that team fight for Cess, even though Mav went down early. Hey, it feels like every team fight, whenever Richter is within a game, at some point I'm talking about the skewer, whether it's the engagement or midway through, you think you're an ADC or Ranger, whichever you would like to call them, and you're allowed to do damage. The answer is no. That Richter skewer, as you said, came up big and just kind of settling down the tempo of that engagement enough for the chefs to get some really solid value out of it. Yeah, they also gain that tier one tower. That means that they're going to be able to open up the jungle, go for a few more invades, and then eventually split these tier one towers as well. But I'm too, hasn't actually been taken yet. 14 minutes into this game. I want to actually really know what the longest time was before the first tank thief was taken. Because I feel like we're getting to that stage at this point in the game. Both teams not really caring for it. And once again, Cess do like this scaling game. They have got that Sibley that is going to go into a monster. You know who Cold is. He doesn't need introducing at this stage of the game. And even Mav, Zaris does good scaling with his ultimates. Yeah, and speaking of scaling, it looks like Mav is looking to drop down some of the HP, but with a rotation coming out of a couple of teammates, is he at least going to be able to get a trade? And the answer is going to be yes, as Cold is going to actually be the one who secures the kill with Crashy getting it back on to Mav here, a one-to-one -one trade almost at 15 minutes into the game, Falcon. Maybe just a bit too aggressive by Mav there. I think that he was looking for something when the rest of his team was not. And him dying there basically meant that Seth cannot look for this Fang Chief. Obviously, with Sup Hamster also dead, what if can't do that either because the Tesla Dome is in such a scary position at this stage of the game. And once again, we're going to go back to farming, going to go back to picks. This is going to continue into um, Bully. Uh, Dr. Flick, I think that's the only really way of saying it. And actually, it's gone for the Obelisk, which I really like. Just adds another scaling aspect to the Simbi and means that it's just going to be a lot harder for anyone to really duel her. Truly means that damage is going to be uncapped. As we predicted it at one minute, and we're seeing it on our way to 16. Shouldn't be able to bully within the solo lane. As we see a big riplash within the duo. It's going to be a force blink, but by using his blink in the Trongo ultimate, it's going to be a kill for Cold. Cold ain't letting that one go. Skype Hamster nearly got away, but the riplash was so good. Able to blink out just in time as well, but the shrapnel cannon is going to be more than enough damage if that way slides the passive going. And with Skype Hamster dead, they are going to finally start a fang to 16 minutes into this game. Brassy, Pinzo, and Neo are all around, but this is going to be an outnumber for the side of Seth's. We've seen Crashy get a miracle steal here within the past, I think, just one game ago. As now, he's going to be able to bleak in. But with the Tesla Dome down, he is all but guaranteed to fall. As he, he is also oh very close, but close isn't quite in the PCC 7. You're looking for a spot within the finals. you got to be able to steal those, those skills. As the Whiplash is going to come out, Pinzo playing the space the best he can is at least going to be able to get a trade and turn this into a two for two near the Fang Tooth. That's not too bad to decide what if. Yes, Seth gained that Fang Tooth, but because of how late it is, it's not going to be the massive factor in this game. Dr. Flick also got the 1v1 against Simbi. I really wanted to see how that happened because I'm not sure how you kill 
Simbi as a Rampage, unless there was some sort of tower dive situation happening. So good play for Dr. Flick there. Asti um, making these going to be a lot more delayed in this game now as well. And I mean, Pinzo was just out of position as well, um, during that fight as well. I think he stood back off with Neo at the end of that team fight. And what if also used a lot of blinks to escape at that Coliseum. So Seth do have the advantage for the next couple of minutes in terms of engagements. And that's I mean, something it if you, feels pretty equal. That's something that if you're a what if fan, you never ever want to hear the chefs have the advantage. We've seen the without the advantage just take these fights around. This point into the game, 17 going on 18 minutes, even earlier than that. They just get comfortable fighting while Cold is farming. And then when he makes a rotation, the man is something of a Thanos himself. The damage feels inevitable. And they're going to definitely need to find a way into that late game that we're making our way to of how they're going to be able to bring sufficient heat onto cold in order to take them out of some of these team fights for Alkin. It's going to be hard. It's going to be a CC chain, or it's just going to be a free man rotation onto cold. We're seeing uh, the fight in solo lane, but cold is going to be very, very low. It actually goes down to stripe hamster. So that is how you're going to deal with that. Does send more men at him than he could handle. However, this does open up a spot for this mini pine to be taken for the side of Cess. Grassy is in mid, but he's also getting quite low. Yeah, look into just disengage there it is gonna be a redirection as you said onto this mini prime taking a couple gamers over and being able to increase their neutral camp objective but it's not going to be completely free as on the other side of the map we actually see what if putting down a split push to take the tier one and then i'll at least threaten the tier two I, they can get this tier 2. I actually don't think this is a bad trade whatsoever for what if. They gain the shutdown on cold. They gain two towers. And it will depend on how much Cess can actually use this mini prime. Because the only real big objective that they can go for is either that mid tier 2 or the all prime themselves. There's no tier 1s left to decide what if to actually take. Or to be taken, sorry, at this point in the game. So for what if to gain two towers plus a shutdown is not a bad trade whatsoever. Yeah, and you know, this is what the best teams or the best caliber players do. Even when things aren't looking great, you take something from it. It's an old phrase. Whenever life gives you lemons, you take their carries life. They're tier one and they're tier two. And you patch your pockets with a little bit of gold after you successfully do get it back. But we have yet to see what the chefs are going to be able to do with this mini prime, as you pointed out, Falcon. If they're able to derive some solid value of it, it could make it a long-term negative trade for what if. Is that the saying? Is that how you make... Uh, I think it is. I think, uh, my, my grandma told me that one. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, Life gives you little and she killed the carry. Player as well. mm -hmm. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. yeah she's All a good. developer. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. Makes sense. But either case, uh, what's going to be interesting about yeah. well, is has got the uh, mini prime buff and he's just going to continue split pushing. So they need to send someone to deal with him because he will just take inhibitors instead of just looking for a fight. Yeah, it is going to be the big double skewer once again. However, it's not going to be nearly enough as we're going to see Richter get eradicated with the damage coming out of the black hole in combination with the rest of what if right now. We're looking at a 1-0 trade, but with Dr. Flick looking for some medical attention, we may see a turnaround as cold. It's going to catch the heat. Mav now looking Mav. forward, engage. He's going to be able to use the Coliseum. The Spear of Nier is looking to Mav. send his opponent far back the base, but Enzo is going to at least be able to get a trade as the hat lowers her into the grave we're looking at a three to three train Mav just completely taking that fight on his own some the Colosseum catching free using that barricade to get the stun the epoch managed to keep the side of Skype hands to life for just a little bit longer but that was not enough he got multiple kills in that situation Steve's also got the tier two tower in the solo side as well seismic might get this tier two tower in the um so the side sorry the sticks took it in the duo side and i mean this is gonna be a big buff for the side of Seth in terms of just a gold influx and if they can trade that in for i mean second fantasy result oh but obviously you want to be looking at this whole prime at this stage of the game and i mean it's going to be interesting because if one team does go for this fantasy i expect the other team to just immediately run to the sword prime 100% man I mean if you want to take that do not mind me grabbing this for myself I would allow you to have a fang tooth here even if it is for the chefs letting them increase that up to a 2-0 differential swinging within their favor in order to get a lockdown onto that prime but 
in the mid lane. We're actually going to have a fight cooking up, if you will, as Sneaks is going to catch the back end of an ambush as well as a boulder. And Zihi is going to be left not completely alone because he has allies nearby. But they just used two big ultimates for the pick potential and they didn't even get a kill. Now this team fight that will happen is going to be in favor of Cess. Colosseum and Curse of Doom are both up. If they can catch it on the back line, what if I don't to die? Crashy going in for the engage. It's going to crash in the map. Who's feeling like a brick wall, but onto the back end. It is going to be Sky Hamster oh, oh, oh. who's going to put Zihi on the wheel. Cycles them as that's going to be three members down as of the shove. Now Crashy looking for a little bit more hunting. He's going to be able to find the Zaurus as Sky Master is going to be able to pick up the kill on the Seismic. Am I looking? Am I calling? Am I telling you that it's a 4 0 trade in favor of what if? Skype Hamster is just goated on Gideon. He had the perfect black hole over multiple members. The um, Echo Cage as well just managed to keep multiple people inside. There was no blinks. There was no epochs. There was no escape from the Gideon of Skype Hamster. This is going to be a all time attempt to see he and Cold are the only two members of Seth alive. There are multiple members of uh, What If that are Lodo. They might die just the all Prime. We talked about what there wasn't. What there is, is a rotation and a rip lash as that's gonna land and easily equate into a kill as now Richter's going to be looking for the portal. It's gonna be a big three bits. Your crashy is gonna be the second one to fall onto the backside. It is gonna be Dr. Flick who almost inevitably feels like he was going to fall there. Frauken, they go for the objective and three of them get killed off for it. Yeah, but they still got the all time on their two carries. This is easily worth for the side of what if they didn't lose the shutdowns either on a Skype hamster. Sneaks nearly stopped the back from him though, but they didn't lose that. They are going to trade out of this tank tooth, but it's only second tank tooth. Who really cares at this point in time when you can keep two people with all prime? They're going to, what if are going to have to be able to use it effectively to gain at least two towers, the tier one in mid and in solo to gain this gold back and if they do lose another team fight it is going to be bad to side assess um which will eventually take this tank tooth as we are seeing and yeah it's going to be a very close game from this 15 to 15 in kills i'm not sure what the farm is like and if scotty pamster can just do that one more time we might be going to a game three I would be oh so excited and extremely delighted to see a game three as Sky Pamster with his heroics throughout this game. Maybe looking to help push his team to that point with Mav now getting circled upon. It's going to be a Decker Cage, but the bigger Cage may win as Mav is going to be dropped low, but low is not enough. You have to be able to finish your kills, and he gets at least an exchange on it coming out of some fancy footwork. The kill going over to Crash in the skewer being landed upon him, followed up by the Rip Flash. He is going to get. Put down! Allied inhibitor is under attack. Just way too over aggressive from what if they thought they got the kit they picked. But Cold killed Sky Hamster. That is worth any of Steph's kills at this point in the game. And uh, Dot Flick is going to have to cover it for two different lanes. Pinjo is also in danger, but just like the side of Steph's dual lane are oh, just going to go back to lane. They're going to completely piss it up because there's nothing else actually on the map to take. And yeah, they can't afford to let Sky Hamster die like that. It's just. He is their main down source at this stage of the game. And without him, they just don't win these team fights. As this game has been so very close, man, 16 to 17 on the kill board, despite the Fangtooth being very firmly in favor of the chefs, you have to assume that what if are wondering a couple questions to themselves. Why not us? Why not now? On the precipice after having come so far they just need to win this game and extend it take it one game at a time and frauken with that in mind i want to ask you what does what if need to do to bring us into a game three as it may have to wait off the backside of the ambush coming out of crashy it's hard to really look at it's going to depend on what dr Fruit can do on this rampage steal like it's not been as diabolically bad as I assumed, but he hasn't really done anything that a Serog would have been able to do. And so, I mean, again, I just don't feel confident about this pick. And in terms of just a general game plan, there's no Fang Tooth, no Orb Prime being sp uh, spawning at this moment. They either need to just look for a pick onto either Sneaks or onto Seismic 
just when they are alone or continue farming up to a point where they can just overtake the game. They need Neo fed as well, but they might just be looking for sneaks. Yeah, they are going to find him as it's going to be Chimera instantly going in, crash, he finds himself, and oh, but now within a 1v3 situation, it's going to be a force used to bleak, but the spear of Nier is going to mark him and knock him even further, that is going to be a return to base, as the big rip flash is going to be able to hit, Sky Hamster using the Epoch midair is going to fall in more than one way, it is going to be a grouping coming out of Seismic Math and Zee, the Coliseum comes down, the blink comes out in order to buy space in life for the remaining members, so what if? Okay, you got the kill on Sneaks, yes, but you use so much resources to actually get the kill. Neo is not there himself, so you are going to be still in a 4v4 situation. And now, Seths have basically control to take this down. They still have multiple ultimates they can use. They haven't got the Colosseum, they have got the Skewer, they have got Cold. As a player himself, Neo has got good wave clear, that he should be able to deal with it. And the Cow Dive is not going to be good if they want him to whip last one through. The Ripplash yet again locking down what should be considered a guaranteed kill for Cole because when you're unmoving in the face of the chain, man, the carry and Drongo with those rat rounds doesn't miss those. Falling is going to be TB for another 30 seconds as the member map advantage is going to be in favor of the Chef's Falcon. And what they're going to do now, they're just going to reset. They don't need to push out this inhibitor anymore because they can get some more gold, they can get some more items, and they can look for the orb climb. Cold is 10 and 2 in this game. That is one of the scariest stat lines you can see on a player like this, especially on his comfort pick of Drongo. Has nearly got four and a half items at this stage, basically an entire item up compared to Neo. And yeah, as long as Cold is alive, what if can't do anything in this game? I have to agree with you, man, wholeheartedly. We knew from minute one that Cold was capable and just has been able to carry the team to wins when they have been behind. And now you've given him a lead. This stat block is absolutely unacceptable if you're looking to push yourself into a game three scenario. However, it's not over until the big lady sings and it's awfully quiet on the field as we're seeing the boulder get launched from the long range. It is going to be the Coliseum that has been expended with no kill squeaking. Either way, we can see what team is definitely the aggressor here is that the shafts are going to push what if out of their own jungle. Let's just have way more damage control compared to what if. That, as long as they use Mav or Zhe effectively, they can look for a pick and immediately burst it through. The third factive goes through, does go through. I'm going to get a team fight. Oh. It is going to be a black hole expended, but all of these members are falling too fast to cast on the back end. It's going to be the Epoch that gets used, but it is going to be inevitable. It's not going to be one, it's not going to be three. It's going to be an ace in favor of the chefs. What if Sunderland just can't exist in this game? The test alone plus the damage from cold is more than enough to completely spread through them. And Dr. Plague is the only one who actually built that tanky in this game as well. Crassy has gone for that more bruiser build that Basilisk into Berserk Sacks. And although he could do damage in this game, it doesn't matter if she can't survive it. And with all of that damage, they are going to take up to this all prime. They have multiple ways already pushing onto these inhibitors that they're going to get at least these two. They probably can't get the solo one before sight of what if are alive. And I can imagine them just now resetting, using that gold once again to get those last items that they need. And then there will be a one final push to see if what if can survive. Falcon, you wouldn't know that What If has the Rampage on their team the way they're getting rocked every single time they look for a fight. Somebody get the chimney cleaner because the chefs are just constantly looking for the smoke every single time What If has stepped up here within the last five minutes of these engagements. They've had these HP bars melted like butter in the pan. It is going to be an extremely tough defense they have to put up here in the face of what feels like an almost omnipotent omni present in all powerful chefs composition so chefs have basically got at this point in time which is probably not far off the truth of their damage source and i mean you see a cold going towards that viper last item just add a bit more penetration because why not at this stage let's let's see the rampage die in four slots instead of five so what if what 
they need to do at this point is make sure that the raids continue to be pushed out. They might be able to look for a pick on the sneaks, but they need to do it fast because they know exactly where they are thanks to the observing, seeing that ward there. And if they're not back in time, they're going to lose this last inhib. They probably lost it already. Yeah, that inhib is going to go down, and it feels like they may be following as it is going to be a boulder. And Ada stops on the aggression coming out of the rip lash. Just now, a circling, if not fish, not piranhas, but sharks in the water. See, he playing the space oh, so very close to that core line in case anyone has an eye or a mind to retreat. It's sigh, uh, it sneaks, it's cold, looking for a spot mm -hmm. further. But off the engage, it is now going to be getting, but with the pull down, he is going to be sunk as his HP is going to be delegated to the raise screen. However, onto the backside, it is going to be a good sign, a symbol of life. Nonetheless, it is going to be death at the end of it, as what if falls in the chefs take this series 2-0. And once again, as soon as we got into that mid game, as soon as we got to that 16, 15 minute mark, Seth just turned up. Mav was using the ultimate so effectively to make sure that he cuts the back line. Seismic was using Tesla Lobe over and then Cold was just putting on a display on why he should be called the best ADC player in this game. What if, unfortunately, they are now going to be eliminated and will be leaving the tournament? However, I think they did play well, especially in that early game. They just could not convert it into that mid-game. Against a team like the Cephs, that's nothing to feel bad about. 100%, man. These are tested champion caliber players. What if, though, gave a hell of a performance. So big ups to Crash. Give big ups to the entirety of that team. However, there can only be one. And those ones are going to be the chefs who are going to be able to carve that path a little bit further towards that championship seat. Great game, but I'm going to be honest, I'm excited to see what the guys at the desk have to say. Thank you so much, Ego and Fralkin. My name is Ardog with the Triple G, and I'm back with the desk. I've got Ed here as well as Lance. That was game number two secured by the chefs. Unfortunately, we're not going to be seeing a third game. They're now advancing to our semifinals tomorrow at 11 a.m. Eastern or 5 p.m. CET. Be there or be square. Together with the professors and Dirty Lake and the boys. Um, looking at that game number two, it seemed like early game was piloted by What If. It was kind of similar to game number one. And Gadget just needed time to get her items and together in combination with the lockdown from Zaris and then the hooks from Zihi, the DPS from Cold and the pressure from Sneaks. The chefs are a scary team. What were the highlights from game two, Lance? So for me, the highlight for it is the way that once a certain point was hit in both games that the chefs just kind of took it over i saw it in chat i hate to steal content from it but it does kind of feel like what if lost to the item shop there a little bit at the end of the game only one tier three magic resist item built on the entire team and it's on dr flick while they've got two ap players they've got an ap offlaner like you got to build some resistances against that but overall really good performance out of chefs there they did not go down without a fight indeed. But Ed, what were your ob observations during game number two? Man, Zihi is a monster on Richter. Some of those pulls, I mean, he I don't know if he was doing some matrix moves and going through minions or what the case, but he brought Neo to a lot of fights and it was, it was, it, you can learn a lot from that guy, that's for sure. Now I see why Cold replaced him with me or me with him. <laughs> That was pick. a GG. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> that was definitely a GG um, for, for both sides there. But exclamation point bracket will take you to a link to take a look at our tournament here at PCC. This is PCC number seven. You're seeing the best of the best of the best. But that was just our third quarterfinals of the day. We still have one more to go. Indecisive versus The Hive, coming up next after the break.
Welcome back to the desk, everybody. My name is R-Dog with the Triple G, your host here at the PCC, and I'm joined by our desk analysts, Ed and Lance. Let's take a look at the current bracket. We're now watching our last series of the day. Today was just banger after banger after banger. Lance, tell the people about the bracket. So for the bracket, we've got a first really good semifinal coming up. We've had Prof and D-Lab B finals in the past. I believe that has happened multiple times. These guys keep running into each other. Both of them had pretty good series today. D-Lab had a little bit of a tougher opponent with Flow State than what professors had in P-Tab. And they looked very sharp in it. I expect that semifinals to be very, very good. And then whoever wins this next series has uh, also quite the mountain to climb going into chefs here. What we expect tomorrow is a lot closer series than we've had today. And I think that tomorrow is going to be potentially 20 of the best players in the game going at it against each other with the four remaining teams. 
it certainly will be nutty but now we're going into our last quarterfinals of the day this is indecisive versus the hive we gotta look at some numbers and and see what we're getting into these are some statistics from swiss and groups ed talk to us about them well looking straight from the top here the kda on indecisive is just I mean, it's almost twice as much as the Hive has. So you know that they're these guys are really good skilled players, in my opinion. It's almost unfair. They've got two of the dev team players on there. Uh, the objectives, you know, import is running that jungle. God King import, you know, you know they're all about the Raptors. Everything else, you know, going down from from there. Uh, the gold per minute, the damage, and the CS per minute are all pretty similar. But we know who Neft is, and the dude just has perfect CS in too many games. It's it's incredible. You know they're going to have a little bit higher average than most teams just because of that aspect alone. But now we're looking at some of these heroes. We got the most banned being Argus. And of course, we got the most picked being Belica and Kuang. Um, Lance, what else can you say about these uh, bans and picks? So the bans and the picks, it looks like there is a lot of mid lane priority for these. And I'm not super surprised to see that Argus during our Swiss and group stage before this last patch came out. Had, uh, where, where he did face a nerf, did feel pretty particularly strong into this. Bellica felt like the, the most consistent answer to him as well. So you see that being picked up a lot. And then Rizbro doing a lot of work, or I'm sorry, not Rizbro, Guru um, over here for the side of Hive, doing quite a bit of work on the Quang, one of his favorite champions. Nice to see Guru competing again and then getting the priority for the picks from his team. Don't be surprised to see Hive try to play through their solo laners with the way that these uh, teams stack into each other with their matchups. And we'll have to see what heroes they'll be picking. But going back to, to that Gideon, though, game after game, and we're looking at the broadcast, he's just been so good. Let's look at the statistics here, Ed. Well, pick rates almost 50%, ban rates is, is higher than almost any hero we've seen so far. So Gideon is just an absolute monster. His utility and everything else, just from the damage and what he can do, he is a game changer. We saw it in the last game with Skype Hamster just kind of putting the whole team on his back. I mean, he was the heart and soul of the damage and setting up team fights. Gideon's a, he's, he's a menace. So obviously he's gonna be a high priority from a lot of teams and, you know, with an Argus ban on both sides there, don't be surprised if Gideon is in two, if not three of the games that are played here. His ultimate just changes games and, and we, we saw that just like what you mentioned, but now it's time to look at this draft. Sorry, excuse me. Well, before we go into this draft, we got to take a look at our, our uh, predictions, excuse me. So we, we talked about indecisive a little bit, but what else can you tell us about them there, Lance? So indecisive has a bunch of ridiculous players on their team. Pretty much everybody on this roster is an all-star. We saw them a bunch during our Swiss stage, but I have to highlight the man and the myth. He has not won one, two, three, four. He has won five Feng Booth Championships. He's also won a PCC. The game is played through Neft when Indecisive is on the ramp, on the map. Yeah, Indecisive is just full of previous champions from PCC or whether that be from other tournaments. You've got Import, Neft, Shin, Morose, Q. Is that correct that you'll be locking in Indecisive for your prediction, Lance? I hate to do it to my boy Atomic, but with zero hesitation, I will not be wrong twice in a row. I'll take Indecisive. He's locking in, boys. But Ed, on the other side, what can you tell us about the Hive? I think Warps is one of the better ADCs in this entire game. Obviously, he's going to be with just making it this far in the tournament. But um, in my own scrims and everything else in my pub games with Warps, He's a gamer and a half, you know, he's going to be pretty close to Neft as far as everything goes, because Neft has the ping situation that all the EU guys seem to deal with, but still have lower ping than me. Must be weird. Um, Boinks is a heck of a support, too. I think that's going to be a really, really strong duo lane. Guru is a gamer, too. It's it, even though that Indecisive might be a higher skilled team and everything else. I do think that the Hive is going to be right there with them the whole time. 
who are you going to be predicting to win this series, Ed? I'm hoping for an upset today. I don't think it's going to be a 2-0, but I am going to have to take the hive. I'm sorry, Neff, you stood me up in Vegas. I'm not over it. I'm still salty. We're going to have to go to the hive. Oh, it's personal. <laughs> so he is going to be locking in hive, and that leaves me to choose between these two yet again. Um, I'm going to have to lock in indecisive. I think they're full of, of players that have previously won uh, a lot of tournaments, whether it be here in the PCC or at Fang Booth, uh, which is an EU-based tournament uh, for predecessors. So it's full of, of, of just gamers all around. You've got Import, Neft, Shin, and Morose, as well as Mankyu. So I think it's going to be, they're gonna show up today uh, for, for this series, but now it's time to look at the draft. We looked at the most banned hero being Argus. Lance, is that something you're expecting to see? What else are our priorities here? I, I do think with us playing on the most current patch that Argus probably isn't going to be prioritized ban wise. I would not be surprised if Hive goes the route of banning Shin's Bellica away from him. And we do see the Gideon taken off right away from Indecisive, which is one of Atomic's comfort picks. A lot of the time Atomic defaults to Countess if he does not have Gideon available to him. So I would be very surprised if we did not see not the ban that I saw. So I'm very surprised. I was expecting a Bellica here. We'll see if Indecisive takes it first rotation. What do you think, Ed? Go ahead, Ed. Oh, okay, Arnon, you looked like you were ready to jump on something. Didn't want to cut you off. But see, we, we have the Argus on the first pick here. Um, the Hive, knowing that Morose is very confident and strong with that Zaris ban, I, I feel like that's going to be a targeted ban there. Um, or it could be the fact that Zaris has just been been a heck of a hero through this time here. So Howitzer and Drongo on the Hive side, this is a high damage team, you know, Howitzer right out of the gate is going to be able to do a lot of damage and he's going to be able to kind of counteract the uh the Argus clear too and it's going to be it's going to be a fun one in the in the mid lane but I'm going to give more of the uh more of the priority to Argus in it though interesting to see the wraith come through really early for indecisive too gonna put that over into the hands of Neff have the Argus locked up as well and the crunch picked through here so Pretty interesting so far. A lot of lockdown potential. You know, you got the rewind with the Wraith, all of the CC that comes in with Argus. You've got the forward crunch micro stun, or you got the forward crunch micro stun with the crunch into the knockup as well. I'm going to look to be answering. They're going to pick the Kalari up, which I am happy to see Kalari. We have not seen it yet today. Yeah, I think Crunch is kind of a pretty good counter to Kalari, though, so kind of a little bit questionable, but it's Nugslet. Nugslet is a really, really good jungler, arguably top three, if not top two. Um, with the Kwong ban here, too, there, there's a little bit of targeting going on back and forth, and Rampage out of there now, too, that's going to pretty much force Crunch into the jungle spot, in my opinion. I think so far, the, uh, the advantage is going over to Indecisive. I think so too. They're going to pick up the Decker to support the Drongo over here on the side of Hive. So that will most likely be Boink's piloting Decker. And now we get to reveal the rest of the team comp for Indecisive. It is going to be the patented Morose Grux here. And before this comes in, I'm going to try. I've seen Import play a little Iggy Jungle. He was playing it the other day on stream. It's going to be the Bellica, which is so disappointing to me. I was really hoping that it would come through. I'm glad that Indecisive has more respect for Hive than to play that. But that's going to be the Bellica. A lot of flex between Argus and Bellica for who's going to be mid and who is going to be support. It is going to hinge on probably... Actually, no, the Howitzer's already picked, so it's going to depend, depend on who they want to put it on either one is a good option right right and looking at indecisive draft they have a lot of cc here and a lot of damage too you know going into a kalari and howitzer i mean it's a great pickup by hive grabbing that severog as quick as they can but again the front line for indecisive and just the engage that they have with so many stuns and and just poke damage i think i like indecisive drafts a little bit better and talking I... about the draft, now that it's done, um, I'm going to uh, just ask you to, ex to just 
explore a little bit more. What is the engagement coming from Indecisive there, uh, Ed? I mean, they're, they're engaged just going to be an Argus lob. I mean, you can do it from pretty much wherever on the map, it kind of seems like. And once Crunch and Grux are on you, there's... You're, you just put your keyboard down, you're done. You can't do anything with it. And Necked on Wraith, he's going to just poke and poke, and you're you're done. Especially with how and, squishy that the hive is on this one. And Lance, what were you going to say about your thoughts? I know that they needed a frontliner pretty badly. I'm surprised to be Sev or to see Sevrog be picked up for Guru, especially playing it into the Grux. Grux is so aggressive early and morose it's it's his specialty character he's gonna just hold down the forward button and run at guru on this for the first couple of levels and if the several gets behind early it's so hard for him to catch up late because it takes so long for him to do it but we'll have to see if guru is going to be able to outplay morose here that's definitely going to be a tough matchup for him. Is he going to be able to, to scale into the late game as he becomes that raid boss that he is? But we're not going to waste any more time because we're going into game number one. This is a best of three series between Indecisive and The Hive. Take it away, TJ and Fralkin. Thank you so much, R-Dog. What a day of predecessor that we have had. All of these quarterfinal matchups. We've had stomps. We've had absolute bangers. We've had memes. And we've also had some entertaining gameplay as well. But of course, all good things must come to the end. It's the final quarterfinal series. It's a TJ and Frauken cast for this one. Frauken, I hope you've recovered from the uh, some of the drafting that you saw in that last series. And we have a bit more of a return to normality with, with these two teams. There's normality, yes. It's not Rampage offlane, so at least that is a benefit for my own sanity. But we still have a few interesting picks we have not seen today, namely this Wraith and Kalari. So we'll have to see what these two picks can do, because all I'm seeing across this entire board is comfort. Of course. I mean, when I look at uh, this indecisive... Um composition here is like with what we've been seeing that there are signature picks across the board right i mean odess already mentioned about morose getting their hands on his grooks import playing that crunch shin gets bellica neft gets that wraith and of course argus not really had the opportunity to see who that uh, particular flavor is likes to specialize towards but man q is a much a very much a capable support to get their hands on it but also hive as well a lot of power picks being picked up as well i think one of the picks wanted to highlight the most on was that jungle, the Kalari versus the Crunch matchup for Alcon. It's going to be an interesting one. I do think Kalari does lose the matchup, at least early game. But once Kalari can get online, get that melody, and look for those assassinations, especially around that level 6 mark, then it could easily snowball. And I think that's what the entire, entire objective is. It does need to snowball this game. It'd be great if Nugslick can get the kills. But a character like Warps, or a player like Warps, a player like Atomic can also do that. And Pouch and Drongo, we have already seen today how strong those can be. And again, they are both very comfortable on those picks. And also, well, with this Hive composition is like just in particular looking against Import with the Crunch Jungle as well. Some of these picks actually work so well into a Crunch, in my opinion. You know, this Howitzer, this Decker Cage, uh, and also the Drongo pick as well. So I think there's a lot of tools available for Hive to maybe deal with that. But of course, we know what sort of caliber of player Indecisive brings to the party. It's Import. If you haven't met him, he is... Probably the best jungler in the game, maybe the best knowledgeable player in this game as well, knows exactly what needs to be done at any moment. And an example of that is him starting blue. That meant that he was on the same side as Kalari, so if Kalari wanted to go for that cheeky level 2 game cap, you know Kalari's love to do, then he would have been in a position to actually counter it and look for something. But instead, I think Kalari's going to go for this at mid lane. He's got to be careful on this Bellico. One dagger's going to pop, and there's a blink being burnt as well as Death Mark is going to activate Shin. Take it down to less than 25 HP. Import is here, waiting in the wings. Got the double buffs as well, but Shin being a too low, I might think twice about this uh, re engage, but just in time for the three minute river buffs. 
Sin, losing that blink is very important because that means no slick can now look for those re ganks into that mid lane. And with Atomic on his house as well, using that landmine to maybe boop the Bellica outside of tower means that it's going to be an easy first blood if they want to look for that eventually. But again, Import is looking around. He has gotten quite a lot of HP, and no slick has no mana. It's going to be careful. He needs this blue buff. Import's going to go in and Import's going to steal away the blue buff. And he wants Nugslet as well. Pops the invisibility, but he's going to be definitely feeling the pain from that one. Morose was even here just to help in case things got a little dicey. There's no real need to talk about the solo lane. Morose is just going to have complete control over that lane for basically the entire time. Uh, maybe until first item that Guru can actually do something. So Morose using that presser, meaning that he can then rotate into the jungle to at least help Import if anything has happened because Atomic was looking as well because Sin had to return. And just going back to this uh, duo late, I actually really like Manku on the Argus. I think he does the best on these made type supports. He doesn't do as good on the Victor or on the Steel. So just having that Dread Nova into Ness combo is going to be very, very uh, lethal against the likes of walks and boinks and we'll have to see if they want to look at that in the early game i think this is also our first game of wraith that we have seen on broadcast today as well and also in the hands of neff this is a pick i think that as soon as when wraith released this was a pick that neff just gravitated towards this is such a mechanical player i mean there have been so many shouts about the best adc in the game cold has got a lot of fans but i'm just gonna put my uh, hat out for neff there but of course you know i'm showing my eu bias here atomic Pumping into uh, Import and Shin in the river as well. But Neff is over here as well with the peekaboo. Atomic having to burn the blink. Containment fence comes down. Able to at least disengage. But that's another crucial blink on cooldown. And that's both mid laners throughout blink as well. So that is going to be a very interesting lane to at least keep an eye on. Especially when the likes of Import and notice that it gets that level six we see the dread nova come through warps oh, taking wow. so much damage just from that one cc and that's just what this lane is going to do for indecisive well, actually warps able to return a fair amount of damage on towards man q dropping down to about 80 mana so might only have one or two abilities left in his tank before he has to uh, go back to base but Neff still Having the confidence with that health advantage as well. Shin, no, very far pushed up. Gonna bump in towards Nugs. It does not have the blink, remember. Shin just needs to outplay this, needs to get the Duke boots on, maybe go over towards his duo lane. He's simply just gonna retreat, doesn't turn around, but left hand side. Neft gets first blood on his Wraith pick against Boinks. Atomic using that landmine just completely missed Sin. That basically meant that Sin could easily walk away. Nuxlet is looking for Neft. He is alone, but instead knows that the Fangtief is also happening. Is only level 4. There is nothing that Nuxlet can really do in this situation. Oh my word. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. Nuxlet thought he had an opportunity to get the pick on towards Neft, but the communication comes out. You actually had indecisive pull away from the early fang tooth just to collapse and get the pill kill on towards nugs it does delay a little bit they have pulled away from the fang tooth but putting out the kalari behind more than worth it it's actually really interesting to see because i know we've thought about it a lot tj in these upcoming weeks that inner slices team play has not been good the communication seems to have been not mm. exactly there and plays like that so it, a completely different team in the size of are immediately reacting to what's happening to the rest of their players on the map immediately pulled away from the fangtooth and helped get the kill onto no slip yes they might have been able to boost fangtooth but they would have lost neft in that situation maybe so they played for the safer play got the extra kill and made get Neff a extra assist as well which means that he's going to be even further ahead which is going to be great for the mid game it's going to be so difficult as well for Warps and Boinks to play into that. I mean, we talk about what happens when an Argus support is able to get ahead, starts to roam, starts to rule this map. But now we're going to be combined with getting a Wraith ahead as well. Those knock-knocks on these, let's face it, relatively squishy members of the Hive team as well. It's only Mr. Guru on that Severog who is the remotest uh, close to being classed as a tank here. 
And I mean, at this point, you're going to have to remember that he is leaning against the Grux on Morose, who is not going to give him any easy time whatsoever. Every single stack that Guru gains is going to be hard fought. And it's going to be even harder if the like of Morose is over here. Uh, Info is over here. He's only level 5, but should be getting to level 6 very, very soon. Just gets it from that minion as well. Nuxlet is not level 6. Import is really piling on the misery in this crunch now with the recrunch ultimate available. This is a forward dash. The one dagger goes wide, but the death mark procking. Import's gonna at least get away. I'm able to force Import out of the jungle. Tommy, though, bumping into Shin to the left hand side of that all prime pit as well. Not gonna result in any kills, but it's enough for Hive to get Import away from jungle. And Nugslet finally gets himself a blue buff. A nice amount of damage actually being done on the import there. I was surprised at how much that was really happening. I'm assuming the import is going for that more damage oriented build. Morose is going to be a good frontliner with him, so he doesn't need to go full tank on at this crunch. And um, yeah, that's a lot of damage. Wow. Yeah, warps went so low. I think Neff actually missed the killing blow from that knock knock. That would have been uh, lethal, at least on towards the deck of support. But once again, this duo lane's causing problems for Hive. I mean, it doesn't look like he has to back it up either. So he didn't have his ultimate available, which probably would have guaranteed the kill again. And yeah, just this lane doesn't look fun to play against. I've seen it happen in the solo queue. No. And I've seen it happen in competitions. Uh, competitions. It's just, it's just not fun. No, it can be a very brutal one as well, especially when you're able to hit those shots. And you know, we mentioned about that setup, the Argus being played by Man Q. That was literally what a Dreadnova into a Peekaboo into a Knock Knock, and Boinks just lost their health bar in just that very quick exchange as well. So difficult it feels like for Hive to really get a handle of this game. Maybe that's why there's going to be a lot of pressure, I think, on Nugslet to maybe make this Kalari pick work. But the problem with Kalari is that you need a snowball. A Kalari that has only farm, no real kills, is not that much of a threat. Yes, he might be able to assassinate Neft in that later stage of the game or Sin. But if he doesn't do that early on, Intercise can gain just a lead. That likes of Import and Morose will just kill everyone on the side of Hive. You can see Import making, attempting the gank on towards the mid lane, but a good landmine coming out from Atomic. As we mentioned uh, earlier on in the cast as well, about how much of a difficult time that this crunch can have against this hive composition. I want to maybe dive a little bit further, Frauken, in towards the hive composition. I mean, we're approaching the 10 minute marks. They find themselves two kills down at least, with both of them over on this duo lane. I'm just having a look here as Atomic, maybe thinking about the rotation, actually going to walk, take this route round to actually avoid the ward as well. So I don't think Man Q and Neff are actually aware of this as Atomic makes his appearance known. Landmine boots Man Q back towards him, but he's going to blink away into a great. Stasis bomb coming out from points and Atomic gets the kill, but it's not going to be for free because there's kills on the other side. But we're staying here over on the left hand side. There's Neff, Acid, Knock Knock, Joe, but no one's there to respond. He's going to get his second kill of the game. And now Atomic body blocked to high hell and back. Shin is here as well. Neff literally just needs to connect the dots, connect the shots. And that's points dropping as well. Neff fights two in the river outside Fangtooth. And the solo laner got nuts as well. That means that the mini pipe is going to go over to import as well. And there's going to be no eternal. Maguru is tanky. Yes, he has HP, but there is no way you're dealing with two bruisers like that. And I just want to go back to the start of that play. I don't like where Man Q went with his blink. I understand him wanting to try and link up with Cinder, but he should have gone maybe into the um, corridor behind by Fangtooth instead. This would have given him a bit more time to escape and would have been able to block at least to make it rain for for a bit longer. But it didn't really matter. Mm. The two man knock up from Sin was monumental. The newer disruptor to take down Warps meant that only Atomic was actually doing damage, and Sin and Neft were more than enough to take him down. A great start for the side of Indecisive, and with that mini fun, they can now start looking for these advantages. Arguably the strongest uh, start that they could have hoped for as well. But now Hive, it's their turn to try and make a play. There's a big grouping in towards this mid lane. Boinks trying to get a handle on towards Mankyu. 
Not gonna find it. No, Nugs, it was there as well. Three members grouping up for the hive as well, but indecisive. Just playing back, kind of weathering the storm at the moment. Maybe this is where we look towards neutral objectives. You know, that Fangtooth is still in play. Neither team has really made a move towards it though, but Mankyu hits the dread. Nova warps, having to blink away. Knock Knock comes through, and Mankyu's got the obliterate ultimate. Warps is down, but Ness now in a one versus two, and there is his blink guillotine to follow from Nugsley. He wants this shutdown, he wants this kill, but Mankyu's dread Nova by so much time. And Neff needs to hit the shots. Nugsit on the retreat. Import will be soon be here to the left hand side as well. Nugsit needs to hit his daggers, but Neff just knew where he was. What is that spidey sense, my friend? Nugsit is down and now with an import is over here to finish up the kill. Takes down Boyks and this duo lane falls on the left hand side. Never underestimate the spider senses of an ADC when you're trying to find a Kalai. Neff will always sniff you out. That is the first tower taken from Indecipher as well. And it looked bad. Neft used that blink really early. Yes, they killed Warps. Noxlit did have that malady online, did have that level six. He was able to do a sizable amount of damage. But just thank you, creating enough space with his abilities. And that Neft had a chance to at least escape for a while. And with the extra damage that allowed him. This is going to be an extra few kills in the side. So the first Fang Tooth, albeit quite late in this game. And Sin, although three man ganked in the mid lane, is still alive. Looks like it's still on the hunt though. As a Shin can't afford to start lazy recalling in between towers. You still have to respect where that Kalari could be. But it's going to take the opportunity just to take away a little bit of Imports Jungle as well. But I'm seeing Indecisive start to have a bit of a grouping up. The dual lane has now moved over to the mid lane following and taking down the tower on the left hand side. Maybe trying to siege here. Maybe open up this map a little bit more. And just checking on Morose as well. I kind of could maybe we could be forgiven for thinking we've not even had a solo lane in this game. It has definitely been an island, but Morose. Linking up with Import once again. Got a lot for the smash and grab, and Bashi has found himself and nugs it. He gets to the Blast Flower, gets a bit of distance. Morose actually takes a tower shot, nugs it, guillotines away, but into the waiting arms of Morose, who was there, and takes him down with a crush. Morose has two kills this game. Both of them are towards Nugslit. Goo has not actually died this game yet. And um, yeah, that's not his jungle anymore. Morose can easily push in the wave, rotate into that jungle, and with the help of Import, is going to just, just take away multiple things. Warps is now also in danger. Sin is around, but it is a one-on-one. -on -one. Warps is still got a decent amount of damage. Has got that Vanquisha online, only a level down on Sin as well. But look at the river buff, uh, river lane. Neff might be getting caught by two. Yeah, Boyx and Atomic trying to find it, but Man Q is there, the bodyguard for Neff so many times already in this game. He's just there to get Neff the way. He even picks up the uh, Black River buff for himself. Well, to give himself some of that movement to get away. All members are going to leave the area. It's 15 and a half minutes gone. We need a one Fang Tube, one Mini Prime taken as well. The towers are falling. Indecisive really are starting to close the vice on Hive. It's a very, very strong early game from your team on Dawn's side. And I mean, it's going to be very easy for Indecide to also snowball this, especially with the Crunch and a Crux in this game. And another thing I want to mention that we haven't really talked about, man. Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, Nugget, it's... Yeah, uh, Nugget, it's just gone, my friend. I, I can't really add more than that, unfortunately. Just a collapse coming in from the mid lane as well. And I think this maybe links into that composition Falcon that Indecisive has. There is so much pick potential here. Any member out of position or even just caught unawares, it's most likely dead. Yeah, um, I saw Man Q walk up. I didn't see Sin behind, so I just thought Man Q was doing a little bit of light trolling on his team. Speaking of light trolling, Sin is going to be mm -hmm. falling here, but the Epoch is going to be used. Make it rain coming down as well. Having to throw everything and the kitchen sink at it, but they will at least take down Sheer and the kill does go to Atomic as well. Hive still signs of life in. And maybe that's the angle I want to go for here, Frauken as well. I mean, Hive have got quite a huge task to try and get back into this game. Where do we think they're going to look to try and do that? They really need to get the shutdown, especially onto Neft. If they can get a decent um, kill with the help of Luxley and Atomic, just doing so much damage. 
then that will give a good snowball chance, especially if they can do it just before the Fainty or the Mini Prime does spawn. But Indecisive aren't giving them a chance. Left is playing so the safe. Just push out lane and immediately dipping out with his invisibility. Import is going to help Royce take this first tower in the off lane. That means he's going to be now unlocked for this second Fang Tube if he so wants, because Royce is just going to have a presser. And if this mini prime is given over to Neft, good luck. Well, this is something that Indecisive like to do as well. And you can see Neft has got that purple hue around him, giving him bonus damage as well for the next couple of minutes. That is frankly obscene what this wraith can do as well and a really you know for the side of, of the hive as well kind of fighting shadows at this point indecisive just moving around the map so cleanly and just taking whatever they please it really does look like they just turned up for game day this indecisive squad and i mean it's interesting to see because the hive are not bad players whatsoever luxley is one of the best junglers in north america so just having this performance on his signature pick like Kalari is kind of shocking, honestly. And we'll have to see what they can look for next. I still think they'd basically look for Ness pick because they would remove the mini prime mm. as well as just Neff from this field. But you need multiple members to do that. And Neff is just playing so well with this team, especially Manku. Yeah, Manku on Argus and also Shin on this Bellica as well. Another one of these picks that uh, has had a bit of a mixed bag today, I think that's fair to say, where some teams have just simply let the Bellica through, but of course still remains a high priority for some. Nugs it though. Sending an opportunity to look for Neft. He's going to have to actually use his guillotine just to get to safety as the, the play is going to be called off. Four members of the Hive looking for a pick towards that mid lane as the Fangtooth will be spawning momentarily as well. But of course, Indecisive are here for it as well. They're going to start up their second Fangtooth. Nugslet moving over to the right-hand side. Looks like Hive might concede this second Fangtooth. As soon as they saw Nugslet old, they knew that there was basically no threat to Kalari. There was no way that Nugslet would have actually been able to walk in on that situation. So, a basically guaranteed Fangtooth from this side. You see Atomic has actually rotated into the solo side. So, they are going to get mm -hmm. a Tier 1 tower in response. But second Fangtooth for Tier 1 is going to be always advantage in the Scythe. And one more thing I want to mention is that Manku has gone for that Reclamation on the Argus, which I actually love. Because it completely stops the Decker engage with Rift Walk. Whoa! Whoa! I mean, Nugs that thought he was safe to recall, but Import was waiting behind the wings. A blink forward crunch, and the Hive jungler is back to their spawn once again. An allied tower is destroyed. Um, thanks, Import. I didn't finish my point, but I'm afraid that's just going to be an extra kill for this crunch. And they're just going to start prime on cooldown. Why not? They don't even have the duo over here. The Rose, Import, and Sin are going to just start it up, and Nugslet is dead for another 10 seconds. I don't even know if a Hive know this is happening. So this is one of the earliest Prime Pools that we have had. I think it was our second quarterfinal game where we had maybe an earlier one than that. But this was literally on court. They were also there five seconds before anyway. But all five members of Indecisive are here. It's all Prime taking a while to go down. Hive have at least arrived. But the Dread Nova stun does lands onto points. Onto Guru to have to back away. Indecisive don't overstay their welcome. Take the objective and get out of there. Just a perfect play from Indecisive, knowing what they can gain, knowing that there is zero reason to fight, even with a two-man stun with that Dread Nova. They didn't overpress, they didn't know where the rest of Hive was, and they know that it is much more important to get the five members with this Orb Prime buff out, compared to just getting maybe an extra one or two kills from Hive, because now the gold is going to really come in. Now they can push these last two towers. Now they can even look to see his inhibitors. And Neft has three and a half items at 20 minutes. Yeah, Mind Razor Vanquisher got that Demolisher online once again, looking to demolish some health bars as well of this uh, relatively squishy Hive team as well, wanting to stamp on the bugs as well. Dread Nova connecting from Manq, Nugslet also. Able, able to avoid being picked up as well, but Stin is here with an aura disruptor. Mancure obliterates oh and points is down once again, opening the door for the siege. Tier 2 tower going to fall as indecisive. Do not let up this pressure. It's like Mancure is just a second mage at this point. I saw him have time warp megacosm early. I'm not sure what else he's built since then, but don't forget this Argus is still an Argus. He still has plenty of damage, even if 
he isn't going to be the main threat on this team. Has got that level 9 as well. So if he has maxed that particle accelerator. But enough to talk about that. They're just diving. Yeah, Import just going for the play. And Neft is on hand to provide that damage. Warps is down once again. And Blink will come out the setback on towards Atomic. That, what, what was that damage coming out from the peekaboo from Neft? That was obscene. Need to put a uh, mature audience. It's only if we're going to show gameplay like that. Now, Mr. Guru has finally been uh, left alive for too long. And Indecisive going to cash in the kill on towards Severog. Right lane inhibitor going to drop an Indecisive. All five members just pulling apart the high base that was their tank tj that was their tank that's been farming for 22 minutes and died in three autos and there's three members left in the side of hive they're just gonna try and end i mean with five members with two mini ways underneath the core and with nep hitting like a truck they're just gonna take down multiple members it's a cherry on top but 23 minutes is all it takes for indecisive to pull apart this hive team and take game one yeah the calorie pick was not it zero seven and zero for no slip no kill potential whatsoever but i mean i've got two kills in that game indecisive from level uh, not level one but bomb first blood just controlled that game to a ridiculous standpoint and mm. i know tz that us two together we like casting stomps but that was a stomp <laughs> of a stomp yeah we can't really sugarcoat it more than that and uh as i said they you know i think definitely some questions to ask for the higher but i think that that's that sort of gameplay can't really be solved with a draft, really. I mean, indecisive. I, I don't know if they, they must have had their breakfast this morning. They must have turned up today when it mattered because that was just so clean from across the board, all five members. I'm, ab I'm absolutely astonished as well. But remember, this is a best of three series in the Hive. I think can be forgiven for maybe thinking ahead to game two during the latter stages of that game as well. We have got another match in this one left. But to break down game one even further, we're throwing back to the analyst desk. Thank you so much, TJ and Falcon. Welcome back to the desk. My name is Ardog with the Triple G. I am joined by Ed as well as Lance. What a game one between these two teams. The Hive and Indecisive. 23 minutes and Import just took over the jungle, whether that be his or the Hives. He did not care. This game was piloted by Indecisive from start all the way to the finish. They played with no mercy and the stop was unrelentless. Ed, what else happened during that game? I mean, it's the way of the road, you know? Sometimes she goes, sometimes she don't. And for the Hive on that one, she don't go. Uh, just kind of a unanimous win on, on indecisive side through and through. Nothing really seemed to go right for the Hive. You know, they still made some decent plays and such overall, but um, import was just all over the map. There really wasn't much Hive could do there. It was, it was kind of a bummer to see because I'm rooting for the Hive a little bit. You know, I have a couple buddies on that team, but yeah, it was, uh, that was tough to watch a little bit. They definitely controlled everything from that game. But Lance, what else were the main takeaways from that game? I think that it's hard to not just kind of double down on what Ed said and talk about what Import did. If you can invade one side of the enemy jungle and take it away from them, you now control 75% of the map while the enemy controls 25%. At a certain point before he was necessarily should be capable of doing it import was taking about 90 percent of the jungle and leaving poor nugs to just not have any spot to farm just in constantly consistently invaded and taken away and that's something that the kalari tries to do when playing and they're trying to go and take the things away from you so to the una reverse verse card there very very impressive stuff and then it's just another notch in the bedpost for ed as he takes another you know member down and I don't know what Hype's gonna do. And usually it is the Kalari that you're expecting to see do the invasions, but Indecisive just able to capitalize on their crowd control and Import did a really good job. But ladies and gentlemen, don't go anywhere because we potentially have our last game of the day between Indecisive and The Hive. There's a lot at stake here for The Hive. If they lose this next game, they are out of the tournament, but we're going to take a quick break.
Welcome back, everybody, to the desk here at the PCC. My name is Ardog with the Triple G, and I'm your host, joined by our desk analysts, Ed and Lance, with their dogs. I don't have a dog, but <laughs> we just watched game one, and we potentially have our last game of the day between the high and indecisive. There's a lot at stake for them. If they want to advance to the semifinals tomorrow, they can't afford to lose this game. There is one player that I do want to highlight from that first game though. I want to highlight that Neft played well as a Wraith. Ed, talk to us about these Wraith statistics. I mean, we really don't see a lot of Wraith in this tournament so far, but when he's there, I mean, look what just happened. You, you, put, you put Neft on him and it's just a whole sight to see. But only 19 games in this whole tournament, uh, really not a factor at all with only a 10, less than a 10% ban rate, but when he's in, he's winning. So Wraith's definitely a factor that's kind of just been swept under the rug. And definitely not a lot of players can play that Wraith, but when it's in the right hands, look at how much he's able to put in. That is a high uh, win rate right there. That's 58%. Now, we gotta go into this draft. Is this something that they want to take away? Are they going to be banning that Wraith from, from their hands there? Lance, what are you expecting to see in this Game 2 draft? I don't think they can target Neft. I just don't think it's worth it. In order to do that, you're going to have to have Indecisive not pick an ADC in their first round, pick it up with your last pick, and then ban it to try to take two away potentially. But I don't think with as good of a player as Neft is that it is a good idea to go that direction. We are going to see the Gideon ban come out right away from Indecisive, who have the first pick in this game. It will be interesting to see 
what way Hive tries to go. Maybe they get rid of the Bellica, but it felt like they had so many problems in that last game that one ban isn't going to be the solution. Yeah, I really think Crunch is going to be the first hero off the board for Hive here. Uh, just the way that he dominated the last game there, I'd... You, you don't want a repeat of that. Nugglets just really, really couldn't play the game, and that kind of just took him out of everything, With especially with Neff just scaling like crazy in the in the duo lane. Um, I think Gideon is, an, is a good ban here overall. We know Atomic loves a Gideon. Uh, we see the Zaras come in, so a little bit more of a maybe target ban for Morose again, but the guy's a gamer on Grux too, so um, there's just not too much, too many options from there. Uh, Argus here is a again first pick from them um we saw that uh there was a lot of a lot of great plays with that and it really set up neff to just scale mm, but it's gonna be hive who picks up bellica this time that way they're not giving over the two flex picks and instead of taking the crunch away through ban they're actually gonna pick it themselves and this is a nugslet special he really really likes his hero before import playing in that last game i think he's the only person other than six earlier today that we've seen play crunch in a pcc in what feels like months and we talked about how you can't waste a ban on wraith against indecisive even with it up they decide to take the drongo and once again they're going to put morose onto grux yeah i think the drongo was a great pick by indecisive to kind of counter that crunch because with crunch is dashing at you you just silence them and and you're home safe you know especially with an argus having his stuns and his pillar that he can put up to block that crunch i think that's a really really good smart pick by indecisive uh you know you see the grux here again too so this could look a little bit of a repeat from the last game but i think overall guru played really well as a severog into a grux um phase ban here now too so they're trying to just put put hive and uh, uh warps into a situation to where there's no getaway so neff can just keep doing what he does gonna be followed up with the chimera ban two heroes we've seen banned in this rotation particularly quite a few times today as i think phase has been banned in this phase more than she has been a first one if you exclude the professors constantly first banning it so interesting to see what's still available a lot of flexibility on indecisives a little bit on hive as well as the bellica not necessarily revealed where they're gonna go you see the Sephiroth gonna be picked up for guru once again into morose even though that lane it wasn't necessarily guru's fault that that lane went as poorly as it did but it did allow them to move into that enemy blue side and we'll see indecisive pick up the howitzer so that should be for shin once again putting man q in the support role onto the argus and they're gonna follow it all up with a rampage which i am very confident is imports favorite and most preferred hero yeah this is a really good draft by indecisive that's a lot of beef and cc followed by a ton of damage coming through with the howitzer and drongo this could be this could be pretty tough for hive again hopefully it goes a little bit better for him than last game but yeah this is this is going to be interesting um, you know, with a, with a mid or support flex here. Okay, we see the Narbash definitely come in. I think that's a pretty good one. They're going to need as much help as they can to sustain in these fights to kind of counter a, a Rampage R or, you know, the Grux CC that comes with it. So I like the Narbash pick up here. I like right, it as well, but I was... we have the draft. Um, Lance, you were think saying about the sustain there with the, the Narbash. Correct me if I'm wrong, but what are you liking there? I am liking it, but I was actually expecting them to put this Bellica into the support role on Boinks. I thought that they might whip out maybe some sort of special mid laner for Atomic here. Maybe pick up the Countess or something else that he can try to pilot. Well, I know he's got some skills on the Bellica too, but I know that's something that Boinks likes as well. Maybe trying to allow Boinks to facilitate more and do more to help Twin Blast out and Warps out here on the Narbash as... If they can get to late game, there is a lot of damage that comes out of the Twin Blast. There's a lot of healing that comes out of the Narbash, too. There's definitely a lot of CC coming from this team comp from the Hive. But, Ed, I gotta ask, this. there's a lot at stake here for game number two. How can they win with this team comp? Um, and how can they secure game number two uh, with the team comp that Hive is playing with? They definitely need to just play slower. You know, Indecisive is really good at the objectives and that's what they're gonna try to do through their focal points, but they have a pretty good uh, engage in my opinion. You know, they've got the Narbash speed, the Twin Blast dash, the Crunch dash, the Severog dash. There's, there's a lot that they can do to kind of counteract any misplays or miss, uh, uh, 
placements and stuff by indecisive they need to they need to just pick up on missed opportunities from from the last game and i think there's actually a real chance here all right who's moving forward to the semifinals tomorrow is it going to be indecisive or the hive is this our last game of the day potentially let's find out because we're sending it to tj and Fralkin. Thank you so much, Our Dog. Welcome, everyone, to the battleground for game number two in this matchup between Indecisive and the Hive. A, dare I say, decisive victory for Indecisive in game number one. Sorry, I'm, I'm here all week. Don't worry. Um, but the Hive is where I want to start with, Frauken. I mean, this comp that they have creative, I quite like it. But is it enough to get this game two victory? It's definitely better than the first game. There has a lot more front line. There's a lot more CT that can actually be used on uh, this composition. There is still a few question marks. Running the Sevrog back into this Grux is going to be interesting to say at least. It didn't go well in the first game. Obviously, Nuxlet is going to play the Crunch this time, so he's going to be a bit more of a presence in this game compared to the Kalari compared to the last game. And I mean, the dual lane is fine. It's a lot safer compared to the Drongo uh, Deco lane we saw, but they aren't going to really have the pressure. And it's going to be, mm. again, indecisive public control in this early game. Yeah, it is that Twin Blast Narbash lane that we did see earlier on today as well. The late game coming out for this duo. In fact, I'd say that the, for this Hive composition, that late game is actually looking pretty good across the board. But my one question though, Falcom, is with the way the Indecisive are playing, do we even get to that point? I mean, if it's anything like last game, no. Was, I mean, it's during what, 23 minutes, 24 minute game? Yes, and they took all minutes. prime on spawn, so... If, yeah, anything like that happens again, there's just no way Hive is going to be in a position to go for something. And, I mean, I think they have the tools to extend the game better than they did last time. But Indecisive, once again, probably just has a good amount of lane presence. And especially Morose, who basically did do nothing last game, he might be able to do something this game instead. Just unlocking that Grux, though. I mean, there were a large part of that game on cast was basically casting this 4v4 and the island on the right-hand side. I mean, Morose, it feels like, spent more time in the blue side jungle of the high than his own lane at this point. And very much like game number one, we're seeing import with the road to, with the invade. But left-hand side, Neth just does not miss. First blood going to be picked up once again by the indecisive ADC. Import invading on blue buff, Neff getting first blood. Haven't we seen this game before? Nuxley is going to go for the invade compared to it this time. He isn't the healthiest, and Mankyu and Neff are still around. He's only got warps in the lane as well. So I'm not sure they can really do this. And look where Sin is. Immediately rotating. Oh, sorry, that's Atomic, sorry. Immediately rotating over to help Nuxley out. But whilst this is all happening, Import's just taking the entirety of the blue side jungle. And money's back in. But yeah, he's at least going to uh, leave one of those camps up on the right-hand side. Nooks are actually going to do a bit of vertical jungling here just to take away this blue buff. Man Q going to be trying to at least get him out of the way. Boinks is here to help out, but Nooks is going very low, and Shin is here from the mid lane. Utilize that pressure. Nooks goes for the blink over the play. That's going to be a blink to follow as well, but Neft is there into his waiting arms. Going to pick up his second kill of the game as Nooks gets caught out, but they're going to go for even more because the Narvash drum solo comes to an end and points drops as well we have definitely seen this game plan before um yeah not a good start for hive probably one of the worst starts you could possibly go no slip went for that invade and just did not work out and now he has to return back to his own side which only has one camp up so import is going to have a massive lead once again in that jungle neff getting two kills on in the early game as well and well, we saw what he did with the lead last game, and there's not much talk to see why this wouldn't be any different. But one thing we haven't mentioned yet, and for people who may not know, Neff hates Drongo. Yeah, th this is uh, one of them picks, especially with the e in the EU scene. You just do not see Neft play at all. He will play literally any other ADC, but with Drongo, it seems that a lot of teams want to favor him for now. Morose has got to deal with the one versus two. And it's easy. It's just going to try and get away. Guru going to go 
Or the slide and glide as well. Throws just simply gonna run it out. Smash and grab snugs it back underneath the tower. Looking to return that damage. Okay, Nozick taking a lot of damage. The boulder toss came through from Impor, but not gonna find his mark just yet. But now Nuxlitz is low. Mr. Guru half HP as well, and they just have to concede this side of the lane and Impor. Can take himself a Cyan buff. Oros was so smart knowing that there was not enough damage from the side of Hive to actually force his blink out. Him keeping that means that he's going to be safe for a separate gank if that happens. And he can go, even go aggressive and try and look for a kill if he so can on to Guru. We're going to have a bit more fighting in this duo lane. Mankyu once again has a good amount of poke, but Drongo doesn't have as much poke compared to the wave of last game. So they're going to be more looking for that all in at level six. Hmm. And that's something that we have seen time and time again as well, combining with that shrapnel cannon in towards uh, the Man-Q Dread Nova. He's going to throw out the Aether Crystal, going to root up Boinks, who's going to miss that Funk as well, and he's on the retreat. man -Q on the hunt, maybe going to find it with the lob shot, but not going to find it. It is on cooldown. Boinks able to start healing themselves up as well in the back. We can see man -Q is not letting this pressure relent, and now it nugslets. Coming in from behind as well. Maybe looking for a gang, but Neft and Mankyu are very far, very close to their tier one tower. Looks like it needs to choose their moment to go in. Might actually bump in towards Mankyu. Is that's going to give up the ghost anyway? There's just a lot of pressure on this left hand side. Neft and Mankyu are playing this lane so smart, knowing when they can go aggressive, knowing that when they haven't got the pressure to actually look for anything, and just sniffing out that no slip was nearby. I don't know how they did that. No slip walked over zero wards, but as soon as he got around, he they immediately backed off and just played that as well as they could off. And now they are just continuing to be safe. No slip once again was forced to go back to farming as much as he can and is still behind against Import, who is a level ahead at this stage of the game. It's going to be going back and getting that bus this as soon as he can. And Morose, again, just dealing with Guru so easily in this offlane. It's such a, a difficult lane matchup as well, as uh, we, you were highlighting and spoke about it earlier, Frauk, and this, um, that with, especially in game number one, you know, that Grox in towards the several lane really isn't a fun time for the Severog, at least. But looking on the mini rat rotation, might look towards his pick on towards Shin's Howitz. So he's playing on this right hand side. Mr. Guru is here. Immediate make it rain is going to be popped. Gets a fair amount of damage down, but that's just the safety the Howitzer provides. And it's just going to be the mid lane getting away. He didn't use anything to get that ultimate out, so that's at least some presser that Hive can use in that mid lane. But because they knew, because Incisive knew exactly where that was, they can immediately go on to the Sleng tube. They know that Boinks is still in the middle of rotating, they know that Atomic hasn't really got anything else. And although Sin hasn't got his ultimate, they don't need it because the duo lane is so far ahead in port, he's sleeping it up as well. And now he has that lower six, he has that behemoth off, and will probably look for a gank instant. That left lane is also very far pushed up as well. Just keeping our eyes on Nugslet as well. Maybe trying to look towards Morose potentially. Try and help out in this mid lane. It's, uh, it seems that they might have eyes to know that uh, Import is going to be on the left hand side. So an opportunity here as Nugslet is going to uh, pounce there with the knock up. Morose finally burns out Blake, but Nugslet goes underneath the tower with the crush with the knock up as well. And Morose is going to be dropped. The hive get on the board, but nothing in this game is taken for free when it's against Indecisive as Neff finds Boinks. Import underneath the tower can't find a killing blow, and Waltz keeps themselves alive. A good trade out for Hive, at least. They managed to. Give Guru a chance to breathe in this lane. Give him a few more chances to stack up. And although Morose, yeah, he kept the blink last time, but it still didn't matter because the damage was more than enough. He didn't blink early enough to actually um, try and survive under tower. If he had a bit more HP, he might have been able to force Nozlet to take an extra two sour slots. And that would have been very, very helpful. But obviously, in the slice of land, uh, get Neff fed. He has three kills at this stage of the game. He's going to go back. He's going to get that Vanquisher online at nine minutes. So he's already very far ahead. Probably go into... I'd probably say size just a second, but you definitely want to look for some tainted against points as well. That might be down to Man Q to do this game. And um, yeah, no opening time is being taken either, but look where in the slice we're going. Allied tower. See, is that right hand side? It was the mini prime as well. Imports just in the jungle. Shin linking up as well. Maybe uh, trying to get a little bit of revenge for Morose as well. But the wards coming down indicate that they might want to go for that mini prime play in a moment at least. But they haven't got that pick.
just yet. Although saying that, Indecisive have been more than willing to pull the trigger and even go for the fight afterwards. They know how far they are ahead here. But so this game isn't completely lost though for the Hive. Just looking at the minimap, see that Nuxit is once again on this right-hand side. Knows that Morose does not have the blink available. And this one is just waiting in the wings, especially if Morose decides to face check. There's no wards enough on this Dawn side. Morose is going to walk forward. Places his own wall down as well. He's just going to pass through all through the river as well into where Nugget is waiting for the crunch knock up as well. And Maurice has got the ultimate. He's going to get the stun from the Warlords challenge and look to out auto attack. But reinforcements are here. Look towards the mini map. Indecisive starting to group up. Atomic moving over. There's a kill on the left hand side where we're staying with the right. So it's going to be Shin with the blink with the with the landmine as well. The smashing graph looking for picks. Not going to find it. Boulder toss coming out from input towards Mr. Guru. Colossal blows against the wall. Shadow glides away and a blink to try and get to safety but indecisive still on the hunt and hive just gonna be that one trade in the left hand side looks like adc for adc i mean all of that action and it's the other side of the map that actually has the kills we're not entirely sure what happened but either way that is going to be a massive shutdown for the side of hive mm. to get those that kill on to warps in this game so a good sewing but if important worse can get this mini prime that's not going to be too bad no slit is very very low there's no chance of him walking in they do take it and sin just does an extra bit of damage to get um i think one camp there i would hope that they give it over to morose which they do so this means that he can just continue bullying mr guru in this off lane and if we have a look at just over wall now it's not looking good. Gu has a 40 CS at 11 minutes. That is, uh, I think that just so, kind of sums up that lane, really, or what happens when you go against Morose. And that is even, excuse me, with that gank coming through as well, Morose having that one death to his name, just having that lead at this point in the map, you know, across the board, indecisive starting to pull ahead a little bit in the pressure as well. Not quite blowing the game completely wide open, but you can imagine with these upcoming neutral objectives, there's still towers on the board, and Indecisive haven't quite found that big team fight win just yet. It's a lot of isolated skirmishing and a bit of fighting as well. I don't actually expect either team to really want to do that 5v5. I think Indecisive really want to lit. Uh, leave Moros on this island, let him split push in and go for those four v force if they can because that's going to keep Guru basically isolated from the rest of his team and Guru can just not win a 1v1 against the likes of a Grux on Moros. So that's going to be very much their game plan. Hive on the other hand also really likes these small skirmishes but probably wants it even smaller to get to those picks. And speaking of picks, we've got Sin and uh, Input here. Yeah, able to link up with that landmine, but not actually able to find the mark at least. So uh, Atomic is able to get away for now. So uh, just uh, seeing that moving around, the Fangtooth has spawned as well. So it's going to be where the next potential fight is going to be in the size of already have the five members and uh, Boinks caught dead. out in the river. They're going to be without their Narbash. The size of comes through onto net. That was fine, but Import goes big mode. He's angry and he is after this backline leaping forward. What can he find? He's got a blink. He's got a bold and he's got a pick and that's going to be a kill on towards Atomic Import finding a second kill. Morose coming over from the right hand side, but indecisive going to take this mid lane tier one tower and also oh, going to pick himself a fang tooth. Are you thinking that taking Import off of Crunch is going to be enough? That is never going to be enough to stop the likes of Import. The Rampage has been so useful getting those uh, picks, especially with the help of Mankyu as well, getting that dragon over. I'm not entirely sure why Boinks was there. There was no that Boinks should be the one face checking into the likes of Indecisive when you have the likes of Nugslet on that side of the map as well. And Rose's rotation was so good as well. Just going into the mid lane, not having to fully commit into that fight. But he's got 2v1 now. And he has actually got that many prime buffers. The Warlord challenge will be issued. That's so much return Excuse damage. Me. And Shin is here just to provide a bit of a love tap and take down Nugslit. Now Mr. Guru throws down the side the uh, the colossal blow, but the make it rain onto Guru's parade. Not gonna find the mark, but maybe gonna get the pick, the blink, the smash and grab. Guru stays alive under the tower, but just get just enough HP to keep himself going. Morose forced to blink, not gonna find the kill. That was so close. There's no auto attack, there's no bleed follow up. And Guru escapes with his life. That is going to be blink out of Morose as well. Not that he really needs it at this point. He's very much a boxing. Hasn't got that mini prime up either at this point. So it might look like there is going to be a trade for trade. Atomic is looking for Neft. 
And that is uh, really in a world of pain right now. Does some man Q just have import? They are on the way. Starting assault lands. And there is the ultimate coming out from Atomic. A shutdown on towards Nath. But this is not going to be for free. It never is with this team as his to as import is there to trade one for one. And he even once more does not have much mana though. Maybe doesn't want this fight to go on. That's going to be the call to back away. It's just going to be a pick for pick. Pick for pick, but they lose the tower in that solo side and they don't gain it in the duo. They spent too long trying to kill Neft. He managed to survive for such a not a long time, but a long enough time to allow Enport and Man Q to get back to that lane to hold it. And oh that just God. means they get that small advantage once again. Morose is now I would say a lot, but I'd like to see him just keep on pushing at that solo side because there's nothing else he really needs to do. The rest of the team is winning. His best bet is just to create as much pressure as he can in this off lane to force the likes of Nuxit and force the likes of Atomic to rotate over to his side. And that leaves Indecisive to allow uh, to be able to play a lot more freely on the rest of the map. They say uh, to play a lot more freely, but I don't even think Indecisive needs to do that necessarily. At least they kind of have the freedom of the map at least. But, you know, Hive's still able to answer back with some kills. It's not been very easy at all. Boink's going to take a lot, a fair amount, a bit of a chunk. But the healing starting to come online for this duo lane as well means that Boink's actually has healed all of that damage that they have taken. There are some good signs and glimmers of hope coming from the high of squad. But again, this hill it seems like a bit of a mountain to climb against this indecisive team. As you compare it to game one, it is actually going a lot better than the hive. At this point in the game, it was basically over there was no slip was not in the game anymore neft was a absolute monster and that hasn't really happened this game i've done a lot better job of just making sure that neft isn't able to be completely free he is still free two and four he still has kills but just is not able to immediately run down the likes of no the likes of walks and boimps so a good sermon from there they are still behind they still have to play around this third fang tooth and the mini prime that spawns and import is a monster in this game Looks like he is going to go for the engage on towards Mankey, but the Eve Crystal body blocks and he's able to blink away. A good crash cut, bam, boom, comes out from points and knock up on three members. The landmine, the one to two, and that combustion proc does so much damage. Able to dissuade the hive from staying any further. Recall will have to be channeled by Nook's Lib, but there is no um, objective up at the moment. Morose has got bored of his right hand side, and now he's going to start Gruxing all over Atomic. The boulder was there just in case, but Morose is going to find an isolated kill and in the size now looping behind the tier one tower they want this duo lane they want to unlock the tier one shin is there with import as well import just pops the bam off targeting towards boys to make a rate on towards warps as well boys able to get the jump but imports jump goes a little bit further and that's going to be boys falling down warps underneath the tier two as indecisive flood members into the left hand side whilst all this goes on the hive starting up this mini prime they give him a chance, but Morose can probably take this 2v1. He has Warlord's Challenge, he has the Ice Corn. It's going to back off. He knows that he can't actually out hunt Nuxlit, who is still 100% healthy in this fight, so doesn't want to risk going for that trade. In the meantime, Indecisive does gain that tier 1. They are looking for this tier 2. They know that Nuxlit is still in mid lane. There's no threat of actual taste coming out yet because of where import is. But with the rest of the Hive returning, they are going to reset here. They are continuing to play it safe, but Nuxley is going to try and close them off. Going to go for the old pincer move. Looks like he'll have to uh, get up these stairs into the left-hand side before they crash to underneath the tier 1 tower. I think Mankyu just uh, popped his head around the Shadow Curse as well to see where Nuxley is, but Import's on the way. And also, you've got Morose coming straight in from left-hand side to four members. This will be no, a no 4 versus 5 with Morose on the way, but Nuxley's going to be caught out by a Boulder Toss, caught out by the Dreadnova, and caught out by Indecisive. The Crunch is down, but what more can Indecisive get as points the next target, trying to provide the margin of people. That's a good amount of return damage from a top. Atomic, Boulder Toss gonna oh go wide. God. Atomic actually flicks in and gets a kill on towards Shin. But now Morose is here. The Grox is entered the fray and he wants to shut this down. He's gonna find one. Atomic, the next target. A good double size because all, but the Boulder Toss lands this time and nowhere for nowhere for this Bellica to go indecisive. Gonna find three for one and immediately start up their third fact tooth objective. Uh, no, Slit just he went and was looking for the tower dive or 
the like and just was not out just not in position whatsoever for the import rotation the walk into the argus dread nova was enough cc to lock him down for long enough for sin to rotate over and sin has got a lot of money he has got a lot of items and no slit definitely does not the only thing he really had was that mini five at that stage of the game with him being blown up i've had no real recourse to do anything else on the fight we have Moros just rotating over as well for good measure they get that third fang tooth they can look for this orb fine and i mean they could do it on cooldown once again it's not even spawned yet they're definitely in position as well you know 10 seconds until that orb prime objective does spawn on the right hand side indecisive got neft over on his lone so on the left hand side but i think neft is going to be pretty safe and feeling pretty confident in that left hand side just pushes the wave in a bit of a grouping up from the indecisive team over towards this mid lane hive just map we're just mirroring just matching the moves moving from right to left import inside of this uh jungle here but he's got the blast cone yeah it's got a pounce as well stunders land on towards man cube that's a, so much return damage again it just feels like the hive need to burst one of these members so quick before they can respond but indecisive are everywhere just the amount of CC and allows Sin to basically play how he wants. The House of Damage has been monumental this game. He's level 12. He hasn't got the Obelisk, so he's not going to be doing that one shot. But just, yeah, things like that will be enough to deal with Hive. It just means that they aren't able to fight on their own. And with Import able to basically be unkillable, uh, things like this happen. Yeah, Boinks uh, went for the Funk as the Crash Bam Boom is going to be popped, but that's just easily interrupted, and Boinks is going to fall inside of their own red jungle as well. Morois pushes in the mid lane, indecisive, grouping up as five once again. The world, this map, is just their oyster at the moment, and it looks like the call will be for this all prime. They saw Warps on left, they know that Boinks is not alive. Nugslick could go for a steal. But indecisive, how they're playing today, are able to communicate. They're able to know that they should rotate over. Jin is playing around. We got Neff doing a lot of damage with his passive to this orb prime. So it is going to go down pretty fast. Hive need to do something quickly. Yeah, Nugget going to engage on towards Jin, but Nugget is nowhere near this pit. And actually, Nugget just gets obliterated off the map by Shin. Manq also helping out with the ultimate, the obliterator, finding a mark, but all prime going to be picked up by your team on Dawn side. Warps completes the split push. It's able to at least take the tier two tower down, but indecisive have eyes on a much bigger prize, a tier two tower in mid and, and starts to look towards these inhibitors. It's a few minutes later, but we're still in the same sort of position as the last game. They need to defend these inhibitors as much as they can. But who is just getting... Whoa! I mean, Boulder Toss into Landmine, and uh, Mr. Guru is at least able to limp back towards his fountain to heal up. We can just see the pick potential coming out from Indecisive as well. Whoever that Boulder Toss lands and connects is going to get a trip back to the fountain, whether or not they, they want to, but that's not really the point anyway. Morose against Nugslet and Mr. Guru, but Morose is level 15. Nugslet is four levels behind on that right-hand side, and Indecisive just pulling and constricting in there is death gonna be hit by a size all and also funk as well but net just keeps himself alive and returns the damage in kind of puts us down once again import going big mode to tank up this inhibitor nugs in the next target he's booped around by all the displacement all the landmines in the world but keeps himself alive more importantly right hand side in here falls to morose just gonna keep to complete this clean sweep of inhibitors taking the mid lane they could look left they could even look to end the game I don't think they're going to look to end the game. They have got points coming up in a few more seconds. And I, I just want to get points out of position, playing a frontliner like not is playing a frontliner. But they are playing a Narabas. That's not a frontliner. You need to be at the carries playing the enchanters. And yeah, they're just going to look for an end. They don't have the minion race actually set up though. They're going to come in at in order at times. So they need to look for a few more kills. Oh, Guru got booped out by a landmine on the back end, and that's the tank down, and that's the crunch falling as well. This team, when they all play on the same page, when they all be on the same page, when they all sing from the same hymn sheet as well, there's some beautiful play coming out. It's 19 kills to four. They just need a couple more minion waves to hit on towards the tower. The health bars are very low, but they're so far ahead, I don't even think it matters because Shin's starting to hit on towards the core. Manicu gonna drop the net going low. Warps actually blinks forward and gets 
to shut down on towards Neff and the Hive might be able to collapse. Might be able to answer back that imports big mode and slaps down warps on our right hand side. The core still under attack from these minion waves that needs to be dealt with. Imports throws the boulder, but not gonna find a mark. Indecisive might have just overstayed their welcome and they will back away. Yeah, I was worried the HP was not really high enough. They needed to wait for that all prime regen to actually come through, but they were just a bit too over aggressive and Atomic got a good shutdown on to Neft. And as soon as that happened, that was kind of it over. Yes, Import did get a kill back on to Warps in that situation, but he, kind, he can't really do anything without Neft. He is your main damage source on these objectives. And instead, they have decided to fall back that core is not healthy whatsoever we can see it on that mini map probably 20 percent hp so one minion wave would be enough but instead of like risking that, that and just one. hard pushing it in um yeah yep. like that one yeah the right lane in uh minion wave gonna crash but thankfully warps is there as you mentioned Falcon, it's so weak that if the hive lose track of any of these minion waves that might just be curtains of this game they're gonna look to try and contest the primordial blaze the fang tooth on his left hand side import is here with the hunts but indecisive don't really care about the objective it was just a ploy it was all part of the game gets mr guru to try and face tank and that's points? gonna be him dropping points goes in with a crash bam boom just to zone members out but import is going big mort mode on towards the back line and boinks is down atomic does at least get the kill that's going to be neft dropping but it is going to be a trade as well atomic cleaning up house and win morose here as well it's just dominoes falling one after the other after the other multi kills are playing Hive lose four and indecisive. Looks to close out this game. There's no need to do Primal Fountain. Wars is the only one alive, even if he was fed to high heaven. I don't think this is really possible with the health speed of that core, let alone being as low as he is. Uh, indecisive might go for the kill, but they are just going to have to go for the end. They haven't got that many minions. This has been an easy 2 0 for the side of indecisive. Yeah, sometimes you can't really sugarcoat it. Congratulations to the indecisive team. They secure your final spots in tomorrow's semi-finals. They will be playing against the chefs in that second series of the day. W well played by indecisive. Uh, again, I I'm, it's low-hanging fruits, but uh, hey, that's normally when the fruit is the most ripest, right? And that was just decisive across the board. This was a team in full communication with everyone. Like, we didn't see you. Frau, can I see you rolling your eyes as well? I saw that as the camera <laughs> banned to us as well. <laughs> oh, mean, man, but uh, commiserations... Me? Uh, yes, ye yes, I can, Uh Commiserations, of course, to the Hive as well, especially in that game too. Definitely were starting to make it a little bit more difficult, but I think with how indecisive we're playing, there was only one way that series was going to end. And it makes things very interesting. We were on the fence of indecisive. Were they going to be good? Were they going to struggle in this ping sort of situation? But they've come out swinging, and they have come out very, very strong. And that just leads me to be even more hyped for tomorrow. Yeah, there's going to be some absolute banger matchups. That's going to do it from us on the casting desk. We're going to throw it back to the analyst desk to break down that game and close out today's show. Thank you so much, TJ and Frauken. We'll see you tomorrow. But my goodness, three minutes in and Indecisive secured a kill per minute and ultimately finished with 24 kills. We saw how oppressive their duo lane was, but then you have Import, who has his eyes on every OBJ, Morose, as well as Shin, who knows how to play any mid laner you put him into. GG's and thanks for playing Hive. What a terrifying team, but Ed, what else happened during that game? I mean, Import is just controlling the map. That guy is, he's a god king. I mean, he earned that nickname for a reason. He made the jungle, he lives the, in the jungle, he owns the jungle. So there's not much that that other teams can really do against that. I mean, he's, he's that's his home. So he's gonna defend that with everything he's got and he doesn't really have to worry about his lanes too much. He's got Neft in the duo lane and Morose in the solo lane. That is a, that is a very strong team overall. He showed no mercy from game one to game two. But what else were your observations from game number two, Lance? 
that indecisive looks like a team that very well could breeze through tomorrow the rest of our teams looked very good there seems to be a larger gap between indecisive and hive than the, any of the other matchups that we had seen they look very formidable they look so terrifying. We'll, we'll have to see what they will pull out tomorrow. But speaking about these other teams, let's take a look at who else is playing tomorrow. All right, we're looking at this bracket. Every single team who made it out of our quarterfinals are absolutely full of gamers here. But Lance, you got to talk to us. What are the semifinals we're seeing tomorrow? So the first semifinal, we're going to see the professors taking on D Lab. I think that that one is almost guaranteed to go to the three full games. I can't really see either one of these teams sweeping the other one. And it's got Giga Gamers from the very top to the very bottom in it. The second one we're going to see is the team that we just saw destroy Hive Indecisive take on Chefs, who kind of struggled in the early game against what if we'll have to see if they're able to correct that in less than 24 hours against a more formidable opponent in indecisive but i also wouldn't be surprised in the slightest if that one goes to three games this is the four best teams in predecessor i don't think that there is any doubt about it we have the professors d lab the chefs and indecisive any of these teams can win here and like what you mentioned lance the games will be even tighter and closer as these teams battle it out and when you're playing at this level you have to be able to play every hero at a high level and play at an extremely high caliber but tomorrow we find out who is the best and who will be able to call themselves a prime championship circuit champion thanks everybody for being a part of our stream uh, we have to say thanks to the players especially and the teams that took part in our event today we have to say pcc is not possible without you as well as our production our social media all the way down to our graphics and including those who are part of the creation of our videos that really sick trailer that you saw earlier the moderators the casters and of course the desk we're still raising funds for our prize pool and our production team here at the PCC exclamation point support for that GoFundMe link if you're enjoying the production please help us with a subscription or a follow it means a lot to all of us thanks everybody for tuning in my name is Ardog with the triple G signing out you as your host here at the PCC and of course we've got Ed to my left how will the people catch up with you uh, you can find me on Twitch, EasyEd93. Uh, don't really use too much on socials other than that. I stream every now and then when I have free time. Uh, summer's coming and then it's bullet season, so I'm going to go into hiding on that. But yeah, that's pretty much about it. And what about you, Lance? You can find me all over the internet, anywhere that you search Lance Cecil. We actually just made a tab in the main PCC Discord, which you should join if you haven't, by the way, that has a link to all of the main people's socials in it. Most importantly, I want to highlight, go follow Hot Sauce's Instagram. Hot Sauce, the guy with the graphics since day one for PCC. Back when we were ATS, the man deserves some love. And we are also on YouTube, Instagram, X, Twitch, and show some love to everybody here at the PCC organization. Um, thank you so much, everybody, for watching. It's been a journey, but we're going to be seeing you tomorrow. So we will be back tomorrow for our semifinals and grand finals starting 11 a.m. EST or 5 p.m. CET. Thanks, everybody. Bye now.